Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Fume, the enlightened way to go cold turkey, or to simply add a little flavor to your life. No harmful chemicals, just deliciousness galore. The well-made, sturdy, wooden and metal fume-flavored air device is in itself a treat, but the cores are the true name of the game, and they come in a variety of wonderful flavors slash scents. My favorite is orange vanilla, but your choices are legion. Start the holidays off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com slash sacred. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D. And getting the journey pack today, Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use the code SACRED at checkout to help make starting the good habit that much. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Mood and their amazing variety of THCA and Delta 8 products. My friends, you can trust Mood to deliver the goods. High quality products sourced from local farms and grown organically, all tested regularly by third parties registered by the DEA. Try Mood's new THCA flower today. And for 20% off your first order and a free gram of THCA flower, go to hellomood.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-M-O-O-D dot com. And use the promo code SACRED at checkout. That's S-A-C-R-E-D. That's hellomood.com with the promo code SACRED at checkout for 20% off your order and a free gram of THCA flour. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by BetterHelp and their mega useful variety of online therapy. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire with an open mind and honest heart because your therapist can only help you if they have all of the information. Whether experiencing trouble in a relationship or friendship, issues at work, problems with anxiety, and on and on, BetterHelp can absolutely assist you right now. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash symbols today. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S to get 10% off your first month of therapy sessions. That's BetterHelp.com slash symbols. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to Patreon.com slash Media. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode number 284. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my son, Chris Raygun, wearing his... Now, Chris, is that a is that a turtleneck or you're hiding a hickey from a girl you got <laughs> school, from a, a school? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just finally, dude, it's 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 just chilly. Mm. It's chilly finally in uh, in California. And uh, well, it's been it's been kind of cold for a, at least a week now. It's like 63 degrees right now which is oh wow a nice i miss those nice days. temperature yeah it's great <laughs> yeah. it's great i uh i don't know I, I like i miss the deep cold honestly like i like i don't miss the snow on the east coast really at all i hated shoveling it and, and having to deal with it but i do miss that I, I miss that briskness of like 10 degrees where it's just like ooh. Sweat, now i love sweat i love sweatshirt weather personally so yeah. like 50s maybe even into the 40s as long as there's no wind yeah we have yeah. a lot of wind here for some reason i have no idea what it is about this place it's the that's, santa ana winds man the santa ana winds that's right it's the <laughs> el nino uh well welcome to the friend uh welcome to the, welcome to the friend my show mm. uh good to see you uh can't speak today dustin executive producer welcome to the show how are you today my friend i'm doing just fine i uh I almost thought I was going to start the show without a coffee because we're running 15 minutes later and I made my coffee a little earlier. I was going to have it done by then, but I'm uh, I'm doing just fine. I feel like right now with this game awards that we're going to talk about during the show, mm. we'll know when we're talking about it. Right. But it kind of feels like when I'm looking around online, like everyone knows something that I don't. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, feel I, like I can, the I'll tell you something. Well, it looks like there's going to be an Xbox exclusive blade game from Arcane. Oh, oh. Um, Marvel, Marvel Blade. Um, apparently, I've been told there's a shit ton of people from Nintendo there. Mm. Um, so maybe something about the new console, although that would be unusual. We're by the way, we're rec- so this is a Game Awards episode, right. but we're recording this before the Game Awards, and we're going to put the Game Awards stuff in the middle as we always do. Um, so we have no idea. I can't believe they announced uh, Resistance Four. <sighs> Wow. And that was that was something (laughs) I was texting with um, a friend of mine, another journalist who's telling me a bunch of stuff that's happening tonight. Nothing interesting for us, by the way. I I, I would tell you if it was interesting for us, but I'm like, I don't give a fuck about any of the things you're telling me about. But I appreciate the information nonetheless. And uh, we were just um, going back and forth. And I was saying, if PlayStation doesn't announce something meaningful tonight, I'm going to fucking kill myself. Oh. Whoa. Not Whoa. because I personally take it seriously, but because I don't know what else we're supposed to do on this show at this point. Can you give us something to talk about? <laughs> Does the suicide note just say power to the players? 
Power, yeah, to, the, power, just, power uh, to the players. <laughs> power to the players. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually Call- say it out loud. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like uh, it's in it's like that scene in what is it, Ballad of Gay Tony, where that that girl throws herself off the building, right, <laughs> with the letter. It's like power. This letter says power to the players. <laughs> I, I was talking to my my buddy, and I was like, it's going to be something stupid, like the God of War DLC. Oh, I want man. something real, and if we yeah. don't have something real in the interstitial. Have fun on the show, guys. I'm out. <sighs> you know, yeah. you know what to do, Sony. Motorstorm or Knack Three. I think Knack there's three? a market. There's a market for Knack Three. I think now, dude. Now wasn't, that enough time has passed. We can all agree that Knack Two was one of the most egregious things they ever. Not because it was bad, but because it's like, what do you think you're doing here? You know, <laughs> <They> really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like you really thought you had something here. I think that's a Mark Cerny, you know, flopping his dick out on the table. Says, yeah, I want Knack Two now. I also think Nack listen to him. I also think Nack sold well because it was a launch game, and so I think they just misread the tea leaves on that too. Yeah, yeah. for sure. All right. Well, it's Sacred Symbols. Welcome back, boys. Good to see you guys. It's, we're here. We're we're uh, ready to go. And uh, I think I don't know. I appreciate you guys starting 15 minutes later than usual. I woke up later than even usual, like afternoon. I woke up, and <laughs> I'll tell I'll tell you why that is. There is a specific reason why we'll get into what we're playing. I'll tell you why, because I was up late last night uh, getting addicted to something new for me. Ooh, mm, and so that was fun. So, yeah, I woke up. I asked the boys to give me 15 minute reprieve just so I can, you know, it's cold out. It's it's the dark, the dark days of winter. By the time we're done here, it's going to be dark out. I wanted to go out with the dogs, just get a little bit of fresh air. Everyone tells me I never leave my house. No, I never leave my neighborhood. And those are two very different things. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, welcome to Sacred Symbols. You can get this show three days early. It's ostensibly about PlayStation. You can get the show three days early and ad free over on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Last Stand Media. Like more than, what is it? 13,200 of you. Let's see how many people I haven't even. Are we really slipping, looked. Colin? I noticed this the other day. Are we slipping? Well, I'm not us slipping, I guess, but we might be losing that first place slot. Oh, yeah. I saw that with um, with Nick Calandra. Yeah. I don't know that I really count that for. I'm going to let them have it because we've been in first place for so long. That's totally fine. But there's two things. We're a podcast network. We're right. not making videos. We don't have anyone. That's really Yahtzee and company, right? In some sense, like getting all the YouTube people in those big, vid- which is great. That's awesome. Yeah. But I think we're kind of in two different lanes. I want them to do great because I like Nick and I like those guys. But also because I do think a, a high Patreon tide raises all Patreon boats my opinion once Mm. people get on patreon i mean i know their own stats show this that once people get in with someone they're comfortable and they stay and they go around other patreons so it's it it behooves us yeah Um, yeah i i think we just change the the rules a little bit like you said you know they there says premium videos podcast live streams and ours says sacred symbols defining do consolation and more yeah we just do podcasts Uh, but it's uh, i mean i'll accept it we've been in first place (sighs) A long time. I mean, yeah. several years, I think. So it's it's cool to let someone else get up there because it's not about our declination. It's about their ascent. And those are two mm-hmm. different things, mm-hmm. right? We right. celebrate the ascent, but we've been squashing a lot of other people and that's totally fine. We appreciate you guys nonetheless. 13,230 right now as of the time I'm writing this. We lost a couple of people because they don't like my, my more political sacred symbols pluses, but they have to read the descriptions to see if they want to get in. I can't help that. You know, yeah, I these, can't help that. Yeah. We've you pretty much weeded everyone out at this point. We've been doing the show for six years almost. You know, so we've pretty much weeded out people that don't get it at this point. But one of the great things over on patreon.com slash last day media, if you support us, you get discord access and you can submit your inquiries to the show and get early access and all the rest. Sacred Symbols Plus twice a week. Now, Alan Wake 2, spoiler cast a review discussion that just went live. Uh, Dustin, I was reading the, your tweet about this and then oh. reading some of the responses. People are so annoying sometimes. Oh, I like, know. Can I just can I just have a moment where I don't have to be on a show? You know, no. Can, just give me a second to yeah. absorb life. So you did this with Hogue, Gene, and Dagan. Ben. Oh, Ben. Okay. No, Dag. Dag okay. had not finished yet. So. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Um, uh, yeah, so, it was a great time. Yeah. We, good. Uh, we went for over two hours. So oh, it's funny. It was one of those shows where. We talked about the game from a high level for over 30 minutes. It was super in depth, but we didn't at that point. We hadn't gotten to anything nitty gritty yet. And so we did do some of that, too. After that two hours, I thought, damn, we didn't cover so much. 
Uh, so that's the type of show it was. But I think it went really, really awesome. I hope you guys love it. And uh, yeah, I, I made sure I posted a tweet. I turned off all the lights. I was recording from the dark place. Oh, nice. Uh, nice. When, I, when I could. So not so easy <laughs> hosting those shows everyone's always busting balls about oh, you forgot this i'm like dude i can't yeah this i i ingested this knowledge when i was at ign it's like you just gotta hit whatever you want you mm-hmm. can't say everything you can't right. be like now we're going to talk about the graphics and now we're going to talk about the sound effects and now it's like i don't write like that i don't talk like that i just don't do that so you gotta just hit the things that matter most to you and i'm looking forward mm-hmm. to seeing the response to that so congratulations on that yeah. i just did a podcast with and what i was referring to earlier with um game dev jewish game dev luke bernard who did the light in the darkness the awesome free-to-play holocaust it sounds free-to-play holocaust game <laughs> all right let's relax <laughs> let's, let's just wrap, wrap the show up after just, that just, <laughs> just walk it back a little bit yeah walk it back a little bit but it is a free-to-play game about a story in france during the early era of the holocaust he actually announced that he's doing another sh- another game similar to that that's going to come out in 2026 about a story from the holocaust in Oh, people don't like when I do that noise, by the way. Um, oh, the tis tis tis? Yeah, like that. Mm. That's my thinking noise. I've always done that. It's weird that people have only clued in that recently, I've noticed, by the way. Wow, do you, it's like when you're on a podcast for four fucking hours a week. Maybe you're going to say the same things or have certain mannerisms. Yeah. Isn't that mm. shocking? Yeah, we wow. have a lot of, we have a lot of angsty energy today, don't we? Let's go. We're let's like a disturbed record. Let's destroy someone. Let's kill someone. <laughs> yeah. We could kill one of us, but we could bring in a bystander. I already said I'm going to kill myself. So, I mean, we already have okay. the, one the, more. We got to kill know. someone else first, though. Yeah. Murder, suicide. <laughs> oh, man. Speaking of the Holocaust. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. So, um speaking of hitler had a murder suicide so that 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 goes all the way to to the end of world war ii but um yeah so anyway we had them on we had i had luke on to talk about anti-semitism in the games industry which i think is fairly obvious and prevalent right now um but people getting a little too comfortable talking saying things and and i don't know it's like it's uncomfortable and so i i wanted to just have a very narrow band conversation about that People have inquired both in DMs and on the comments, like, will you do something for the, from the quote unquote other side? And I'm like, I'm, I'm willing to, but I don't know who to really talk to about that. Mm-hmm. And I would say, if you want the other side, just um, read the Internet. And you'll get the other side. But uh, for me, I, I'm totally happy to have like I want balance and stuff. I just don't really even know who to speak to in that space. And I don't think a lot of them would want to speak to me either. But I thought that that was a really interesting conversation. There was a horror game podcast you did with jimmy champagne which right. was nice portal review i did so playstation portal awesome use it again for much of the weekend youtube comments mailbags coming up for the holiday season we're going to start pre-recording stuff so actually guys we have scores now for all the games um in our metacritic draft so we can record our sacred symbols plus episode to do that soon because pandora um or Avatar or Pandora, what is it called? Frontiers of Pandora. That yeah. that's out now. I actually pre- I preloaded it, so I'm ready to go. Mm. Yeah. No, oh, all right. When I saw it got a 74 or whatever, I was like, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I love that for you. <laughs> that, yeah. It's like Robocop. You know, I was no, like, oh, yeah, perfect. totally. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. It's uh, that game was never gonna be like a nine out of ten, I, I don't think. No, I, I like I don't think support- anybody was expecting that. I'm supporting it for two my 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 approach is twofold. The lesser thing with pandora frontiers of pandora is it is kind of far cry ish but the and i love far cry but the real reason is i love massive and they made the game so i kind of want to just support the team you know and yeah, see what, yeah. they, what, what they've been doing but apparently it's pretty it's fine i'm not a fan of the ip like we did a knockback episode about whatever avatar. You're, not a, you're, never, not nav, you're not an avatar guy no uh, we did i never even saw it until a couple months ago in preparation for the the game because I wanted I was like I'm not going to play the game without knowing the movie so I watched the movie and, and Dagan and I did a knockback about it and what I said was until they introduced the blue aliens it was dope like actually the first 15 to 20 minutes I'm like this is fucking awesome I was yeah, like yeah. shocked by how good it is about this planet where they land and they have just this little batch of safety and they're trying to like mine things and do all this stuff and there's all this energy and and then the blue guys ruined it yeah, yeah I, I it's it's so fun. It's exactly my exact that is my exact gripe with it. I cannot I don't I don't know why I can't sympathize with blue creatures, but I can't. I don't know what it is. I think also they just look weird. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, that's not it's not. I appreciate that in the sense that it's not like, you know, gray aliens or big eyed aliens or whatever. Same thing with um, we bring it up every, every so often. But that movie, what was it? Asc- Ascension? No, uh, that the was Rival? a TV show. Rival. That's what it was. Mm-hmm. Like the way the aliens look in that. I was like, this is dope. You know, oh, right, right, um, right. Because right. we always have this idea about the way they look. But um, I don't even I know think two is better than about. one, Colin. If you watch, it's really fucking long, though. Yeah, I, I will watch. Like I will watch it probably this holiday season. Way of the Water is that what it's called? Way, of water, way yeah. of water. Way of Water. Yeah. Oh, uh, Lord of Ring. Lord of <laughs> Ring. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 All right. King Kulak wrote into us on Patreon. That's one of the perks. I put up a thread in the newsfeed each week for sacred symbols. You respond to it. I col- I uh, cultivate. I was going to say culminate, but that doesn't make any sense. I cultivate your inquiries. And King Kulak said, "Hey CDC, I found y'all after Colin went on Michael Malice's podcast, and I've thoroughly enjoyed the content." So much so that Sacred Symbols ended up being the first Patreon I ever subbed to. Thank you. As a Good. fellow traveler of people like Michael Malice, it's nice to find a show that isn't just an excuse for mentally cooked people to inject their stupid politics into the gaming space all the time. While I'm a deeply political person myself, me too. I have a serious disdain for the idea that everything must be used as an opportunity to platform and advance some political ideology. Gaming is my and many other people's escape from the bullshit in the real world, and some of these lunatics can't even let us have this one thing. Anyways, I just wanted to say thanks for bringing the quality entertainment that I look forward to every week and mostly focusing on the thing we actually care about, the games. Thank you. We'll get to the games in like another hour. But yeah, I appreciate yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate you writing in. And I wanted to bring up King Kulak. Welcome. Michael Mal- Malice is my buddy. It was good to be on his show. I, li- I love him. He's, he's fucking hysterical. His Twitter shit is like he's like out of control on Twitter. I don't know if people follow <laughs> Michael Malice on Twitter. But um, I wanted to bring this up because of the conversation I had with Luke Bernard about anti-Semitism and Zionism and Israel and all this stuff in relation to the games industry. What I want to do is not avoid subject matter, but make sure it's very tailored to the things that matter at the time so that we're not burying our heads in the sand. But like you said, King Kulak, we're not bringing things up just to bring them up or wedging our political um, things in. And also to be clear that though I feel a certain way, it's not an endorsement. There is no litmus test. And I want to reiterate that for people as we get more and more people listening to the show every week. And new people coming, there's no litmus test. You right. don't have to agree with me. I don't care if you agree with me. I don't. It doesn't matter. Um, but you have to also understand I'm going to say what I want to say too. And you not agreeing with me also doesn't matter to me. Right? We have to have it both ways. We're here for a conversation, but we can't we can't be shy about saying the things we feel and having adult conversations. And I'm glad that that is resonating with our audience because it is not a politics for politics sake conversation. We're not just going to do we're not going to cover the, 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 you know, from a geopolitical point of view. And that's what's important. And I know a lot of these shows do that. And I know it's turning you off. I read, I don't listen to any of these shows, but I read sometimes like the, the reviews they get uh, on iTunes and just like read out about them, go to their reddits or whatever. And it's like, man, a lot of people are not feeling this stuff. And I don't yeah. want, I want to make sure there's a place in time. There's a place right. in time for everything. Yeah. Like we talked about how, Adolf Hitler died of a murder suicide just ten minutes ago. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Is that is that political though? <laughs> that it's just listing a fact? No, I don't. I don't think it's. You know? And we call we call the uh, the the restaurant or the deli in Ohio that has the sacred sandwich. We call it Hitler's bunker. Oh my god! We, I don't even know why we started. Call, actually, the reason we started calling it that was because I noted that the Soviets destroyed Hitler's bunker in Berlin because they were afraid that it would become a place where people would come and. Oh, right, right. Like a like a like a, a Mecca for Nazism or whatever. So when we fall, uh, yeah. they will the, the Delhi will be the first to go. No, you're onto it. Right. See? Yeah, I see. Oh. <laughs> Merch at laststandmedia.store. I think pretty much all of the copies of Super Perils of Baking are out. By the way, I just ordered the next round of physical games that we're going to do. It's not Super Perils of Baking. But I think in the spring, we're going to have a little something special. Our first PlayStation 5 run of physical games. And I just pulled the trigger on that. The price was just too good to pass up, frankly. And I'm frankly. excited about that. Please leave us nice reviews on podcast services. You can follow us on YouTube there and leave comments. And if you like the video, thumb them up and all sorts of other things. And finally, and I don't want to bring Lily Mo, my developer, up too much, but Clark Petri wrote in and said, hey, CDC, question for Colin. How are Herboxia PS5 sales going? I'm at 89% trophy completion and enjoying the extra challenge of this release. However, I was sad to see some of the leaderboards fairly sparse in the days immediately after launch, though they seem to have filled in more recently. Thank you for the re-release, particularly for those of us who had purchased the original. Also, whomever designed the trophy art for the various medals did an excellent job, shaped by a career in the military. I geeked out on them harder than I suspect. 
I wish LSM and Lily Mo the best. Thank you, Clark, for writing in. Appreciate that. We'll relay that word to the team. Hibroxy is not doing great, but we didn't really, I think it sold like a few hundred copies across PC and PS5. However, we've had a redemption of the game of a few thousand because, or a couple thousand because people already own it on PS4 and Vita and you can't buy it again. We wanted to have that cross buy. If you guys want to support it, it's great. I, I, I should be clear. I don't really get any money from Lilymo because any, and my, my cut just goes back to the next game. So you're really supporting Barry and independent game development by buying those games. I get the money from the physical games that are, that are running because that's kind of like where I come in. But I don't know. It's, it's interesting to be an indie dev and to have this platform and to know that, uh, that, so many other games are struggling because they don't have anything <laughs> you know yeah and i don't know what to do about that we had some interesting issues when we launched the game where for a couple of days hyperoxia didn't even show up as a new game in the the chrono- chronological tiles that they have on ps store so we had to get that fixed and that might have cost us a little bit but there's just so much added to that even though they fixed it a lot where it's not like the the shovelware pushing everything off but I just think about others games. I look at trophy data and all the rest. And I'm like, man, these games are bombing. And I don't know how it's done. Like, I don't know how people are even putting games out and selling them and making it work at this point without a huge marketing push or some sort of built in audience. You know, um, when we think about Twin Breaker, which was a Sacred Symbols video game, we we sold, I don't know, a lot of copies compared to what we sell now and i wonder if it's because it was a sacred symbol thing or if there's just more games or whatever i don't know but if you guys want to support independent games definitely check out hybroxia and our other games hybroxia 2 is excellent super perils of baking we love and twin breaker of course our brick breaker which was the first game i worked on all about sacred symbols okay let's get into some inquiries here from the audience stretch our legs a little bit (laughs) and then we'll get into the video games every time chris says yeah no (laughs) <laughs> Obama drone strikes a wedding wrote in. Oh, well. And says, hello, my favorite CDs. It's crazy. He still has that power. Yeah, that's yeah. That's right. Yeah. Even in retirement, in deep retirement, he still has a uh, he still has that button in his pocket, I guess. Do you still do you think you wear this drone strike suit, that brown suit? His drone strike suit. That's what he wears. Yeah. That's the code. That's the yeah, code for the, yeah. for the drone strike. <laughs> for special. Like, you remember when he wore? You remember when he wore that tan suit and it was like a a big controversy? Yeah, totally. That's what I'm bringing up. Yeah, like that was like, that was like a, I don't know what that was all about. What a quaint time. What a quaint period in political history. I think I would kind history. of kind of kill for an Obama like president at this point, or anyone to even run that would be like him. I didn't. I didn't really care for him very much i did vote for him in 2008 but i didn't care for him very much but a little bit of stability would go a long way at this point i mean cognizance right yeah a little bit at the very least although to me it's just like i long for that period of just simplicity in general it's like where where that was like the big story whoa Mm -hmm. the tan suit outrageous first black president well second if you count bill clinton as a lot of people like to count Ah. all right (laughs) That's an old joke. I don't even know where that comes from. I think that's like an Arsenio Hall joke or something. It sounds right. like it. Hello, my favorite CDC, he says. On eleven twenty seven, my wife and I had a scary moment as parents. We had to bring our five month old girl to a specialist to have a lump removed from her side. The mm-hmm. hospital was located an hour away from our house and our check in was at five thirty a.m. To clear my mind, I told my wife I'm going to put on sacred symbols between the drive to and from the hospital. We listened to just over an hour of the episode because I paused several times to explain random references to her. I'm happy my wife put up with the insanity of your intro. She was forced to listen to you guys talk about gay surrender on or in Long Island, the infamous butt fumble, something to do with diabetes. I'm pretty sure you guys referenced Kevin Costner, Weeb Christmas and Thanksgiving side dishes. Now, outside of you plugging your own game, receiving a physical release, I do not think there was any video game talk. (laughs) I'm surprised my wife does not think I am absolutely insane for listening to this madness. I appreciate you guys keeping my mind distracted while I was being a worried parent. While the lump was removed and my daughter has fully recovered from what we from that, we still have not heard back from Kaiser about what the lump was. I appreciate all you guys do to keep my company, wa- keeping company while I'm working solo as a water utility worker. Keep on keeping on from Southern California. Congrats on your wedding call. Thank you for writing in. Glad to hear that your daughter is recovering. Sorry about that. Also, yeah. sorry to your wife about the show. <laughs> sorry to and, all the wives out there. I yeah, mean, sorry to everyone. Really. really just sorry to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And we apologize. Sacred symbols. We're sorry. Yeah, we're that's sorry. Tagline. <laughs> Yeah, we're sorry. That's actually awesome. That'd be we're a good sorry. shirt. Yeah, that's that is a good, nice so idea. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, make note of that. And so, <laughs> Kaiser, I I used to I gotta say, man, I love. Do you have Kaiser, Chris? In for your med? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I love Kaiser personally. For people that don't know, Kaiser is a big they're in other states, too, but it's like California's dominant HMO. And it's one of those insurance companies that I actually think really works well because you go to a place and it's everything. So you go and see a doctor in the same building and they're like, go to the pharmacy on the first floor, then go right. to your specialist on the third floor, then go get your blood test on the second floor. And, and so on. I love that shit. And people talk shit about Kaiser, but I'm like, no, man, this is the stuff compared to yeah. where we have to do it out here in Virginia, where it's like you just go to random instead of you. you When you have Kaiser, you go to a Kaiser hospital, you go to a Kaiser medical building, you go to and, and I, I'm, I'm kind of into right. that. I was, I was yeah, everywhere else. That. Everywhere else kind of bounces you from place to place and, mm-hmm. you know, establishment to establishment that that is convenient. Um, I think people really talk shit about Kaiser, really not necessarily because of what Kaiser is, but because of the the inherent flawed system that it's set up within it's it's really yeah, just a true. problem with the healthcare system in general not necessarily sure. kaiser but i've but been yeah. totally i've totally opened my mind as i've gotten older to, to universal healthcare like i i don't yeah i don't know exactly how it would work in a country like this there's no country as big as the united states that has good universal healthcare none zero but right um I wonder how it would work. And I like this idea. I think Bernie Sanders was on the floated it of just kind of continuously lowering the age of Medicare until it reaches mm-hmm, zero, yeah. which <laughs> which is a funny idea. I, I, I think that's a nice idea to even begin that and say, like, lower it to 50 and just see what happens and mm-hmm. go on from there. But I also don't want to fuck around with everything. I think t- the top 30 set, 37 of the top 50 hospitals in the world are American. Pretty much all of the big pharmaceutical companies are American. And most of the best medic medicine medical schools in the world are in the United States. So I don't know if like there's some some sort of alchemy you don't want to fuck with there with. But yeah, but it's not right. Like the way. I don't know. I personally don't think it's a, I don't think healthcare is a right. I think healthcare is a privilege of living in a country like this. You don't have to position it as a right, like a God given right. Like you have the right to assemble. You have the right to right, associate. Right. You don't have the right to someone else's services. I mean, that's not a thing. But I think. You have a privilege of living in a rich country that could help you. Same yeah. with these you, tent it, cities it, it, and all this kind of shit. It's just like yeah. it's not a if, right. It's like no, exactly. just the right thing to do, right? If, if you live, if you live in a super rich country, I don't think you should go bankrupt for having cancer. Exactly, because that's not you know that's kind of crazy. But I, I mean, I, I relate to this story because like I think when I was when I was what was it twenty fifteen? I think I had like a uh, I had to get a lymph node biopsy. And so I remember the the stress of like waiting and just like, oh, my God, is this is this it? Is this it for me? So that's like really that's a really stressful situation. So much love to you um, who doesn't have a name because, because yeah, I was going to say like mean, his name, but he's just insulting me. So thanks. Yeah. Mr. Dr- Mr. Uh, Obama drone strikes a wedding <laughs> and Mrs. Obama drone strikes a wedding. We appreciate you guys writing. And yeah, I actually I, the, the time I had skin cancer, it was with Kaiser and to their credit, although I, I don't know if they were doing it to be nice or they were just dead wrong, but they were like, oh, we don't think this is anything. And they just sent me home. And then a week later, like, oh, yeah, you got cancer. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, that's nice. Thank you. But I didn't worry about it. I literally, I literally wasn't worried about it because that's what they told me. Otherwise, I probably would have been obsessing over it. Right. All right. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Fume, the enlightened way to go cold turkey or to simply add a little flavor to your life. Learn more now at tryfume.com slash sacred. That's F-U-M for 10% off the coveted journey pack. So we all have bad habits, but there's a particular one that I know keeps some of you down and out. If only there was a way to persevere. Well, there is, and it's called Fume, an innovative and award-winning so-called flavored air device that's revolutionizing cessation and giving another more modern definition to the term cold turkey. Here's the rub. Fume is a completely analog implement that you pull air through. There's no battery, there's nothing to even turn on, and thus nothing to charge. Instead, you insert replaceable cylinders into the device called cores, and these cores come in a variety of tantalizing flavors and scents. See, instead of vapor, fume just uses flavored air. You're literally just pulling air over and around the core, reaping the benefits. No harmful chemicals, just deliciousness galore. The well-made, sturdy, wooden and metal fume flavored air device is in itself a treat, but the cores are the true name of the game, and they come in a variety of wonderful flavors slash scents. My favorite is orange vanilla, but your choices are legion. Raspberry lemon, sparkling grapefruit, white cranberry, and maple pepper are just a few of your other potential selections. I must admit, my fume has become a welcome companion to my workday and sits here at my desk as I write, record, research, and waste entirely too much time on the internet. And it's frankly just fun to fiddle around with too, all with the knowledge that I'm doing no harm to neither myself nor my environment. The taste, the look, the feel, the sense. It's time to remove the word bad from your bad habit because with fume, a habit is just that. Start the holidays off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com sacred. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D. 
and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use the code SACRED at checkout to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Mood and their amazing variety of THCA and Delta 8 products, which you can discover for yourself at hellomood.com, where using the checkout code SACRED can save you 20% off your first order. So I have an unusual affinity for marijuana, which my audience full well knows, and it goes back some 20 years. I've always found marijuana, and particularly smoking flour, a great way to calm myself, chill and relax, and find the sleep I'd otherwise be missing. But I also know that straight up THC, the key agent of weed, is pretty powerful. And as someone with a medical prescription, I also understand that most of you don't need that level of noise. Instead, I want to recommend Mood to many of you out there that are looking for perfectly legal marijuana products that derive their highs not from THC directly, but from THCA or Delta-8. THCA is a short way of saying THC acid, a precursor to traditional THC that, when heated, turns into THC and delivers a classic marijuana high. Delta-8, on the other hand, is merely another variety of THC that provides more mild mood-altering effects that are frankly easier for many folks to deal with delivering relief without necessarily sending you to the moon. Indeed, Delta-9 is standard THC, so you're within the same wheelhouse. Regardless of which path you choose, I recommend both, just to see what you like, you'll find a familiar variety of options for your consumption. Pre-rolled joints or flour for bongs or bowls, cartridges for vapes, gummies for all of you ingesters out there, and so on. And with Mood's focus on high quality, you're going to love whatever you get. Though I prefer rolling my own J's, I must admit I've succumbed to Mood's pre-rolled joints, which are the perfect amount for solo smoking, and which I've really enjoyed regardless of strand. And boy, do they have a lot of strands available. Orange Glaze has been especially nice as of late, though you'll find tons of options, often with fun names. Gary Payton, Pluto, Counting Sheep, and so on. My friends, you can trust Mood to deliver the goods. High-quality products sourced from local farms and grown organically, all tested regularly by third parties registered by the DEA. And you can trust me because I know my marijuana and I love Mood. You will too. Try Mood's new THCA flower today. And for 20% off your first order and a free gram of THCA flower, go to hellomood.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-M-O-O-D.com. And use the promo code SACRED at checkout. That's S-A-C-R-E-D. That's hellomood.com with the promo code SACRED at checkout for 20% off your order and a free gram of THCA flower. Dibs94 wrote in and said, hey, hey, boys, I got into an argument with a local pizzeria. Never I ordered that. a medium delivery and what arrived at my house was six inches. Oh, in diameter. I called the pizzeria to explain that they'd accidentally sent me a small. The guy on the phone tells me that there is no small, that that's how big the medium is. Their scale is medium, large and family. I argue that a medium has to be in between at least two other sizes. What the fuck is this world? <laughs> what have we done to us? What do they do to us? It's a good point. What's going that on with that? Good, Medium, that large, point. and family. You just don't want to use the term small, I guess. Yeah. You're trying to just I, avoid the term I, small. I, I, my assumption is small for the price that a pizza would be now in, mm. in the current ecosystem would probably seem a little bit egregious. So they kind of changed the naming. What, I want to know where the hell this person is that there are, there's even that option. Like a medium, large, and family. Like, where would they even do this? Because that sounds yeah. completely alien to me. I don't know about you, Colin. No, but. I agree. I, it's literally them going out of their way to not use the term small for some reason. I don't. I agree with you. To be medium means you have to have a. You have to be somewhere in the center of a spectrum. Right. You can't be at the bottom of the spectrum and be a medium. This all got fucked up when the super size. I think I talked about this recently on another show about when I was. You guys weren't even alive, but I was a little like a little kid when McDonald's introduced super size fries mm. supersized drink this was probably in the earliest 90s and at that yeah. point all bets were off no one knew what the fuck anyone was talking about anymore when you said mm. large medium and small that yeah was it. well and there's also the issue with you have places like starbucks that want you to fucking say venti, venti or whatever yeah. it's like no i'm never gonna do that i am never gonna say how have a venti coffee. what does that like, mean no i don't know that's I don't, large I, I and that's that. large in starbucks apparently really? it's, it's, i, I yeah. know everyone said that that was like a type Dude. of drink or something no. And it gets fucking worse. Venti. Do you know Cold Stone Creamery? Yeah. Okay, their you. sizes, their sizes, I shit you not, are oh, yeah. like it, love it, and gotta have it. You're, you're totally right. I'm sorry. That is real. Yeah. I, I'm never in, you, you couldn't fucking pay me to ever say that. Be like, hi, I'll have the gotta have it's uh, chocolate, please. No. Yeah. Absolutely not. This, See, this that's, country that's, has a sizing... <laughs> problem I mean, obviously you know, yeah look around that's where, see that's where i would kill myself if i had to be like i i gotta have it i gotta have it oh 
like, <laughs> in a cold stone creamery? Are you joking? Fuck you. Like, I, I always, I, I, and I, look, I've been to Starbucks many times and I've, I've never said the word minty. I always get like, yo, I just say large coffee and they yeah. understand. I think they yeah. understand by this point that the people who, if you don't know that venti is how you order large, you're not going to Starbucks. And if you're coming to Starbucks and still saying large, you're not going to change. I think they've accepted that to some degree because I, I've never, <laughs> I've just never said it. Yeah, they say uh, gra- venti means 20. Yeah, that's what I was, I was wondering. I was like, venti is Italian. Mm-hmm. Oh, so it's 20 ounces. Mm, <sighs> whatever, whatever. Don't know about that. No. Justin Black wrote in, said, yo, CDC, are you guys pro Secret Santa or do you prefer to just give gift, specific gifts to the a recipient? I have this theory that someone who was lonely created Secret Santa so they wouldn't be left out of this holiday season. This applies to White Elephant, Naughty Christmas, etc., where, where the gift recipient is randomly assigned. I mean, that is the point, isn't it? I also mm. think or, I mean, at least it's one of the points. Yeah, we used to do Secret Santa at IGN and it was a little stressful. I got some good shit, though, from that, including Tal Blevins, who is the VP of IGN, had me one year and he got me. I don't know. This is this is thoughtful. I mean, to his credit, this is like mega thoughtful. He heard that I loved this obscure board game from the 80s called Solar Quest. If people out there know it, it's it's a more complicated monopoly in space and it's fucking dope and it's out of print. Or they might be in print now, but it was out of print for a really long time. And he got me a copy like the, there, only, there was only one run of them basically in the 80s. And he got oh, wow. And That's I was like, uh, gift. I was like, wow. Was there That's how much was, was was there like a limit? Because I, like, I think it was fifty dollars, and that was like what it was. Because it was probably like you know a nineteen ninety nine gift, and then you know it's a little more expensive now, right? Because it's like aftermarket or whatever. But I just thought that was like wow, that's really thoughtful. But we have a thing in my family. We have a civil war really going in my family right now, where the Moriarty side, like the Moriartys, like my my mom and my sisters and stuff, we don't want to do the gift thing anymore at all, because. Yeah. We're just like, we're all good. Like we don't, I don't know. At some point, I just think it becomes kind of silly. I think for the kids, for young people, it's great. And you could give them their gifts or whatever. We have an ugly ornament exchange tradition in our family where you just randomly get assigned a number and then you get, just go pick one of the boxes. And we do that every year. And mine is fucking hysterical this year. It's so perverted and perverse. So I'm going to get in trouble for it. Um, And so that's kind of a good thing to do. But I just think, can we stop with the gift giving except for maybe significant others, your children? I just think it's too much. All everyone, half this country complains about fucking capitalism all the time. And then they're like, oh, it's Christmas. Got to spend a thousand dollars. And it's like, why can't we just bring the tree inside? We got our tree. When mm-hmm. we, we do the real tree. Mm-hmm. When got that? Uh, yeah, it's a little nice. Oh, you do the real tree? Yeah. So you like to, you have to deal with like the trimmings kind of falling off and yeah, yeah, we, we yeah, no, exactly. I, we, yeah, yeah, no, um, <laughs> drone strike. <laughs> Boo! There he uh, is there. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't you that said it though. It was me. So I don't know if, I don't know what the rules are for that, but yeah, we like, I, if we're going to do it, let's fucking do it. And I, one of the few things I ask for is I'm like, we're doing a real tree. And then we have the bottom cut off of it, like just a little medallion of it every year and then i just we write the date on it and the name of the tree because we nice little, and so nice i named the tree this year. medallion yeah I, <laughs> I named the tree fat boy this year so i just wrote 2023 and then in quotes fat boy and then we'll just throw that in a, a box somewhere for my grandkids to throw away when i die <laughs> all right yeah any th- any thoughts on this dustin so you do you exchange yeah. gifts with your wife obviously and that's what i'll do yeah. as well by the way i nailed it this year i'm just letting you know oh um, okay i mean it's gonna right. be a th- it's gonna be i'm gonna type i'm gonna type in exactly what it is okay mm, he's typing yeah. he's typing up a storm still typing big dildo wow oh, <laughs> oh wait sorry i wasn't supposed to say it out loud yeah oh Pretty nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty nice. Pretty see, I would have. Nice. See, I would have. I would have. In your position, I would have been like, the wedding was the the Christmas gift. Yeah, <laughs> that's like the wedding is close enough to Christmas where it's it's like how, it's like how Dagan used to get fucked because his birthday is. By the way, December sixth. By the way, happy belated birthday to you, Chris. Oh you're yeah, thirty. You're thirty now. Yeah, I'm thirty. Wow. I'm thirty years old. I'm 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 with you now. 
You have so much life left. Dude, when I was 30, the world was my oyster, my friend. You're, yeah. you're I think, ahead of the game where I was when I was 30. Honestly, I, I feel pretty good, to be honest. Like, I think 29 was more, way more stressful because I think 29 is just spent anticipating what 30 might be. And then you get to 30 and you're like, oh, you know, it's I, I don't know. I, I got really in my head about it. But 29 sucked way more than whatever this is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, so. I remember tur- I remember I turned 30 right before I quit IGN. And so my 30, my 30s have basically been occupied by this, which is kind of and kind of funny, which is kind of interesting. So you're mm-hmm. like you have so much time. 30. Oh, your 30s are going to be great. I'm excited for you. Yeah. And Dagan, by the way, turned 50. That is impossible for me to understand how he can be so old. You know, it's like, holy shit. My sister Dana is going to turn 50 next year, I guess that means. So yeah, that's, that's like, wild. That's a yeah. wild thing to conceptualize. No, exactly. I don't uh, I don't understand. And meanwhile, my mom was um, on his birthday, printed or tweeted some pictures of him with her. And one of them she had she was 22 when she had Dagan. And I was and I was like, yeah. oh my God, my mom looks like a little kid. This picture, it's like damn. But so he would he would get fucked on his birthday because Christmas was so close. Yeah, well, he would say that there's like some sort of chicanery there, you know, because they're definitely kind of they're definitely yeah. is yeah there, there definitely is I, I was thinking that too it's like where somebody was asking me it's like what's your uh on, on the snark tank they were at, it was like a question where it's like what's the most uh what's the best christmas gift that you can remember receiving and i was like i can't really remember the distinction between birthday gifts and christmas gifts because during my birthdays the tree would be up the decorations would be up the you know the mute the christmas music was blaring all the time because it was like december so all those memories are kind of they were distinct i i did have a distinct birthday and a distinct christmas but like they're they all kind of blend together just because of the nature of like sharing a month and like a season and and just a general vibe same weather you know there's usually snow or, or just brisk cold so I don't know what was a Christmas gift or what was a birthday gift. Not that I guess at that point, not that it really matters, but yeah, it's just interesting to think about. Dustin, tell us everything you got Holly for Christmas. Um, let's see. I got her a sweatshirt that has the, the T, you know, the bear, the celestial times bear. Is it way on celestial, celestial seasonings. Do you know this T brand, Chris? Oh, oh, I know that. Yeah, 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 totally. There's a bear on on the front and Mm -hmm. I got her a a sweatshirt. It has the bear and it says uh, I'm trying to remember what it says. Like I need a nap or something like that. And uh, a few other things now here. okay, wait about the secret Santa business. This person that wrote in said something called naughty Christmas. Yeah, I don't know what that is. What is what are we talking about here? What kind of naughty Christmas is going on amongst friends? Um, yeah, I know, you get like what dildos white... and stuff. Is that what's going on? Probably. I would imagine that that's what it is because I know what a white elephant is and I know what a secret Santa is. I just, dude, here's the thing about white elephant that I've always noticed. My one side of my family does this and I like it. It's fun. There's always the one or two people that don't quite get it. Do you ever do this in your like a group setting? Someone white elephant's like, oh, here's some uh, broken lights and a roll of toilet paper. It's like, no, 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 no. There's yeah, always yeah. that person that just thinks you're trying to give away junk. It's like, no, you're it's like uh, maybe I think one year I did. A, I got like a nice frame from the the thrift store and I put a picture of uh, Jeff Goldblum in it. Like that's, you know, something like that or something silly. Right. But yeah. there's always the person that doesn't get it. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I got a frame like one year. I remember I, I only did White Elephant, Elephant twice. And it was with like Lacey's friends. And I got this. Just by sheer chance. What I love about white elephants is just complete. Uh, it's complete randomness. It's not like you're oh, assigned. Yeah. It's not like you're assigned somebody. So it's just that you go and you have like a number or whatever. Like however they choose to do it, you just pick a present out of the thing or like they give you something. And it just happened to be like a framed, like 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 a framed. You know those mul- you know those picture frames that are like multiple, like they have multiple slots for pictures in them. It was like yeah that. Oh, yeah yeah. It was yeah. like a like a collage frame. It was a collage frame and it was all photos of the nostalgia critic. Just by sheer <laughs> yeah. just by sheer coincidence. Because I don't think anybody else there even knew who that was, aside from the person who did it. So like I, I was so happy. I, I still have yeah. it at home. But that was the best. That was That's awesome. Very good. I, I like I like these generally. I don't 
you know, I, I could kind of take it or leave it. I'm not really like, I'm not a Christmas person really. Like after, once you're in your late teens, it kind of, you know, who fucking. It really does know. change, right? Like it's on, on, when you're, let's say, well, first, certainly when you're in your single digit age, but even when you're 12 or something, it's unthinkable that you wouldn't give a shit about Christmas. Right, and then yeah. by the time you're 16 or something, I'm like, I, the thing I remember, and this is the one my, my siblings bring up because I'm the youngest of four, is that there was a time where I'd be like, I want to get up at six. And then by the time I was in high school, they would have to wake me up because it would be like two in the afternoon and I'd still be sleeping. And they'd be like, can we open the presents already and get done with yeah. this? <laughs> but so that changes very rapidly. And I remember that. And then at, at some point, you just I just don't care. You know, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I, I like the I like the feeling of Christmas. I like the vibe and I like I like I like the briskness and the decorations. I like it. I like it the the, the season, but I, I I could care less about Christmas Day or like you know the the gift giving aspect. But I, I do like those. I like white elephants the most. I think just because mm. they're so fucking chaotic. Secret Santa is a bit more pressure because you have to like all right, you have like a, it's almost like you're focused in on somebody, and it's it's almost the same pressure as a normal Christmas to me. It's like mm. ah, I don't know, I'm not that into it. Patches wrote in, said. Hey, Excitable Crew, just wanted to throw Chris under the bus real quick and report that he does not like the band 311. Now, Colin, <laughs> I know you, of course, don't care at all what anyone thinks of them, but I was I w- would like to hear a mini debate about this if interested. Also, I agree with Chris. Down is a terrible song. Sure. So this is interesting. Down is the song that you down is the one that I can't stand da- down is the one like and he's like, oh, he, Chris doesn't like the band 311. I've never like sat down and listened to all. He's going to play it. He's going to play it down. He's going to play it down. He, he just summoned a guitar from off screen. <laughs> I didn't know. When did this when did this come up? We were I don't know. It was like a snark tank conversation. I don't remember what the context was because there is never any context to a snark tank conversation. But we we were just talking about it and I didn't know that they did that song. And that was a song that I always like I always like really couldn't stand it. That's so interesting. And I, and I had no idea that it was 311. I was like, oh, that's so interesting that that's 311 because, and we were just talking about it, like, oh, that's Colin's favorite band. I had no idea they made that song. I like Amber. There we go. Huh? What? Oh, wait. Oh, I was wrong, actually. It's. I, I, it's funny because that's the song I got into them over when I was in fifth grade. <laughs> it's 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 really that chorus that kind of throws me where I'm like, I, this. This doesn't work yeah. for me, really. I've heard of, that's the part yeah, you don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it like it, it scratches my brain in like the opposite way that a song is supposed to scratch your brain. But like you know, every other three eleven song I've heard is completely fine. It's just like I had no idea that they did that. I for some re- I always thought it was Sublime because I kind of just never really liked Sublime. Same so I just I, yeah. I attributed them to Sublime. Do you but, like how do you like how bad my finger form is when I play my girl? <laughs> I can't use okay. my middle finger when I hold when I because I taught myself how to play guitar and I'm not very good at it, but I can't use my middle finger on bar like on bar chords. Only down oh, I can only really? use my middle finger on the lower on like what would it be, GBE or whatever. Oh, that's interesting. Otherwise I, I like don't because I just never took lessons. I just would read bar chord, you know, read yeah. um tab. No, yeah, I t- um, yeah, that makes that makes sense. I um, my pinky is n- notoriously like useless on guitar. Like I can I can make chords and do all that stuff with it, but like the, I can like my the main three fingers are good at like moving around, but like the pinky's like a fucking like it's just there's no there's no agility there at all. We're gonna get a copyright strike because I played it yep. so perfectly. Yeah, three eleven's <laughs> gonna snipe us. Oh well. Oh good. That'd be a good way to go. Hard mode <laughs> hog wrote in and said, "Colin, stop saying je ne sais quoi. It's so cringy." It was kind of humorous when Greg Miller said it in 2013. Now it's unbearable. Accoutrement is right up there, too. Hard what? mode hog? There, were, there were. Suck my fat cock. Hmm. Thank you for back writing it. There is an energy. Going yeah, there is an energy going on. I can today. feel it flowing between the three of us. Yeah. Oh, hard mode. <laughs> oh, here, I already thanked you, too. That's good. Hard mode hog. Why are you so upset about it? First of all, Gre- I sa- I've been saying je ne sais quoi since I was like 10 because I always thought it was so funny. So you're referencing a toy. I don't know what you're referencing here. And then accoutrements. Read a book. Yeah, that's just a word. I can I say this? When when the fuck do you say Genesis? I I don't I can't remember the last time I've heard you say that. I say it like once in a blue moon. I don't even and I do so many shows that I don't even know where I say it. Yeah, I don't think you say it on Sacred Symbols at all because I I don't I, I, I literally cannot. That's the first time I've heard you say that. 
a je ne sais quoi. For people that don't know, a je ne sais quoi, like saying je ne sais quoi is like it's French for like that special, that that unspeakable something, that that special ether in the special you know, sauce, about, you know? right? And I definitely do use that, and I don't know where I got it from. Probably because I took French for like eight years, but <laughs> that's probably where yeah. I got it from. Yeah, this, <laughs> I, the only fr- <laughs> the only the only French I know is from Home Alone. It's when that that girl goes, Kevin, you're what the French call les incompetents. Yes, <laughs> that's all. Les that's incompetents. All, that's all I know. When, L-E-S, you say the S if it's fo- followed in a word after it by a vowel. So yeah, there you go. That's I, the rule about that. Les I'm not going to learn because otherwise it would be le incompetent. I'm gonna, I'm not going to learn French. I'll take a cue from the French and just surrender on that. Here's front. the yeah. absolutely, and here's and here's the thing about this is that I took it for eight years, and I am also not going to learn French, you know, <laughs> clearly. So, but I boy did I try. Yeah, dude, I took college level French. I don't even understand how that's possible. You know? Yeah, yeah. What the I, fucking- I really was like in the fucking mix for a minute, I guess, with that shit. Where I was like, I had like a fucking couple semesters where I spoke French or something. What, you know? what was the <laughs> impetus for that? Why? Why were you so? I had compelled? to take it as part of my human because I was a human a, B, um, a BA instead of a BS, like a Bachelor of Arts. So you have to take certain. You have to take languages. Oh, and, weird. And uh, yeah, so I took French. Huh. Because I had already taken French in seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, and eleventh grade. So I was like, oh, hmm. it'll be. And then it's just like I will quantum leap into that. I'm like conversational French where you're not speaking English in the classroom. Right. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I was in high school when I when I took Spanish that like it was like the third Spanish class uh, that I took in in high school. And then the, for the first week, the teacher ta- ta- was teaching us Italian because she got the classes mixed up. <laughs> and I remember I walked into the room and I was like, bienvenidos. <gasps> okay. So you had a multi you had a multilingual <laughs> language teacher we had we had one of those at, yeah. at, at we had we had specific language teachers at my high school but we also had one miss caramante who spoke everything she spoke she taught german latin italian french and spanish i was like that's pretty wild fucking rosetta stone over there I, <laughs> oh my god she was built like a pro wrestler that's what i remember about that woman god bless her mm-hmm. It's to fight our way through all those languages. <laughs> I, the, the, I think it was the CIA or the FBI recently re- released this documentation about how long their agents take to learn languages. Have you? Did you guys see this by chance? Oh, and no. It's, and it's really interesting. It goes, the, the, one, the hardest ones are like Japanese, Chinese and all that. And it says it takes them a year and a half. And there are languages literally where it's like French and, and where it's like 14 weeks or something like that. I'm like, you guys learn this shit that quickly? How is that possible? Yeah, that's next level. Shit. Ch- I know Chinese you're saying it all day, every day, but it's like I can't even speak English with any great authority. <laughs> oh man! All right, I think we're out of the fucking weeds now. Yeah, we've made it. Let's see here. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by BetterHelp and their mega useful variety of online therapy, which you can tap into for yourself right now at BetterHelp.com/symbols. As a true believer in the efficacy of therapy, there's a single thing about it I lament. It's inaccessible to way too many people. I live a blessed life. I have a great income, health insurance, and access to facilities and professionals in my area, but not everyone is so lucky. And while this message is certainly for everyone listening, it's you guys and gals out there without that level of access or means that I want to reach most, because I truly believe that therapy is for everyone. Using the mystical powers of the internet, my friends at BetterHelp have removed many of the traditional barriers stopping more people from garnering the life-altering benefits of simply speaking about your problems to a professional who's trained to listen and knows how to help you. Instead of meeting in person, You speak to your therapist via video, audio, or even just via text. And BetterHelp is all about convenience, so they're happy to work around your schedule, and they're even willing to easily put you in touch with another therapist with no issues, should you not connect with your initial professional, because we all know that connection is important. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire with an open mind and honest heart, because your therapist can only help you if they have all of the information. Whether experiencing trouble in a relationship or friendship, issues at work, problems with anxiety, and on and on, BetterHelp can absolutely assist you right now. I'm in therapy as we speak, have been for years, and even in my past, I was in therapy more than a couple of times. It's important to speak to someone about your problems and to learn how to see them through to brighter and better times. Please, friends, take advantage of this opportunity to talk to someone now, especially here in the holiday season when we all know that emotionality is running high. In the season of giving, give yourself what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash symbols today. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S to get 10% off your first month of therapy sessions. That's betterhelp.com slash symbols for online remote therapy that can help you where you are right now. Redhead Redemption wrote in and said, hey, boys, just writing for a Colin was right moment, wiring my PS5 directly to my PS5, wiring my 
PS5, I think you meant your portal, has made a world of difference with the portal. I was using it like for like a dragon and even got the platinum on Mass Effect 2. Wow. But now, contrary to what certain analysts have said, I've been able to get a positive kill to death on ratio on Call of Duty and Hell Let Loose with zero issues. The portal has changed the way I play, and I feel sorry for those who doubted. Thanks for the tip, Colin, and happy holidays to you all. You're very welcome. The portal is fucking rocks. Love it. Love it. You're missing out. If you don't have one, you don't understand it. You don't get it. That's fine. There's a lot of things you guys don't get. There's a lot of things you don't understand. Isn't there? Chris. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, I just I, I, well, first of all, don't feel sorry for me for doubting it. OK, I, I don't I don't need your pity. OK, but I will say, I don't know, man, it's 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 interesting to hear that you can you can do that because that that has not really been my experience on the Steam Deck. The Steam Deck's been a great streaming thing, but like I still wouldn't play like a, a Call of Duty or like or, or Destiny on it. Or, or anything like that. So it's it's fascinating to see that it's apparently like really good, even in like a competitive multiplayer setting. Granted that, of course, even if you are wired, that still depends really heavily on your own personal internet connection, how good your connection would be to even reach those data centers in the first place. But that's dope. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad it's good. Like, I wasn't like rooting for it to fail or anything. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm super happy that it's actually worth it. And I, I, I don't know if they're going to... Do you think there would they would continue... Make it because I know it's sold out, right? Yeah, it's, it's sold out. I think they're they're constantly replenishing. I I don't know what the holdup would be to make more, but um, yeah. they probably have a very limited amount of components. In fact, I don't know if I even yeah. I'm gonna bring up an interview later where they have some interesting information about all the components that go into a PS5 and um, how yeah. they have to source them. And so I'm sure it's a similar problem for them. But I think they're probably thrilled with the way this thing's doing, and it's really great. I'm not just. I don't know. There's some people, some people think this is like a PlayStation rah, rah podcast. I have no idea how you can listen to the show and think that at all. I have literally no idea how you can think that, but that's the idea. And so I know when, if someone hears, it's like, Oh, you really, really love this thing. I'm like, no, this thing is well in excess of my expectations. It's awesome. And so yeah, you should definitely go check it out. I can believe it. Yeah. Easily. All right. Brent Hooper wrote in and said, hello, gentlemen, with the Game Awards being this week. So we're going to talk about the Game Awards later. We haven't we're recording early and the interstitial will be later in the show. I've seen multiple game companies already share numerous announcements and trailers on social media. The trailer for Grand Theft Auto 6 dropped. We'll talk about that in a little while. Vampire Survivors is getting a DLC. Where is the PlayStation port of that game? Only Xbox is allowed to have console exclusives, I guess. And a reveal of the new no return mode in The Last of Us 2 Remastered. And we know that the Game Awards will be loaded with even more trailers and announcements. Is it safe to say that the first week of December is the new E3 week we used to get back in the day? Thanks for everything LSM does. Much love from Nashville. Kind of feels that way. I think this is a great point, Brent. I was curious what you guys thought about this and wanted to share this. I know also that the no return mode was outlined on PlayStation blog. There's videos and stuff of it. I have no interest in watching or seeing that, so I'm not covering it here. You guys can go check it out. I just want to kind of be in the dark as we go into that that port. Uh, Dustin, let's go to you on Brent's thoughts. Is, is the first week of December the new, what would it be, the second week of June, I guess? Yeah, well, I still think that there's still some of that present in June with Summer Game Fest and some of the other publishers that just do events during that time. But I guess now you could say, yeah, it is split up between then and now, particularly this December, this past week, uh, week or two, have there's been a surprising amount of announcements and potentially some crazy stuff coming just uh, in a little bit that we're going to talk about. So and I think that I guess in terms of Sony's lens on this is that it makes even more sense to me why Sony is quiet during these times. If everyone else is talking in June and December that next time we'll see Tony, Tony, Sony talk is in the spring at some point uh, when they don't have to compete with as many other players out there. Yeah, I think the the situation, I, I remember when the showcase happened in, what was that, June, I had spoken to a source saying that Sony's plan was to try to have another one later in the year. And it seems like things have, well, obviously they've materially changed, but I think they materially changed having to do with Jim Ryan's exodus and kind of the the decay of this games as a service approach, perhaps internally, a lot mm -hmm. of hullabaloo. It's, it doesn't seem like maybe everyone's on board or on the same page. And so um, from that perspective it's a little frustrating but for everyone else and for third party kind of agnostic releases i think that this is a a huge time i wonder what you think of it chris do you think that this is the new middle of june yeah i mean i, I think it definitely carries a lot of that spirit uh, I, I think largely because the, it's kind of centered around an event that is live and in person and you know people go on stage that really is kind of the feel of 
E3, it's it's less about the announcements because we get those constantly throughout the year with, you know, um, state of plays and, you know, Xbox Directs or Nintendo Directs or whatever uh, was Xbox Wire. I don't even know what they call them, but we get those updates like relatively frequently and they don't really feel like E3, even if they're kind of big showcase level things. It's just a matter of it's a matter of those announcements kind of mixed with this kind of live environment and this live presence. And I know that the Summer Game Fest has this, you know, uh, in some way, but I don't know. The, the vibe of it is always it's it's I, I, it doesn't work for me, really. I don't know why. I think it's just because Summer Game Fest just kind of collects a lot of the extra stuff and it doesn't mm. really feel as as big. Whereas the Game Awards is kind of unquestionably a lot more dense just because of the sheer presence of, you know, who's attending, who's watching. Um, so, yeah, I, I think definitely there's there's some there's a spirit of of what E3 used to be in there, uh, granted in a very, very different format and probably in like a, a a more streamlined format. But I'm I'm happy with it as it is. You know, uh, obviously there's criticisms to be made of of the Game Awards and, you know, especially has how it existed in previous incarnations with the ad loading and, and some of this some of that stuff. But. I think ultimately it's doing a pretty good job at stepping into E3's shoes uh, in the interim. Although I don't think E3 is coming back really at all. No, but, I hope not. Yeah. So, like just if it does, it, it, just give us something else. E3's time and place has come. It's like um, we don't need it. N- exactly. It's like Woodstock. Like, right. And Woodstock came back in 1999, obviously, uh, mm-hmm. and, and, elsewhere, and elsewhere. But it's kind of a t- place and time thing. E3 is yeah. really a, a remnant of a different time. Yeah. So you had to be there, I think, you know, and I uh, I'm going to, I'm going to miss having those parties for sure, but you know, whatever. All right. Let's get into some small news items here, guys. I just wanted to do an FYI for people. The access controller, the PlayStation access controller code named Leonardo, as we knew back in the earlier in the year is now out. It's available to purchase. Now there's some videos and breakdowns and all the rest and how to use it over on the PlayStation blog if you want to check this out. Are either of you going to mess with this thing? This is, I'm not going to get this. I, I thought maybe I would at some point. It looks really cool, but I'm really, as I've said before, I'm very intrigued with what just, it, uh, obviously it's great for, I mean, it's it's for disabled gamers in, ver- in various ways, but I'm also interested in just what able-bodied gamers do with it to like really make this dope setup for a specific game, almost like Steel Battalion, but not nearly that extreme. Like, could you do something with it yeah and and be like this is look at this setup for this game mm-hmm. and games i thought of with it was like civilization and other things like could you make some sort of little kind of ad hoc keyboard almost you know right i don't know i'm fascinated with it from that perspective but i think it is pretty expensive and let me see here i'm on the website it's available now so there's no problems yeah 89.99 yeah no it's not too bad but it's it's for an unknown i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bother with that so yeah. that's out dustin any interest in that you maybe you can use it to you can use it as a sex toy or something wow I um <laughs> i mean that's certain i mean anything is a sex toy if you're brave enough so yeah. certainly but uh yeah no not for me but i'm i think it will be cool i'm excited to see how people that need something like this are going to be able to use it and uh yeah it's a it's a cool device i'm glad to see it out <laughs> Eddie JF wrote in on Patreon and says, hey, guys, have you seen the pictures from Cry and Jim's leaving party? The PS1 style PS5 he was gifted stood out as such a waste. Just imagine him sitting there with every finger wrapped around those gray handles playing the Falls Big Release Spider-Man 2 only on PS5. The console did look excellent, though, and those cookies with his face on it are so fucking funny. Cheers and keep up the great work. Did you guys see this? This was this all comes from uh, a tweet from Yuichi, actually, who used to at install base on Twitter, who I think used to work at Konami, if I recall. But he was saying that he wasn't going to be at the Game Awards because he was at Jim Ryan's going away party in um, Japan. And this is pretty interesting because the cookies are really funny. The pictures of the cookie are really funny. (laughs) And I feel like there's something he's not a well-known. I mean, he's obviously the brand's CEO, but he's not not a well-known public entity. He doesn't have a persona like a like a Shuhei Yoshida was really funny. Right. And. And Geo is really friendly and personable. I don't even know much about him, but I get the vibe that he is funny and that they realize that he that there's something like this cookie, for instance, is not serious, right? That's funny. And I think right. that there must be something about him that's funny. I don't know. 
That's just the vibe I got. Goodbye, Crying Jim. You'll be leaving at the end of March. Dustin, any thoughts about this PlayStation or? Yeah, well, I think this PlayStation, is it a sign of something to come next year with uh, 2024 being the 30th anniversary of PlayStation? They did a 20th anniversary console and controller last time. You may remember that's one of the ones you have, Colin. But they did release the uh, the controller pretty widespread. And the look of this controller, it certainly could just be a custom one off thing that they did. But the buttons, if you notice in the photo, are the color version of the symbols. And so it seems pretty legit. I'm, I'm wondering if this is something that they're looking at doing to some degree. Maybe it's just the controller because it is the fat PS5 now, the OG model now that there's the slim. Oh, wait, you're so. saying the face buttons are colored on the... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. also the PlayStation logo. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The, what's with the plug, the PS1 plug at the front of the device? So that PS1 plug looks exactly like the one on the PlayStation Classic. Oh, okay. Interesting. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably just a USB, uh, a USB thing, but... I don't know, man. I, I really want this machine. Yeah, I, I would imagine that it probably will. Yeah, I mean, 30th anniversary of PlayStation. I mean, that's going to be a big thing. I, but the 30th anniversary is December of 1994 or so mm -hmm. 2024. I wonder if they're going to. And that's only in Japan. I wonder if they're just going to push to 2025. But they didn't mm. with the 20th anniversary. They, they did celebrate 90, 93 as the 20th anniversary because that all happened in 2013, as I want to say. I want to I think. Right. Or was that? Is that yeah, yeah. No, you're right. I, I know this only oh, because 2014, I, I want to say I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's specifically because like I remember noticing because what was the release date of the original PS1? It was like, I think a day or two before or after my birthday. And I remember thinking like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it is. So it's I'm like, December. I, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you're you're basically as old, like literally as old as the PlayStation <laughs> to, to almost weird. a couple of days. Very interesting. Mm. Shared energies. I have a weird energy today. I'm feeling a little weird, you know, mm. Mm. really feeling a little, a little kooky. Yeah, a little dumb, you know. <laughs> a little dumb right <laughs> all right let's see here we have some news to talk about about this discovery published tv content and nikolai casio wrote into us as many did said sony is removing all discovery content from your psn account no matter how much you paid sorry nerds no refunds so has dustin been vindicated will colin finally admit dustin was right or will he perform some sort of mental gymnastics will chris say i don't know man okay i'll hang up it's gonna be hard to say i don't know we're gonna figure out exactly what people think here now dustin i kick it over to mm. you so playstation on playstation.com there's a legal notice it says discovery entitlements affected titles that's the title of it <laughs> it says quote as of 31st december 2023 due to our content licensing arrangements with content providers you will no longer be able to watch any of your previously purchased discovery content and the content will be removed from your video library we sincerely thank you for your continued support thank you playstation store uh what do you think yeah. So as far as does this uh, does this prove wait that was I right is am I vindicated? I'm not going to I'm I'm going to say no initially on like because this is very different from us talking about games. But here's the thing with this story and the next story, too. These are in, an important reminder of what I said either last week or the week before is that with digital, you don't truly own it. You don't. You don't own anything. You're owning a potential lifetime rental. And uh, that's only if, you know, something like this doesn't happen where they have the right in your user agreement. Just take it away. So that's why I mean, these shows still exist physically. I'm pretty sure. Maybe not. But I'm I, let's just say they do. So, I'm, you know, this sucks for the people that bought these shows. And you could argue these shows don't matter. I kind of get that, but surely they mattered to someone who spent the money and considered it an investment on something they would own forever. And now they don't because that's just part of the agreement. They have the right to do this. So this is just a reminder of these things with digital is that, yeah, this doesn't this may not affect you. It may not be for a show that you care about. It might not be uh, a, a game, period. So you don't care, but just. This isn't out of the realm of something that could affect you, and especially with the next story, too. But I'll leave it at that. I think the well, Chris, let's get you on on the record here first. So where are you on this? Is this just more? Do you expect this to happen more? This is actually the second time this has happened. We just didn't report on it the first time because it happened yeah. only in Europe. But there was stuff from certain companies in, in Europe that was purchased at the P on the PlayStation store that were removed. 
Um, what do you think about this? Is this a harbinger of things to come or is this a I'll save what I think about this until right. we get you on the record. Well, uh, I don't know, man. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> Nikolai, no, no, <laughs> there goes the, oh, the drone strikes. The uh, I think, um, no, I, I mean, this is unfortunate. I think it sucks that this happens to any of the digital content that you buy, because even I understand that you 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 are essentially buying a license and that is not technically ownership. However, I mean. I don't know. I can log on to my current Xbox and there are still st- there are still everything that I bought with Microsoft points during the 360 era is still there, you know? So it's it's it is a little disappointing to see this kind of starting because it's only a matter of time. You have to imagine before this starts to happen with all sorts of other types of content uh that's strewn about that's strewn throughout different platforms uh, due to licensing issues or whatever. Um it it makes it a a more concerning proposition to even consider buying these digital, you know, TV shows or digital movies from these platforms in the first place. If you know that they could just be kind of, uh, you know, taken away, even though you paid the money for it. Um, that's not, it's, I wouldn't say it's as concerning as it happening to video games. Um, because obviously Sony as a, as a PlayStation as an entity has a far greater, incentive to you know honor that more than they would with you know digital tv shows or movies but it's still i don't know man it's it's still very i don't like it (laughs) i don't like it i didn't Uh, like it when it happened with amazon too amazon i think did it uh, a couple times too with with certain uh tv shows and movies over the last i think sometime in the last two years they did it somebody uh, there was a big story about some movie or some tv show that was kind of erased from people's backlogs even though they had bought it and um, the general idea is that even if it goes offline or if it goes off sale and they're not selling it anymore, even if you bought it, you could still uh, access it from the server. And that's generally been the understood promise or the general kind of uh, agreement that you kind of enter when you buy something digitally from these platforms, uh, even if it's not necessarily honored by the EULA. But yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's I, I don't like it. I'm not going to defend it. I think it's I don't mind that things are being taken down. I just think that it's incumbent on PlayStation to pay people back for the things they bought. Like that that to right. me would be a no brainer to have. And maybe it's I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of money in the, in the in the millions or tens of millions. I don't know how much people bought discovery content on PlayStation Store. And remember, you can't even buy you. It's been more than two years since you could even buy anything on the PlayStation Store from TV or movies. So they've gotten far away from this. So I, I don't want to defend it from that perspective because I just think that you have to have some sort of make right, even if it's just we're going to put money into your wallet equivalent to what you spent. Or even yeah. if you had something like based on only our licensing fees or whatever, just something back for people, I think would have been the right thing to do. And I think that that was wrong. But I do think that people are a little bit misinterpreting this from certain perspectives. First of all, I don't think this is Sony doing this. And so I think no. people are I think people are mad at the wrong entity. I think this is absolutely oh. Warner doing this because they want everything on Max and they they it's probably literally we are not renewing the licenses. Like it's not even an option. Right. And yeah. we need to have all of this stuff on this service and that's where it's going. It's over. And now Sony is at fault for this because as well because they signed all these agreements that were not perpetual agreements. And we just mm. have to believe that and I don't I'm not trying to be flippant, but I don't give a shit about the fucking PlayStation Store movies and TV shows like I don't care what I really care about are the, the video games. And when if and when that happens. At, at some sort of scale, that's a problem, but I would like to think that that's not possible. And, you know, I would maybe be able to figure that out by looking into my own documentation we sign when we go to Lilimo of like, well, do we is it? It's I'm sure it's in there. I didn't read it. You know, I didn't sign it, but you sign all and read all this shit. I just think people are kind of mad at the wrong thing here because I, I know it's easy to beat up Sony and and I think Sony handled it wrong by not having some sort of, you know, some sort of uh, make good for their audience. I, I don't think that that's sufficient. However, Chris Morton wrote in on Patreon and said, hello, men of the sacred table regarding the removal of Discovery's content from people's libraries. I think people have spun this a bit out of proportion. There's an important distinction to be made when considering the content that was removed. Just because some people lost access to TV shows from a certain network doesn't suddenly put your digital copy of The Last of Us at any greater risk than it already was. Sony has a much greater interest in preserving your access to digital video games than television or movies. 
I understand and sympathize that there are some customers that lost access to something they paid for, but I think this ultimately has been used to fearmonger over digital goods and even make piracy of PlayStation games seem somewhat noble. I look forward to your thoughts on the situation. And remember, it's not a lie if you believe it. Thank you, George, <laughs> for writing it. I mean, Chris Morton. So that's kind of where I stand too. where I'm like, this is I, I, I really tried to research and couldn't find much information about who is responsible for this and why. And my so my theory is, is that it's got to be Warner simply not wanting to renew licenses because Sony has nothing to like. I don't know, man. The, the games are separate. And I imagine they're under a different agreement where this kind of thing can't happen, where even if it because sometimes games are taken off, like you can't buy them anymore, but you can still download them. And right. if that is them. the big thing that I think needs to be taken into account. So I agree with Chris, where I don't think this means anything to the digital video games, but I do think it means something to buying digital movies and TV sh- TV shows. And I should admit that because I care much less about the TV and movie industry. I don't really buy much of anything from that space. So I don't really personally have to interface with this at all. I'm happy renting something on Amazon for 24 hours for four bucks. I could give a shit less. Right. You know, uh, if I yeah. own it or not. So I I do kind of I, I don't buy it on the PlayStation store because I've seen. I don't know. The, I feel like I don't know. There was something about the PS3 that was just very un, <laughs> unwieldy about about buying media. But like I, I had a lot on the Xbox and I, I still kind of do. I think I bought was it that that. uh that Puss in Boots movie that was like unexplicably <laughs> really good. And I was just like, yeah, I'll buy it on the Xbox. Oh, whatever. the newer one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the, yeah, the yeah, new, gotcha. yeah and I, I wouldn't buy 20, 2013's Puss in Boots. Yeah, no, okay. yeah. no. But uh, yeah, so I, I still kind of engage in that in that um, in that market, at least a little bit. Not as definitely not as often as I do in the games uh, market. But, you know, it's it's you know, it's it's distressing because, you know, we, we are kind of heading into a into an era where presumably you know, consoles will be all digital by default and there might be very, very little that um, one could do. I know we have the PS5 coming out or, or the PS5 that's out now with the, the replaceable disk drive and whatnot, but we also have those rumors of the, the next Xbox being completely just all digital um, from that big leak. Um, you have to imagine that the PS6, whenever it does come out, would probably, I think by that point, probably follow the same. Yeah, I think it's going to be just like the new PS5 where it'll be an optional disk drive for PS5. Right. So, but so the, so the situation there is like, okay, well, if you wanted to buy physical media, then you'd kind of have to keep these older machines in order for them to even run in the first place. So you're kind of being locked out of that stuff. So even, so the relying on digital media seems reasonable until you realize that it could just be taken away from you. And it's just like, it is, you know, it's, it's, it's concerning. I don't think obviously games and movies are, games and movies are very different. Um, and obviously, I would imagine the EULAs for those purchases are very, very different. It's why they're able to do this in the first place. But while I do think people are maybe up too upset at Sony for this, uh, I, I do think it, it makes sense because it's ultimately the PlayStation customer that's feeling this the most. It's not. Yeah, I agree. It's not. The, it's not the discovery customer who's, you know, probably paying for whatever, or, you know, who owns this stuff physically, who can't really be taking that stuff away. And, and so, yeah, it, it would make sense why people in the PlayStation sphere are more upset with being susceptible to this kind of. Um, I almost said Indian giving. It's not, it's not an accurate term, but yeah, whatever. there's nothing wrong with that term. That term's fine. No, I, I mean, literally it doesn't oh, apply. Okay. Like it's not, it's not <laughs> In, Indian giving it also yeah. the, the war racist one was Indian burn. Did you guys still call oh, it? That? Yeah. Yeah. When, yeah, when, when you do like you twist someone's yeah, arm, when you twist someone's arm. And I never yeah, even thought yeah. twice about like why that was offensive when I was a little kid. Yeah. But then you yeah. realize I'm like, yeah, that's a little, that's a little maybe over the top. Yeah. I bought, I bought twenty eight <laughs> episodes of MythBusters and they're all gone. <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sad. No, what was it that I used to tweet? Sad. sad, sad. Many such cases is still one of my favorites. Jamie Heineman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So to wrap this up, and and we kind of have a, a similar story here to go into. But to wrap this up, I don't like Sony's response to it. I don't know that it means very much, though. And I really do think, again, not knowing, not having details, because I couldn't find anything on Warner's side about why this happened. It would be interesting to know what the play is, because it seems to me that they're, it doesn't seem to me, I know this is happening, is that, at, because this is why we made fun of them for rebranding HBO to begin with, is that they want a place where everything that CNN does, everything that Discovery does, everything that HBO does, et cetera, on this one platform. And I don't, I, so I think that the, the licenses are going to suffer probably in other places too. I just think that places like Amazon would be smart enough to just give you your money back and they would. Do you have something to say, Dustin? 
Yeah, I was just going to say there's a safer way to make sure you don't lose access. That's buying the disc. Yeah. You know, they, they, they can't, they're not going to come to your house and take it. I know that was a quote that I think Nolan said or something recently, but that's just the thing is that I think that this, this write in about people fear mongering about Sony. Yeah, that's right. I don't, this isn't to me, this isn't like a Sony or Warner point. It's just a reminder that the things you buy digitally, you don't really own. These things are possible and they do happen. So, uh, yeah, take that uh, as you will. If this happens again in a major way, then I think we'll have to start taking more notice of it because it, it might it might come to pass that this is going to happen with virtually everything on the PlayStation Store that was bought for TV and movies where the licenses are just not going to be renewed. And that is not OK if there's not some sort of make good on that i think otherwise i think yeah you should be critical but again i think this was out of sony's hand so it's kind of because i just don't it could also be that they just don't give a shit it could be that they look at this and say like you guys have no no idea how few people bought this stuff and it doesn't matter and maybe that's true too this one was a little interesting too and in fact dustin you were cited in this story over on push square by our friend kale adam who wrote players reporting psn account bans and seemingly widespread issues so talk to me about What's going on here? Because I didn't experience this personally. And so I have no yeah. idea what, what, what was going on. So what happened was I noticed we had gotten a few Patreon messages saying about their accounts being banned. And I thought, it sounds really weird that we got two of these messages within an hour or two. And then I looked on our subreddit and I also saw that someone made a post about their account getting banned. And they made a link to a PlayStation subreddit where... It was an older post about getting banned, but there were tons of new comments, people out of the blue saying they were banned. They could not access their digital library. They couldn't get online. And so I just made this tweet about it, asking about it. And I did get quite a few responses of people that it happened to. And a lot of people were contacting Sony support and hitting a brick wall, just saying, well, when we ban somebody, we have reasons for it. Sorry. And that was it for a while is that there was no answer. Now, it has become clear that something happened, some kind of bug, some kind of error that caused this to happen. And so people are getting access back to their accounts. But I checked as I was reading over the notes earlier today that in, uh, I think it was this Reddit post on the Sony page is that not everyone's back yet. So there are still people locked out of thousands of dollars of their purchases on the PlayStation store that I'm just saying that when you have this high or this widespread of an issue, and I'm not saying it's everybody, but a significant amount that there you can easily find people this happened to. I'm worried there will be people that slip through the cracks that do not get their account fixed or are maybe in like a gray standing or something that maybe they shouldn't have got banned, but now they, they just can't get their account back. It's certainly possible. And so it's a, a really, really shitty situation for those people that invested so much. Yeah. Aren't you curious about how this happened? It's cl- like, is it a rogue employee that did just started banning random people? Is it a bug that just started banning random people? It was, is it there? Is it, is there something similar to all of the accounts? Do they all share a same game they play or did something go wrong somewhere? There's, it's gotta be a reason. That's what I'm most interested right. in is like what happened and why can't it just be reversed manually? It seems like maybe it's gotta be reversed manually in some way. So yeah, I wonder, That's is a, there any theory about why this happened? I saw people talking about it because of, of course, when it first happens, when anything like this first happens, there's people that are, Oh, well, what did you do wrong? Did you buy a game in another region? Did you say something you shouldn't have on mic or something? But From what I was seeing, there was no concise reasoning. I mean, surely there is some kind of bug that happened that happened to select amount of people. But I haven't seen any evidence of it being for, you know, whether you maybe you logged in at a certain time or your name has this character. And I haven't seen anything quite like that. But it's a. It's not surprising that Sony has some kind of bug (laughs) with their network that is causes something catastrophic to happen to select amount of people. It's not surprising at all. Well, Mike Pountney wrote in and said, what's up? PS dogs, long time listener, first time writing in as you may be aware, hundreds of PSN accounts were permanently suspended without warning on Monday. 
When I received this message, I must say I cried. With my almost 10 years on PSN and with all my life events I have been through with my account, it really made me feel like losing a family member. Do you think it is odd that Sony has made no comment? It seems if they are treating this regu- like a regular outage and oh well, given the thousands of dollars I spent, let alone others spent, does it seem like Sony owes an apology at the very least an acknowledgement? Thank you for the incredible content and happy holidays. Thank you, Mike, for writing in. I totally understand. That would be devastating. I, people, I think some people wrote and be like, what would Colin do if that happened to him? And I'd be like, well, it would, I'd probably melt down in the short term, but in the mid to long term, it would be like, well, there must be something. There must, I didn't do anything. You know, like, like I definitely yeah. didn't do anything. So there's got to be a bug. Like I'm not even in situations where I would, I'm not in multiplayer games. Like there's, there's, I don't message anyone there. I don't invite people to things. I don't play with it. it there's nothing that can possibly be misinterpreted about my behavior on the PSN. Nothing. So what do you do then? I would probably just write in and hope for the best. And this is what I was going to say about to his point to what you were saying earlier is that there needs to be an acknowledgement and Sony needs to be better, way better for my, cause I don't, I haven't had any experience with their customer service as like a, a civilian, let's say. I remember when my PS3 broke when I was at IGN, they treated me like, you know, I was a fucking rock star and gave me a new machine, basically. Uh, you know, like I sent my machine in and they just basically sent a new one back. And that's not the way people are usually treated by them. And so I think that, I think it's urgent that, and this is, again, <laughs> I'm never going to get access to these guys ever again, but the people that do get access to them one day, and you need to ask these kinds of questions, like the, the journalists and the media types that you should be asking deep questions. Like what is going on with like, this should be a whole conversation about yeah. what's the P what is your vision for the PSN? What is, should people be confident that the PSN is going to exist in 2050? I mean, my whole assertion is, is that Sony would have to have gone out of business for the PSN to disappear. And so I'm fairly confident that that's not going to happen in the decades to come. And it would be the end of all things for them if that happened. It would be the end of the company. If PlayStation Store just was like, no, no more games. Your games are gone. All like they they know. So I try to read it in a more Occam's razor fashion where I'm like simplest explanations, right? They don't want to ban you from PlayStation Store. They don't. They don't. They probably look for every reason not to ban you from PlayStation Store. And so when when things get when you do get banned, yeah, it is reasonable to ask, like, what did you do? But in this and that's in random situations in this situation, I think that they should just communicate and say, like, listen, we had a bug. There is definitely a commonality between all those accounts. I'm telling you, it would be interesting. God, if I was still a, a journalist, I'd be look, I'd be trying to find as many of these accounts as possible, go through their games, try to figure out, like, what is it about you? That had you targeted, because it could also be and Chris, let's go to you, it could also be. Like I said, a rogue employee that's just going and banning people, but I just don't know how you would even. Yeah, I don't know. So where are you on this? Is this something we need to worry about? Is this another piece like another domino? So let's consider the discovery thing a domino. Is this another domino of concern for the digital ecosystem? Or is this just kind of something that happened and they in classic Sony fashion, they're just going to pretend nothing ever happened? Yeah, well, it ain't great. You know, like I think this is definitely something that should raise concerns for any because if there's no real reason and if it is a bug then that means like what you know the only reason that you haven't been hit is just by the sheer number of people on the playstation store that make it really unlikely that you would be singled out in any real way even by a bug or like some random rogue employee or or whatever the hell is causing this but they definitely need to i don't know they they definitely need to say something because it's like you said they don't want to ban like they they look they probably do look for every reason not to ban you because you are literally money to them mm-hmm. exactly so it makes no sense for them to go around indiscriminately banning people unless there's either a bug or you know a rogue employee or some other nonsense going on and they need to communicate that clearly maybe even rescind every single ban that's happened in the last you know few days just to just to be safe because i mean let's be real if anybody got banned for a legitimate reason they're going to be banned again you know if they continue that behavior anyway so I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's something that they would be willing to do, if that's something that they would be willing to admit, like, hey, that we fucked up every ban from you know this day onward is, is rescinded. Um, I don't know if that would I, I feel like that would go a long way. Uh, and I feel like that would do a, that would that would go a long way while doing absolute minimal damage, I think. Um, but, you know, wait and see. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're motivation would be to stay silent in a situation like this when they know they're losing people who are obviously dedicated enough to even notice dedicated enough to talk about it uh and clearly you know relatively loyal customers i don't i i don't know maybe they feel like they're too big to care but 
I don't think that's a good attitude. Um, so they definitely got to say something soon. Yeah. And I, I think it's important to underline the idea because I think some people are like, well, these companies can just be randomly punitive. And that is true. In there, and, and companies can be randomly punitive. But I just think that you have got to look at it through the lens of them just wringing you dry like a fucking towel. And you're all just towels hanging on a rack and they don't want to discard any of you. You have to like literally force them, like force their hand. And so, yeah, I just here I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. But from a technical from a technical level, it's also been many, many years since the PSN outage where maybe we should just I don't want to say move on. It's an amazing story. But to the fact where it's like we always expect something's going to go wrong with PSN. It's like, I don't know, man. I, I just I'm, I'm it, shocked that you want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Giant corporation, Sony. No, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm you. just saying this is like a severely fucked situation. They deserve no benefit of the doubt. Sure. It may not have been their fault that it was a bug, but the fact they haven't said anything, the fact that not everyone's gotten their account back yet. I mean, there is no benefit of the doubt. In my opinion. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. That's a fair, fair critique. I think. I don't think it's yeah. what happened that matters as much as the lack of communication. I, I'm starting to wonder why it is that they think they don't have to say anything about anything at all. Remember the last week I said that they've written 11 press releases this year. Mm hmm. One a month, I'm, basically. Yeah, it's, it's like that's that's insane. I, I don't even understand how that's possible. Right. And. This is just another example. And then they, they they didn't communicate this anywhere. If someone found this on PlayStation.com, you know, you have to go like refresh all that shit and go through yeah. the legal notices. And that's how it's found. It's not like they released a press release saying like this is happening. They're just going, oh, ah. want to come play The Last of Us? No return mode. So, yeah, I totally <laughs> agree. We should keep these companies to account. But I give them the benefit of the doubt, I guess, again, through the Occam's razor of saying, I just think there is something a little more and I don't want to say innocent, but not that big of a deal here. There's something about a game these people played. There's something about an experience they had on some game. There's something about you. You said it. There could be like a character in a certain place. Like, I, and I'm not saying it's yeah. like I, I feel like, like they all have uh, A's as the fifth letter of that. I have no fucking idea, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it, 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 I feel like it's I get that impetus or I, I get that impulse, but also like I'll I'll have that. I'll have that reaction when they say something, you know what I mean? Mm. Because staying quiet on it is is weird to me. Colin, I got to hold your feet to the fire a little bit on this mm -hmm. because I just I really feel like right now, let's say you got banned on Friday or whenever this happened. When was this uh, earlier in the week? Yeah. Let's say your account that had tens of thousands of dollars of games on it, all your trophies, all your saves in the cloud. And the only thing you've heard from support is sorry, we banned people for a reason. Um, and you were, you were banned. And that's all you heard from multiple times and you still wasn't fixed. Your tune would be so different. Yeah, I agree with you. I also, I, I totally agree with you. But I don't, no, you're right. And let me say this. <laughs> if that happened to me, I would look into my legal options to see if I could force yeah, them to I would, say something. I would agree you know? on that for sure. Um, just because yeah. that at my point would be, it's not a throwaway amount of money. It's not a throwaway amount of stuff or whatever. And that would be unfortunate that you'd even have to do that. And it could very well be that like there's a thing in the EULA where it's like, well, you can't do that at all. Like it's all about arbitration. And so I, I think you're right. I think you make a fair point. I'm just saying that I think that. I think there's this argument that's being made, right, that's constructed about digital goods. And that's an argument that exists. But I think that not every bullet is for that battle even if they seem like they're related to each other. And I guess that's the point I'm making that like the, the, especially with the, let me look at my notes here, the discovery stuff like that to me is like not a bullet for this. Sure. Right? Cause we're really talking about yeah. video games and access to video games. This may be now the random PSN account banning. You're right. It I would totally be singing a different tune, but I'd also be, but I'm, and I'm not discounting people's experiences. It's clearly widespread and it clearly has nothing to do with people's context, content, um, uh, or activities per se, but you and I both know full well as someone who we, we moderate a community of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, right. That are just ev all over these platforms and people will say, and people will come back to me or come back to you when you ban them somewhere and be like, I didn't do anything. And it's like, yes, you did. And so I yeah. often wonder about when I hear just one off things 
about people's digital experiences. I'm like, I'm not entirely sure I believe you didn't do anything. I'm not saying that in this specific situation. And that's why I'm, I guess, a little more skeptical about just en masse the, the deletion or removal of people's people's profiles, because I know that people often pretend that they don't do anything. And then there no, there is a reason you called someone a fucking slur or you did something, you know, like. Right. And and so I, that's what I'm saying. I think you're I think you're generally right. I would fl- I would flip out. And I also have the means to, like, at least try to pursue recourse, which I know a lot of people don't. And so I think you're totally right. I give you that 100 percent. But I also just think that we're we're accumulating this argument that is getting a little mixed up at this point. And I think a lot of it is because we just talk about it constantly. And I, I think it's because it's very relevant and germane right now. But it's 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 only interesting. And see, this wouldn't even be a conversation in the Xbox space because there is no physical media in the Xbox space, basically. You know, like right. people don't buy games uh, like I'm not saying they don't buy physical games, really. They, they don't even exist in a lot of cases. There's no sub market or indie market for Xbox games at all. Doesn't exist. So that conversation wouldn't even that conversation is kind of a little more accelerated there. And I just think that. Maybe you're right that you shouldn't give the company the benefit of the doubt. And that's true. But I look at it again through a logical lens of how they will generally want to treat their customers if they want to survive. You know, and I guess that's the argument I'm making. So we're yeah. both we both have, you know, I, I don't I, I know some people are also tired of this because this is coming up all the time. And I think a lot of people are with you and I totally appreciate that. But I'm just trying to keep things as consistent as possible. So we're not trying to get splash damage on the on the topic from things that don't really have anything to do with it that are happening right. outside of it. Yeah. My, I guess, closing point is just that I own thousands of dollars of digital games, particularly on PC, where I don't have an option to buy physical. Um, so I, I under, I'm i like, I have one foot in this too, uh, not by choice. Do you give Valve the benefit of the doubt? No, it's just, that's the thing is that here's, oh, hold on, let me finish my point yeah, here. I'm sorry, is yeah, that yeah. With, if I have the option, I want to have the control. And so, yes, I will buy I buy physical because let's say this happens to you, whether you deserve it or whether you don't, it doesn't matter, is that you still have your investment in the games that you purchased, whether you go out and create a new account and try to avoid the ban. That's an option. Whether you decide, well, at this point, I'm going to sell my investment of all these games. You have that option to do that Um, with digital. You don't have that option. And so we are in a world now where it's like, yeah. Uh, I either give Valve the benefit of the doubt or I just don't play games on PC. And sometimes, you know, well, I guess I've never made a game purchasing decision because of that. But that's why at the end of this, all, end of all this, I don't want digital to go away and I don't want physical to go away. I want them to both coexist for people like me that want to be able to protect their investment and enjoy that aspect of it. That's yeah. always the point I've tried to make is make is that I think that we should have both. And the people that like physical should be loud and go out and per- spend their money on physical games because that's yeah. what sends the message like, hey, there's an ecosystem of people that want that. So for any number of reasons that we talked about on the show, I don't need to get into all of them. They're t- like you said, they're tired of hearing about it. But no, totally. I, I, yeah. I, the, the news is the news. I mean, I, we can't really do yeah. about that. Yeah, I I. I do feel like the benefit of the doubt thing is kind of getting a little mixed up because I feel like we're we're talking about your your right to own to ownership and being banned and and them not saying anything. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like if if my Steam account was banned for no reason, I would definitely not be giving Valve the benefit of the doubt. You yeah, know to- I mean? totally. I like understand I would, that. Yeah. And I feel the same way about pretty much every every single uh, platform. They, they they do need to speak on. No, you're this. right. I think I was wrong with using that term. I, maybe it's. I don't know. I'd have to think about it more. I I think from a certain perspective, I just believe that companies exist to make money and continue their own survival, like a, like a life form. Right. And, and they're not going to alienate their customers on mass. They can't do it. They like literally just cannot do it. And way too much is riding, especially for Sony on PlayStation. Like PlayStation goes down. It's done. That whole company because they, well, they get to make so yeah. much money and so much of their profit. I'm sorry, go ahead on PlayStation. No, no, I was gonna say like they they shouldn't do it ideally, but I I feel like the a, a company being run is a little bit like 
like evolution like sometimes evolution will like make some change that is just completely it's a mutation that's completely unbeneficial to the to the greater organism and then that that version of it kind of splinters off and dies and and the one that has the proper mutation splinters off and lives and it's i feel like it's somewhat similar where you can have people at the head of a company who are just making really just objectively terrible decisions because they they've been i don't know yes manned all their way there or maybe their instincts are off or maybe they just don't really have um they're so disconnected from the user experience or or, or, or any number of things could contribute to you know companies making decisions that are just not good for their bottom line or for their customers. I, I don't think it's necessarily a, like an impossibility that that would happen just because it's in the company's best interest to pursue profit and growth. You know, um, these can always be misled because ultimately these are these are still just people and conglomerations of people at the head of these and people are fallible and they will make mistakes and they will often be wrong. So um, I don't know. I think. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. The, ultimately. This needs to be addressed, I think, is, is, I really, think, is really the closing point. I, yeah, I, I agree. And I, I think I think maybe the best way to address this and this doesn't really go against my own politics because I don't really think that this is a bad role of government is to just create really cohesive and deep consumer protections at oh, yeah. the Easily. national level to just say, like, you can't you literally cannot do that. Like you, companies simply are not allowed to do that. And. I suspect that when we get or if we ever do, if we survive as a country long enough to get fucking people in into Congress that understand the Internet, that that would be a fairly urgent and easy thing to pass to just say, like, companies cannot without some reaching some sort of barrier an explanation or ever just lock you out of your iTunes. They can't lock you out of PSN. They can't lock you out of fucking whatever. And right. I think that that would probably solve a lot of this, these problems. And I wouldn't mind that either. And. Again, I'm saying that like you were saying, Dustin, in the hypothetical, like, what would I do? It's like, I think. I would I would do it. I would probably never play video games again if that happened to me, like straight <laughs> up. I'd probably seriously, I'd probably be like, I'm done. Yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. And yeah. and honestly, I don't even give a fuck. about. I'm not trying to be an asshole. I could give a fuck about my back catalog of games. I would want my trophies, you know, and I know that that's crazy to a lot of people, but that would really because <laughs> so a lot I of people would say, like, opposite. I want my games. I don't want my I, if you if you could get one or the other, right, you can get one of these things back. But you keep the games, dude. I'm not going to play fucking 99.9% of those games ever again. I don't give a fuck. You know, I want like the legacy of what I've yeah. done, you know, and if you're going to take that away from yeah. me, that would be a big deal. That's so and, interesting. Yeah. And I because it, it again, I know people have these like have, and I get it like having this whole catalog, this wall of movies or whatever. But the reality is, is that I don't play go back and play games almost ever. If I had to go back and refill my back catalog of like, what are the games you you really go back to? It's like I'd buy the Mega Man Legacy Collection and fucking Castlevania Konami Collection, all those things. I don't know, man. I, I've played them. So I'm done. Yeah. And I'm moving mm -hmm. on. So I'm, I'm not excusing that either because that's not part of the deal. I'm just saying that I would have a fucking nervous breakdown from the trophy perspective if that happened to me. And because it's just because it means something to me. Not that I care about what other people think about them, but because it's my whole legacy. It's everything I've done, you know? <laughs> and I, I, I love that kind of shit. I'm very um, sentimental. Yeah. So. So, yeah, that would bum me out. And then you'd have to, I guess, pursue some sort of legal recourse, not to say like you would sue Sony out of into oblivion. What I'm saying is that you'd probably have to, like, get a law firm to go and pro prod around and be like, you got to tell us why yeah. you did this. You know, like, yeah, you, gotta you, you could probably muster up a reasonable at least small like class action and so and so at least small enough to get noticed and like get get a statement at the very least you know um i don't know what the legal recourse is for that really but like with it with the eula but um i don't know it, it's every time you say every time you say you would have a nervous breakdown i think of I think of larry david learning that his his wife has cancer and he's like yeah, oh yeah <laughs> and he's fanny faint oh yeah when he's married to the um the, the, black, the black lady woman. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's so good yeah he like faints oh <gasps> I put this out on Twitter, but that would be a great question for Hogue. What rights yeah. do you have? Yeah. When we were at the do you have the right be. to know why you were banned? And do you, when you sign up for a PlayStation account, agree to the fact that you are saying, yeah, you are, you don't have to tell me if you banned me. Yeah. Cause I'm be part of the language. I'm sure it's in, I, the thing is, is, I'm sure it's in that language. I'm sure it's in that language that they're like, we can do whatever we want, but yeah. I just think you should have to explain that to society. That you're basically just going to run around with impunity. Like if someone at Sony doesn't like me, could they ban me? And then right, Sony, yeah. but but the other thing you would ask, and I'm knocking on wood, is that Sony definitely doesn't like me, and they don't, they haven't, you know, because I spend hundreds of dollars a month on PSN, and they're like, well, we just don't do that to our customers. We don't give a shit if we like you, you're not. Your money is green, 
And yeah. uh, so I think it's a very dynamic and interesting co- conversation to have. And I, I think that, yeah, some people are tired of hearing about it. It wouldn't have come up if these things didn't happen. I would say that these are cascading dominoes in some sense that make the conversation even more urgent. But right. But I want to know more. And I think it's it's incumbent on Sony to say something. And I, I, it's just like the stuff with the discovery. It's incumbent on Sony to make it right for the customer. You said that, Dustin. They're the conduit by which the customer. It's like going to, um, I don't know, you go to Target and you return a, a jar of Skippy peanut butter. And like they don't say like, and the, the jar's dinged or whatever. And they don't go like, well, you got to send that in to Skippy. That's right, like you bought it right. at Target. You fucking figure it out with Skippy. <laughs> exactly. So. I don't know why Skippy, Skippy peanut is the best peanut butter. You think so? In my opinion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We buy Jif mostly because the dogs seem to respond better to Jif than to Skippy for some reason. Oh. But I'm oh, also geez. and Micah says that this was like the bootleg peanut butter. But I don't agree with this at all. Is that I love Peter Pan peanut butter. You know? Oh, salmonella. Nice. Is that what that some has? They I had, had, I, well, they, <laughs> they had some kind of recall. Oh, it's like, I, haven't, I haven't had it in several years because Micah won't buy it. I get I get my. Peanut oh, yeah. 2007. I How did I pull that peanut. out? What'd you say, Chris? I get it straight from the peanut. I milk, I milk, oh, the, milk peanut the peanut and then I churn it. Oh, a little bit of peanut milk. All right. Mm. A few more pieces of small news and we can get into what we're playing. Just want to point people to a, a, a story over on Nikkei Asia. So um, Nikkei is a Japanese newspaper and they have an English language article entitled Sony ready to attack in quotes in holiday season with PS5 executive says there's just certain things in here. I thought were interesting, just little throwaway things. So they were asked in November, Sony released a new PS5 model with increased storage capacity, as well as the PlayStation portal, a handheld remote player for the PS5. Why are these devices being released now? And so we can get a little bit from the answer about how they're looking at this generation. He says, quote, typically the life cycle of game consoles is said to be seven to eight years. The PS5 was released in November, 2020 and is now in a third year, putting it in the middle of that cycle. So we, have a little bit of an idea about how they're looking about this thing's life cycle. So 2027, 2028 for a replacement. Thought that was interesting. Thought this was interesting too. question and in, quote, until recently, the PS5 has seen severe supply constraints stemming from semiconductor shortages and logistics disruptions caused by the coronavirus pandemic, end quote. The answer is interesting because he says this in part, quote, there are approximately 2000 parts in a PlayStation. And if even one semiconductor is missing, it cannot be manufactured. Some parts are procured from one company while others are procured from multiple companies. We are now purchasing from multiple companies wherever possible in order to diversify risks. And quote, this must be the reason why some PS5s break. Right. You would have to assume. I mean, this I, this to me solidifies the house mark question, for instance, right, with Returnal. There must have been some component in those PlayStations that were different that simply would not operate because there's 2000 parts and they're swapping them. What do you think about that, Dustin? You think there's anything to that? Uh, that sounds 100 percent logical to me it makes me think of when i got a macbook when i first got into college it was when the retina macbook just came out and there was a big thing amongst the hardcore enthusiasts on mac forums and stuff that which screen model were you going to get were you going to get the samsung screen or the lg screen because arguably that i can't remember which but one of the screens was better than the other it had a better color tone to it and so People were buying MacBooks and opening like it's the fucking lottery and seeing what screen they got. And if they didn't get the screen part, because Apple doesn't tell you, they just sourced two screens that they tried as as hard as they can to make identical. So in this case, I'm sure that that was the case with Sony, where certain components were, you know, sourced uh, in a way that, you know, there was two different that they thought that they would be identical. But in certain cases, they might not be. Uh, I would imagine the processor, though. I don't know if that would be sourced from multiple. Usually those come from TMC, uh, but I'm not entirely sure about that. And then finally, there's a question, quote, the PS5 is a dedicated home console, but as Microsoft's recent acquisition of Activision Blizzard shows, the industry is moving towards PC gaming and mobile games. And part of the answer here I thought was interesting. And I I wonder if they're going to start trying to market like this more. It says, quote, if you want to play PC games with the same GPU performance and so forth as the PS5, you have to spend money and time to build your own PC. While doing so can be rewarding, a dedicated console allows any player to enjoy games at the same technical level right out of the box. I wonder if this will become a more compelling thing, especially with PS5 Pro, which we assume was coming next year. If they're going to start to play that game more computer le- like. It used to be console level, right? With Vita, we want to get we want to appre- we want to get console level gaming. I wonder if this is like we can achieve PC level gaming on PlayStation 5 Pro without you having to go and do all this kind of stuff. It's a very tantalizing thing, although I wonder if that's 
even a big market at all. So I, I wanted to throw that out there as well. I wonder if we're going to see more marketing on that front. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Two more things. This isn't for you guys, but I have to bring this up because I think this is a fucking huge deal. In fact, I, it's it's so disappointing to not see this on more gaming websites as I was researching the show because there's such a little crossover between sports and games and I just don't understand it. But this is a big thing happened here. Um, on 3.com wrote EA Sports college football game on track for summer release after settlement. So it says EA Sports upcoming college football game has one less hurdle in its production path. The brand group, the brand R group and one team partners announced Thursday they have reached a settlement agreement and a lawsuit regarding EA Sports. And so the lawsuit originally was about who basically represents the athletes and to, to um, in in getting their money for this game. And it's important to note that there were major comp- NCAA f- football, the the EA, the old EA game. It last came out in 2013 and it was a pretty big game, sold millions of copies a year. But it had, because of NCAA amateur rules, had no real players in the game. So you basically just, everyone was just numbered. And I think in later games, you can even go in and like add your names, but you had to do it kind of manually and stuff like that. And so with the new rules for for people that don't know, in the NCAA, the amateur rules meant that people could not make money on their likeness. Um, they call it the NIL, it's the name, image, and likeness. And this is a big deal because it means that they can't basically make any profit from their performance in a college sport. And this has always been looked at as majorly predatory, in my opinion, like totally fucked yeah. that that these guys like couldn't make money. Now they're making a lot of money. The best football players in college football are making millions of dollars a year. And that's the way it should be, because most of them don't get to the NFL. Many that make it to the NFL aren't good in the NFL. There's only so much you can do. And so this is another way for them to make money is to protect their name and image and license. So going back to the last release for 2013 of NCAA football, that was in a different world. This game is being released into a world where there's going to be the people in the games and they needed to figure out how much they're going to get paid. And they've apparently ironed that out because the original thing was $500 per player, which seems really low, but it's really not when you consider like it's just 99% of these college football teams are constructed of people that are just going to go into the real world and not play football. But They've figured this out and it's exciting. And EA has reported apparently as a result of the reaching this agreement so that they can move on. EA says the following quote, we are pleased that brand R has decided to withdraw their claims without any payment from EA. We've been clear from the beginning that the suit had no merit. Our focus continues to be on directly licensing individual college athlete name and likenesses rights through an opt in program that will give college athletes the choice if they want to be in our game. We're pleased to move on from these claims and look forward to delivering EA Sports College Football in summer 2024. Boys, I'm just here to tell you that game is going to be fucking huge, huge, huge. The old ones are still huge, Colin. I mean, they're they're still hold value for Xbox 360 copies. So absolutely. I had a buddy of mine, Doug, that I lived with in college who would play an NCAA football on Xbox 360 and just simulate seasons like over and over and over again, like deep into the future, not even really play the game, but she used to use the statistical stuff in the game, which is really cool. Yeah, it is. It, it, it cannot be understated how big college football is in the United States. It's fucking massive. And I don't give a, I don't give a, I could care less about college football, dude. I didn't go to a college. I had a football team, so I don't care, but it's yeah. big. It's really, really, really big. This is going to be one of the big selling games year in and year out now in the United States. It's another, entry into that so i'm really pleased for ea to to bring that back and i'm excited for the college athletes that can finally make a little bit of money and have i think more importantly for all time have their name and likeness in a video game like that i think it's probably mega exciting and these guys are going to opt in like uh, you know hand over fist it's gonna be crazy it's gonna be awesome yeah all right my friends let's get oh wait actually there's one more thing sorry i just wanted to point this out on playstation blog this actually came out when we were recording last week, so I didn't get to say this, but that really dope looking game from Ironwood Studios, Pacific Drive. I don't know if you guys remember this. We saw this yeah. earlier in the year. Comes to PlayStation 5, February 22nd, 2024. So please look forward to it. Can't wait to play it. It looks fun. I'm definitely going to check that out. It'll be a crowded February. No doubt about it. All right. With that, let's get into what we're playing. I'll go first since you guys are sharing some of your games here. Final Fantasy 4, Platinum number 153. Dagan and I recorded a three hour knockback about it, and that will go live shortly after this goes live on Patreon. So please look forward to that deep conversation about one of the great games of all time. I also forgot to bring this up. I last week I went back and played Gravity Circuit again and actually beat it because I kind of got to the last boss and then just stopped playing. So I, I beat the entire game 
and it's really wonderful it's a really really great game if you're into Mega Man 2d style action games and finally because it was free on ps plus this is one of the kind of convenient games because i wanted to buy this game for so long and i'm like eh as I re- explained last week, it's so it's free for PS Plus Essential, quote in quotes, free Power Wash Simulator from Future Lab. And I've played it for a few nights now, and it's really fun. I really, really like it. I I don't want to just sit there and fucking raw dog it all day, you know, like, like and, get, and get through it like we do with a lot of games. I think it's a good supplement to like sit down and do one stage a night or something. And I'm really digging it. It's a good podcast game and it's just therapeutic. I can see people really, really loving it. I can see people being like, this sucks. And I guess that's why that's why, you know, being good on PS Plus, we'll see if people enjoy it or not. But I'm, I'm feeling it. Did you guys play it? I know, ben, like Dustin, you said Ben was really into it. Did yeah. You, did you check it out? I checked it out for a little bit. I I get the appeal. And I think at some point. It would be nice to go back to when you just want to chill, listen to a podcast or something like that. But I actually I really want to go and download it so I can play the DLC that has the Final Fantasy seven levels and stuff in there. And there's like a Tomb mm-hmm. Raider one as well. Mm-hmm. That sounds really fun. Did you ever check it out, Chris? No, not yet. I, I have it downloaded, but I haven't uh, I haven't actually mean it, like really put any time into it at all. I want to, though. Shit, my uh, my accountant called me. I got to call him back. You guys go without me. <laughs> we talk about, about Lethal games. Company. Yeah, yeah, you guys can go for that. Yeah, hell yeah, dude. Okay. So both so, of us, yeah, we've been playing Lethal Company. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't, I played for about four hours, like a couple days ago with some some friends of mine. Uh, so I haven't played like a ton necessarily. I know I know it's like a huge Twitch game right now or like a huge yeah, really game up. right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but. I don't know. How do you I I it so something that this game really ironed out for me is that I really miss proximity voice in yes. video games, especially in multiplayer games. I know that that kind of like died and with the advent of like uh you know Xbox Live parties and, and PlayStation parties and, and party chat and all that stuff and even even a little bit with TeamSpeak before and and Skype during that era and definitely now with Discord where a lot of people just sort of jump into uh they they're not really on mic as much as they used to be, but this game you like you need to be on mic like it's part of the experience and i love right. that and your your voice actually gets lower and lower the further away you are and if you die it gets cut off abruptly and it's those are like i think i i have not laughed as hard as i've laughed playing this game purely for that reason alone it's not even necessarily the gameplay or like what you're doing but just the sheer uh auditory chaos right of this game is so fun so i guess before we go any further, just for the people who don't know what right, Lethal yeah. Company is, just so, just some context about this uh, <laughs> voice stuff, because I would say that is probably the thing for the game is that it's a multiplayer game. I mean, you could play it by yourself, but you don't want to. On PC, it's an early access, and normally I don't buy early access games, but I was convinced. I'm glad I did. It's only $10. And here's the point of the game. You and up to four or three, you and three other friends land on a moon and you are like junkers like you're going out and you're trying to find scrap so you land on a moon and like chris said there's proximity chat so if you want to hear someone you either need to be close enough to them or you need to get a walkie-talkie and you can talk via walkie-talkie which all that has battery life along with a flashlight or something like that so you and your scrapper friends need to go into these different buildings on these moons and find scrap so there's like in in the first level there's like screws or sheet metal or something like that and so the tough part where the challenge comes in is that once you go into these buildings you are not alone there are monsters in the building and there's different kinds of monsters that uh react in different ways and that's what's kind of makes it really interesting there's spiders that may not necessarily do anything unless you get too close to them. There's some that can hear you. And that comes into the proximity chat thing where if you and your friends are talking really loud, the monster will come and find you and kill you. But where this proximity chat gets so fucking funny is that you'll like hear your friend from a distance and it it does volume. So if they're further away, you'll still hear them a little bit. And you're like, a, oh, fuck. And then it'll just cut out and they'll be dead. And you'll be like, 
Brody, <laughs> you good? You out there, dog? Like, what's going on? And you don't know sometimes if they're dead or alive. Or if someone like falls off. Uh, like, there's like some of these bottomless pits where you're like, oh, fuck. And you just hear them like slowly get quiet as they go down. Uh, yeah. But yeah, Chris, dude, legitimately, the last few nights I've been playing this, it is, it is a, it is as much a horror game as it is like hilarious it is one of the funniest games i've ever played just from a lot of that proximity chat stuff right yeah dude it, it reminds me a lot of the way that i felt when i first played left for dead where like and granted i was younger when i played left for dead so it was, maybe i was just a little bit more easily scared but like the witch in left for dead i remember being like really scary but like whenever shit would really go down i would be mm. laughing so hard and it's like it's very it carries that energy in some way, especially because you're with three other friends and, and there's kind of there's there's some DNA there. It's not identical at all, but, you know, it, it reminded me of those days. And what I love about it is just like the, the idea of making an extraction horror game is is kind of interesting. Like, that's a really neat idea. There's no shooting. There's no real combat. You can pick up like a shovel or like a, a yield sign or something and maybe do like a little bit of damage to some to some monsters. But you're really encouraged not to fight. You're just kind of get in, grab what you can, avoid uh, the monsters, some of the monsters are really actually like really caught me off guard because they were actually off putting. Uh, Dude, there, there's one that once you it's kind of like maybe it's the Enderman in like a weeping, once you like lock a weeping eyes, angel, right? Where you like if you look away from it, it moves. Yeah. If you look away, it will come towards you. But if you l stare at it and walk towards it, you can actually push it away from you. Yeah. Uh, Dude. Yeah. That one's extra creepy. It's really fun. We have to play. Dude, you and I have to play yeah. some time because I didn't know you were playing this. Yeah, me and my friend Brandon and Jimmy Champagne, who, dude, Jimmy, we he we got him a shovel and he fucking killed one of the monsters with it. It was one of the most baller things that he beat that thing to death. It yeah. was equally <laughs> hilarious just because we were we were running away in fear like holy shit we're gonna get and then he turned around and killed it and it was awesome i i yeah i i'm a big i'm a big fan of it normally like i mean like dustin said like it's it's an early access game normally i don't i normally i don't engage right. with it but it just looked infectiously fun and i love and again just proximity voice in multiplayer games i think is just such a core ingredient to what made I mean, Halo 2 had it, and it's it's a big reason why I loved Halo 2 so much is because you could hear people like getting closer and you could you hear their mics cut off when they die. And it was just hysterical. It's hysterical to hear somebody go like, ah, and then, <laughs> and, then, and, yeah. then just, and then they're gone. It's like it's really satisfying. And it's like a really like deceptively comp. It's like a very it's a simple game, but it's like deeply. There's a lot to it, like that in-game yeah. store where you can you have to actually type out what you want and and even just like the cameras. And what I love about it, too, is like those those monsters that can hear you. I remember mm. a specific moment where I was like roaming through the woods. And I was trying to get back to uh, to the ship with like my last bit of scrap. And I had the walkie talkie on. And my friend was like, hey, man, you good? I was like, oh, fuck. This shit. And, I, <laughs> and, I scrambled, and I scrambled to shut it off. And like I somehow survived. But it was like, oh, man, that's like that's such a good like that feeling of tension is so fun and awesome and so engaging and that that the sandbox allows for something like that where if your friends trying to communicate to you they can actually kind of fuck you up in some way that's yeah. it's great it's it's a great cooperative uh experience uh, i've been waiting for a game like this for a while uh, yeah, honestly it, it kind of has a lot of phasmophobia type elements to it if anyone's played that there's there's a thing you can do i don't know if you've messed with this chris at all but you can i guess you mentioned cameras what you can do is leave someone behind at the ship and they have access to almost it's kind of like a Metal Gear Solid style radar system where yeah. and if you have to have walkie talkie. So one person can, can be guiding people in the facility while they're back at the ship trying to be like, OK, go left. And they can see the monsters pop up on on the map so they can be like, fuck, get out of there. And then you just see, you know, that they're like dots, like slowly stop moving. And then it's yeah. like, oh, man. It's uh it's awesome. I highly, highly recommend it. Yeah. Uh but I'm looking it up. Lethal, so you're talking about Lethal Company, right? Lethal, lethal company. company, yeah. 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 This is yeah. on PC only? PC yeah, only. For, I would for now. I, I I can't I don't imagine that this would be too difficult to get working on a but like I mean it's early access that's I imagine I didn't recognize any of do you know who's making this? Because I don't I didn't recognize any of the signage or uh, Zeke. I'm pretty sure this was made by one guy. Yeah. And so now obviously he's a multimillionaire, which I yeah. love hearing stuff like that. Yeah, me too. He, 
I want to make sure I swear in our group, I can't remember if someone said it, that apparently he made Roblox stuff before oh. he made this game. I don't know if that's true, though. That's secondhand information. But yeah, if yeah. that's the case. Good for him. I love to hear that kind of success story. But yeah. I also, side note, I, I, I do like the way it looks. It's got this kind of lo-fi, uh, not not quite PS1, but like there's 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 some like intentionally low texture kind of um, it feels nostalgic to play, even though I've never played it, which is cool. It's like a nice feeling. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's as much as I mean, there's no story to be told of any. It's it's purely cooperative and purely sandbox driven. But uh, I see you've been diving into Fortnite, which is something I've also been oh. curious about. Yeah, let's talk about that real quick. I was diving back into Fortnite because my one friend Brandon plays all the time and I've been hearing only good things recently and I have hopped in maybe once or twice in the past year but yeah. nothing too concrete yeah, and now too. with this big new announcement of all the new stuff that they're doing it's really really interesting and not quite unprecedented but they're definitely doing things in their own unique way where this morning I was checking out, they just added the Lego Fortnite mode. Dude, this is a full blown game within Fortnite that they could have charged money for separately yeah. where it's kind of like Minecraft in a lot of ways, but definitely still very much Fortnite and obviously Lego. It's going to be huge. Like this is going to be a really, really big yeah. game. Uh, I haven't, I haven't even seen I haven't seen any footage of that one or, or any of these. I, I purely jumped in because I saw <laughs> I, I, I didn't even know they were doing all this other stuff. I just jumped in because they put Peter Griffin in there. And I thought that was just so astoundingly uh, like absurd to see. Dude, he's I a boss like, I have to, on the map. Like you yeah, can he's find a, him and then you have to kill him. He, yeah, He's a boss. And when you kill him, he does that thing where he like holds his knee. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so it's I, I love. I will say this, man initially when Fortnite was just a bunch of skins and like a bunch of haphazard like oh hey it's a battle royale with like a bunch of oh you're john wick and and you're zendaya literally and that was like mm -hmm. <laughs> that was kind of the fever dream aspect of it i didn't care that much about it because it felt like they were kind of half-assing and it was like okay here's a bunch of skins from a bunch of different things but like whatever but then once they started doing like spider-man and they were like oh hey you can here's a web swing mechanic yeah. or like hey here's uh Here's Peter Griffin, and he's just for some reason here, and it and they they have the the voice clips for when you kill him, and and committing to the bit like that makes me respect it and appreciate it a lot more. Uh, so I wanted to, I installed it today. I haven't jumped into it, but I am curious about that. Yeah, that, it's that Lego thing, and there's also like a cart racer thing too, right? Like a yeah, like that harmonics. Not well, yeah. no, not harmonics. Andrew um, Andrew Walsh wrote into yeah. us later. This was a thing later in the show, but we might as well just use this now. This is one Let's of the six it. inquiries at the end of the show, so we'll have five because this is one of them. Andrew Walsh wrote in, said, "Hey, Sacred Gents, I think we got to talk about what Epic is doing right now. This past weekend, they announced three games that will be on the Fortnite platform: Lego Fortnite, Rocket Racing, and Fortnite Festival. The Lego Group and Epic teamed up to make Lego Fortnite, which is basically Minecraft but with Legos. Rocket Racing is created by Psionics, which is a kart racer, and Fortnite Festival made by Harmonix is Rock Band, but you use your controller instead of the instruments. I honestly can't wait to try all of these. I haven't touched Minecraft in years, but I'm willing to give Lego Fortnite a try. Rocket Racing looks to be an excellent kart racer, and as a massive guitar hero and Rock Band fan, I'm stoked to try anything Harmonix puts out. What do you guys think of all this, and how do you think it'll be impact the industry? Epic is making Fortnite into this incredible platform with tons of options for everyone. Keep on killing it with the content, and maybe someday you guys will make it, make your way to the Great White North. That would be fun to do. Um, yeah, so I wanted to throw that out there. So this is part of that. Psionics is in there too, and they made these they made these these acquisitions of Harmonics and of Psionics towards this end. I would assume so. It's it's fairly brilliant. I mean, obviously they wanted to get in on Rocket League and stuff like that, but they want to fold everything into Fortnite and keep everyone there as a platform. So go go back on Dustin. I just want to make sure to get Andrew's uh, inquiry yeah. in there. When I saw that these three game within a games were announced, I thought, cool, mini game side modes. But yeah, it's not appealing to me. But after playing about an hour of Lego Fortnite this morning, like I said, this is a full blown game. They could have charged money for this. Uh, and I'm just scratching the surface of it. So I I'm bitter about the rock band mode, the Fortnite festival mode, because I want them to make a new rock band so fucking bad that it hurts me that Harmonix is working on Fortnite content. But yeah. 
I want to be open minded about it. So I'm absolutely I think that comes out on the day of release of this podcast on Friday. So yeah. I will absolutely check it out. Uh, they released the set list of songs and there's a lot of good stuff on there like Weezer and they got killers and some other you know non other I, stuff that i'm not as into but I, I gotta say man i appreciate too the fact that i mean you see the story a lot where a, a bunch of developers are kind of brought onto a an existing product and just sort of brought on to really continue that cycle you see it a lot with call of duty where you know you have um, yeah. a lot of support studios who, who toys were for known bob. yeah toys for bob who, were, who who made great platformers who are now just kind of on, on a support end for call of duty making i don't know maps to to, to serve Call of Duty's existing uh, identity, which, you know, is it, as a business move, I don't think it's necessarily all that bad, but it is kind of nice to see Epic, you know, acquire, you know, like they have Psionics, they have these uh, or they have uh, Harmonix and these other developers and they have them actually work on something that they're good at and then kind of implement that into the existing product as it is, as opposed to kind of ramming a, a square peg into a round hole. And, and trying to make it work in, in that way. I, I do appreciate that because in some ways, you know, you, you we're not going to get a rock band, but we have at the very least a rock band experience by the rock band people. And they didn't go. They, it's not like they fucked off and, and made like a new Fortnite map. You know what I mean? That that had like, I don't know, music themed buildings in it or something. You know what I mean? It's actually um, substantively good content which is nice to it's that's just nice to see and i prefer that model although granted fortnite is a lot more pliable than call of duty is i, I prefer that model to uh, whatever it is activision is doing with with toys for bob and 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 Beanox and all those other support studios yeah. yeah it's clear after i actually didn't update this on the show after i did it i did check out roblox a few weeks ago oh no <laughs> and uh, it was clearly made for phones or computers and it's very obvious in the interface it's very confusing with it on console but if you look at the homepage of roblox and the new homepage of fortnite it is so obvious that that's what they're trying to do that mm. they want to morph fortnite into be a, a marketplace for people to come and make games and personally i think that that sounds actually pretty cool if they give people a tool set that is maybe a little easier and could be a jumping point kind of like roblox was for the creator of lethal company but yeah people do that in fortnite i think it sounds and dude people you know already plugged in it has such a big install base and if it enables people to make livings off of it then i'm for it yeah, yeah. it's uh this is gonna be very interesting i, I was kind of my mind was kind of going about just an arcade cabinet with a Roxy on it or something in one of these, yeah. in one of these worlds where, what, why Imagine if a, Sony, you know, had a, a, a tool set to make games where creators <laughs> could come and make games and then sell them yeah. and then they could release those games on the PlayStation. Yeah. That, would, that also, would be an insane idea. Also Sony with PlayStation home, not for nothing. Oh, pretty yeah. far ahead of the game on that. Absolutely. Yeah, actually yes. yeah, totally. too far ahead of the game. In fact. Yeah. And, uh, I don't really have much else to say. I, 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 I've been playing Cult of the Lamb I've, uh, on nice. my Steam Deck, which is like a perfect way to play that game, by the way. A really, really great handheld game. But I really like it. It's really cute. I don't know how much... I don't know if I'm going to necessarily play it f like for a long time, but it's, it's, very, it's a nice kind of unwind game. Like I play at least... I play like a few runs before I go to bed every night, and it's, it's really cute and really disturbing. And really fun. It's like Binding of Isaac with like a little bit of a, a little bit of a little bit of Sims aspects to it. A little bit of a, a little bit of Animal Crossing. It's a weird combination of shit that really kind of shouldn't work. Uh, but I'm surprisingly into it. Although I will say my cult is falling apart like really quickly. I've I've recruited too many people and now people are starving to death. And now I'm having to <laughs> make their their bodies into burgers because they don't have enough food actual food for everybody else so it's like people are getting sick i'm probably gonna have to clean house and start over <laughs> but it's some uh people, some it's people weird... like it when you eat when you're a cannibal and other people aren't into it that's the yeah. the scary part you know not everyone's gonna be on board and but... i gotta say man i love any game where you can name your where you can name npcs whatever the fuck you want to name them I, this is like a big thing with me with tactics games for some reason. I love yeah. like in, in Gears Tactics and other tactics games where if I if I can name my soldiers after like 
my real life friends and then watch them get trounced. There's something really funny about it. Or even just like playing with them. It's like, oh man, Colin's down. Great. <laughs> you know? Yeah, XCOM but it's, it's, was a game like that. Yeah. Dude, with the and permadeath it, too, it, it felt more personal. It felt real. And so uh, the Cult of the Lamb has that and I've just been an absolute dickhead with these names. Uh, and I've, I've, I've been having a good time with it. But it's a perfect Steam Deck game. Highly recommend it if you can play it like portably in some way. Maybe on the portal. Yeah, sure. Actually, it'd be really good too if you have it on PlayStation already. Finally, Matthew Miller wrote in before we get into the news and just said, Colin, I'm writing in on the release of Avatar Frontiers of Pandora to get a temperature check on your interest in this game. The review consensus seems to be Far Cry in the universe of Avatar. This world seems to be squarely in your wheelhouse. Does the impending winter break combined with a full, a lull, I'm sorry, in new releases, have you heeding the call to Pandora? As I said earlier, I'm, I'm, all, I'm in. I don't know if I'm going to begin playing tonight from when we're recording because there's a good football game on tonight. There's some hockey on tonight. We have the game awards tonight that we have to yeah. watch. So we're going to be recording somewhat late. I don't know if I'm going to get to it tonight, but certainly this weekend. I'll have more to say about it next week. No doubt about there it. There is a performance mode, Colin. I think I had predicted that that wouldn't, but it seems there is some kind of mode where it's not quite 60, but better than 30. Good. Okay, we're here with the interstitial for the game awards took me even a minute just a pregnant pause there to just even get to the term of the game award how do we feel about that after what felt like a long three hours i was i stayed off of social media and off my phone and i saw towards the end i saw that we had a couple texts in the in the group thread of how you know generally how boring i guess you guys felt like it was and i also felt like time was just running kind of slow so i don't know if i'm just being harsh on the show or whatever but i'm curious what your thoughts are dustin let's start with you yeah well chris and i we we couldn't resist exchanging a few words uh, when we were here. We, we got here a minute or two before you and just. Uh, I don't know the the thing that Chris said, I, I don't want to take your words, Chris, but I thought the exact same thing. It's like, am I jaded <laughs> now? Like, is something happening to us that it's just I don't want to think that everything sucks, but uh, not everything did suck there. I don't want to make it sound like right. that, but yeah. just um. There were some cool announcements and we can get into those. But if we're talking about the show in general, man, this year felt like the most commercial ridden advertisement fest above all. Dude, the the fact like immediately there was the one in particular with Sam Lake where he like started to talk and within 30 seconds they were playing music like just no respect at all. And I get it. You want to make sure you keep people in check after last year with uh, the God of War actor guy going for eight minutes. But and I'm glad I'm by the way, I'm glad they gave him a way to save face this year by just kind of let like, you know, making fun of it and stuff. I thought that was. Yeah, that was. Classic. Yeah, that was nice. And dude, that diss on Call of Duty was pretty good. Yeah, but, it was. Yeah. But yeah, just <clears throat> it, it honestly felt kind of disrespectful to me this year, but I'll leave it. I don't want to speak too much. So, Chris. Yeah, Chris, uh, what, did, what did you think? What are your thoughts here? High level. Yeah, I mean, I, I I really felt the pacing this this year. Like this felt so unbelievably slow. Not that there weren't things uh, every now and again that I was like, oh, that's interesting, or like uh, I got really excited for. I think maybe two things in particular, um, but it just felt like so few and far between those moments where I was just waiting and waiting for the next thing. And and again, it's not to say that there weren't cool things, cool shadow drops. Um, you know, it's it just I think the show itself was just really, really kind of just very rough. Uh, I did not I was not enthralled really for an overwhelming majority of it. And, I, and the the really big moments for me and then granted, that's going to vary from person to person. But I have to imagine the the big moments for most people were probably pretty slim, I would imagine. Yeah, I, uh, I would think so, too. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's my high level thoughts. Yeah, I'm kind of with you guys again, not knowing. And I still don't really know what the vibe is out there amongst like the, the larger community. But and I, I'll be interested to see that afterwards when I can finally like browse Twitter and just chill for a minute. But I wonder if this show is an example of us just not really being able to have it both ways. We, we've remarked in the past that the Game Awards are a very unique product because they try to it or it tries. And Jeff, I think valiantly tries to to do both things, make like an E3 and also have an award show. And really, these are two different things. And I think what we need to maybe appreciate just overall is 
there's just not, unfortunately, a large audience for game award Oscar type things, at least under this format, because there's not a, a level of high respect for people that even vote in these awards. And so we're really tuning in just for the the announcements. And I don't know, you can't really have it both ways, I don't think. Maybe maybe that's just an example of this. I don't know. Because I, I, don't, I don't know if anyone's ever explicitly asked Jeff, and I, I have no problem with this, because is he is he being paid for everything that's being shown? Or is it just mm-hmm. is there is there a delineation between commercials and world premieres or something? Because I just wonder and I don't mean to be rude. I say this as someone who owns an indie studio that uh, whose games deserve to be nowhere near a show like the Game Awards because we make little retro style games or whatever. But I just feel like some of the things being shown, it's like, do we need to have this here? Yeah, do we need to do this now. No offense, but. This is supposed to be like an event and you're showing this. And I just think that there's an imbalance there, too. And I appreciate the, tr- the attempt to kind of try to respect everything, but it just comes off as. Kind of mixed up and, it, and what makes it difficult criticizing the show, I think, difficult for me is I like Jeff and I, right. I do yeah. think he's doing. A good job considering the hand that not, not that he's dealt, but he's kind of creating on the in, in the air, like, you know, building the airplane, as it were. And I just he so he's figuring it out and I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. I totally am. But I yeah. just uh, I agree. It just how can we have a show like this that's better paced, but then has ads room for the ads, but then has room for the award shows, but then it isn't five hours long. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, that, that, yeah. that really was exposed this year. And I, I, are we jaded? Probably a little bit. But I also think a lot of things kind of just look the same and feel the same. And, and as far as Sony is concerned, like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. What is going just, on over there? <laughs> Now, I know people are going to say, and I think this is true, dude, they showed not not only a commercial for Helldivers, but Final Fantasy VII Rebirth was there. Final Fantasy XVI just got this DLC. Spider-Man was nominated for a bunch of different awards. They showed Rise of the Ronin, which is coming soon. And I'm like, yeah, I get it, but you know what I mean. And now I think we're in the space where you know what the fuck I mean. That first party is conspicuously absent that we are getting really close now to the border of not even knowing what is coming out past a few months ahead. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm picturing Dustin, I have a request. John Cusack, 1989 classic film. Say anything. Have you seen it? Do you know? No. It? You don't know the no. film. Say anything. I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. Famous scene in which he holds up the radio right outside the in, window. In the rain. The yeah. I need that to be the, the, the thumbnail John Cusack holding the, the radio, but it's me holding a PlayStation five and then the say anything. Cause it's say anything ellipsis, which I think, and we're going to call the episode say anything because will Sony ever say anything? No, <laughs> ever again. Now that God never of war again. DLC was there. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. So I, I don't, I don't, I know it, it. I guess we feel overall pretty negative and I think that's okay to feel that way. Definitely good games there, but I just, I think it's kind of we got to figure something out and it's he obviously announced the date for next year is maybe he'll be able to even things out. I personally didn't get the fe- it's interesting to get the feedback from both of you about rushing the people off the stage because I guess I just didn't really even realize it because I'm so dis- no offense, totally disinterested and checked out in the awards part where I'm like, I don't care. I don't did even you hear know. Neil was Neil like, oh, oh I, time's going quick. Yeah, like I at that I, point, that's when it felt awkward. I was like, OK, they're aware of how little time they have. Yeah, I texted with them actually briefly to just congratulate him and he he got back to me I, i'm sure he's busy so i don't want to bother him too much but i imagine also he looked like a little different didn't he mm. like a little he's always been slim but i don't know is he becoming more of like a movie writer he has like a different kind of look to him i don't know yeah i don't know it looks good it was a good look i haven't seen him in a few years so all right so let's just get into these things i wrote down what i did was i wrote down kind of I, I numbered them for no real reason. I, I found that there were, as far as I can count, 23 announcements that are ne- that are germane to this show. And then there are a bunch of interstitials, things that were announced by Xbox. We can talk about all those things in order and we can either just touch on them. We can say nothing about them. We can dive deep. I'll leave that up to you guys, but let's take them in order. I did tune into the half an hour beforehand. They kind of, you know, they got me. I was saying you guys aren't sports fans, but Micah and I were saying how it's annoying when a football game, so it's like, oh, it's on at 105, but really the kickoff's at 125. Or 
hockey yeah. games. Oh, it's on seven. Nah, it's really seven thirty. But you're trying to get me early. That's what happened here. It happens every time mm. because then they 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 he gets you in. But there are some little announcements in there or things they showed. I don't know if there was anything in there that you that showed that you guys wanted to talk about. There is one game that I think is worth noting for sure, which is Metaphor Refantasio, yes. which looks awesome. Comes from Studio Zero, which is kind of a, re, as I understand, a reformed piece studio under the Atlas brand. They've been working on this game for years. It was actually revealed in 2016 mm. as Project Refantasy. It's finally coming out in 2024. Probably not a Chris game, but Dustin certainly thinking of you here anything you want to say about this and, and certainly if you guys want to say anything else about the pre-show like brothers the two the tale of two sons or whatever that's being oh, the remake re- re- yeah. remade and all that or re-released so there's a few things to say but yeah that was the only game in there that really stuck out to me and i think that game looks awesome yeah i think it looks awesome too i the only thing this was the same case as that when they showed at the xbox event this summer is that something about the graphics of this game look like a little stinky to me i don't really understand it kind of comes off as a switch game in some ways to me which i don't really understand but i think it'll be awesome i don't know if it's just how they're presenting it seems kind of odd to me but i'm excited for that team to be able to step out of persona and try something completely new and so i will be there no matter what anything you want to add chris about this pre-show before we get get into things uh, no all, I, I i did remark about the fact that they did get me and i was i was already kind of stuck streaming and i was like all right well i guess i guess we're here and i just <laughs> all i all i said was like do we even need pre-shows if they're going to be this like i feel like meta, that metaphor refantasia game would have like why was that not like I, I i get i guess that it's not much more than we got last time but i mean why not show it during the main show in comparison probably to some didn't of the pay enough. you know what i mean yeah, yeah, I guess so. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. According to the Mega uh, Megami Tensei Megami Tensei Wiki, quote: This game takes place in a medieval European-inspired fantasy setting that is considered the mirror to the contemporary backdrop of the real world, and follows a non-silent protagonist who must embark on a journey protect, to protect their kingdom while overcoming numerous obstacles and forging alliances with many companions he meets along the way. Pretty generic write-up. Thanks for that. Yeah. All right. Let's get into the show itself. The first game shown actually, I think, sounds super cool. I, it, it could potentially be the coolest game that was actually shown the entire night, which is a shame considering it was shown first. But it's this game Exodus. Matthew McConaughey, who doesn't love Matthew McConaughey, came out on stage. Really, I just I don't know, man. I just love him. There's just something hypnotic about his vibe to me. And mm. I even love that he. He, he it kind of has embraced and even invoked tonight Interstellar, which is arguably my favorite movie ever. And this feels a lot like it. So we don't quite know the nature of what he's playing. But basically this game and I, I'm at the if people want to check it out, ExodusGame.com is the website, the official website for it. There's a shit ton of stuff on this website for it. So I think if you really want to get into what it's all about, you can watch videos, screenshots. There's like all sorts of things to, to find. But it says having fled a dying earth. Humanity has found a new home in a hostile galaxy. Here we are the underdogs fighting our final battle for survival. You are the traveler, humanity's last hope. And then it says here, 40,000 years ago, humanity was forced to abandon a dying earth. Taking to the stars and massive arc ships, we found a habitable galaxy in Centauri. Here we are the underdogs struggling for survival in a cold and hostile galaxy, teetering on the edge of extinction. Our only hope for salvation lies with the travelers, brave heroes and explorers descended from the early colonists on those first ships that left Earth long ago. And so there's a whole timeline on the website and stuff. And I don't know, it sounds pretty cool to me. Comes from a studio in Texas called Archetype Entertainment. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Wizards of the Coast is. Yeah, Wizards of the Coast is publishing this game, which is pretty interesting. So mm-hmm. any thoughts on this, Dustin? Let's go to you first. Time travel, time dilation, third person shooter. Matthew McConaughey somewhere in there. Looks pretty expensive, and uh, maybe the again maybe the most interesting thing they showed tonight. Yeah, so I'm trying to get the details together here, but the studio head James Olin, he used to be at Bioware and was the lead designer and creative director of Old Republic, uh, Dragon Age Origins, um, Neverwinter Nights, Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate Two. So. There's definitely some royalty going on here in terms of RPG status. And uh, yeah, immediately, I mean, I think Jeff mentioned this, that clearly a lot of Mass Effect vibes from this one. 
the I'm intrigued by the the story. I got to say the art direction didn't really strike me as being anything too unique. It kind of had a bit of a bland sci fi feel, but I could be in for the story and the the gameplay regardless. But yeah, I love Matthew McConaughey with the all right, all right, all right. You know, all right, all right, your all boy's right. there. So, yeah, pretty cool. OK, hmm. Chris, anything to say about this game? Exodus from Archetype Entertainment. Yeah, I, I, this one didn't really hit for me at all really like i i i'm not i don't dislike matthew mcconaughey but i don't particularly care either one he's just a guy to me and like i i felt like they were really trying hard to have like another your breathtaking moment with him for some reason like it really stuck out to me where he's like they i was gonna say my i was gonna say all right all right all right but they told me to say pew 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 <laughs> and i was like okay and then they showed the like, game. Is that and it a was Kevin like Kevin Butler joke. I have no something? fucking idea. I, don't know. I have no oh, he's idea. Not that but deep in it. No. Yeah. So, so some of the jokes are were. I don't know. Some of them. It's weird. Like some of the jokes actually hit for me, but then the other ones were just like completely like, what the fuck? Are you, what is going on? But yeah, I, I mean, visually speaking, I feel like it looked fine. Like I'm. In, I like time dilation as a concept for like storytelling, but I just it, it, I, I'm more like, what does that concept do for a game? And and like, what is that? Like, are they going to play with that as a, as a mechanic in some way? And, and how would that how would that work if they are going to do that? They didn't show it. It seems like it's going to be more of a narrative beat, in which case. Cool. But I mean, Interstellar kind of already exists. You yeah, know, I do. The, I do. I don't know. It, it definitely has an Interstellar vibe where. Well, I don't want to spoil the film, but. The, just the idea of there being massive consequences based on imminent action that you're experiencing relative time just radically different from those in other places and i love the idea of these guys having to basically sacrifice their lives and just really not being able to ever go back and all of the rest and watching things kind of flash by them it's pretty cool uh, i'll be interested to hear more about this but it, it could it be generic i don't know wizards of the coast a little bit of money behind them so that's cool always down for a third person shooter We'll continue to keep an eye on this. I have no idea when it comes out. ExodusGame.com if you want to check it out. All right. So the second thing they showed was God of War Ragnarok Valhalla DLC. So probably three different times tonight, I saw the PlayStation logo pop up with the PlayStation Studios. And I was like, all right, let's go. Yeah. And then so this was the first time I was left a little disappointed, but there's nothing to be disappointed with here. There is a piece of interesting news, which is that God of War Ragnarok, according to PlayStation blog, an official outlet, has surpassed 15 million copies sold, which is substantial so good for them that's awesome and congratulations so there's free dlc coming december 12th to god of war ragnarok it's called valhalla and it says on the blog quote god of war ragnarok valhalla will be an epilogue to the events of god of war ragnarok that follows kratos on a deeply personal and reflective journey set after the decisive battle against odin and atreus's departure kratos has seen a path for himself that has never he has never thought possible brought to the mysterious shores of valhalla accompanied only by me my Bamir. Kratos will enter its unknown depths to overcome trials within himself and face echoes of the past, end quote. So it's a roguelite, basically, it seems like. And you are looks like you're going to play through these cycles of biomes, I guess, over and over again and try to get stronger and stronger. I really have no idea anything more about it than that. And it seems like pretty cool. I mean, it's free. Can't complain about that. I just wonder if is this it? Because I hope so. And I have a <laughs> sneaking suspicion that it's not it that. A game that sold 15 million copies, they're probably like, mm, maybe we can go back. I'd be curious how many of those copies were on PS4. I'd be curious to know if they would do DLC similar to Horizon where they wouldn't go back to PS4. So how many people actually bought it on PS5? Is it worth going to them? But nonetheless, free DLC available to you December 12th. Dustin, are you going to play it? No, no, I'm good. I The thing about roguelikes right now, it seems like that's kind of a way for developers to add a mode to their game where they don't have to make any new well not saying this doesn't have new assets but they can rely on a lot of established assets it's cool i think it makes a lot more sense for other games for example when hitman added the roguelike mode that's game such a, a sandbox style game with so many different weapons and locations and stuff that i don't really understand how they're gonna do that with god of war i mean i guess you can have some different weapons coming in and out and maybe abilities but i don't really get it I, I mean that's actually kind of intriguing to me to some degree so i'm curious what people will say about it but it's not what i'm looking for from a god of war update but if you are i mean like you said it's free you can't complain about it but not something that tickles my fancy i guess 
Chris, are you going to get into the God of War Ragnarok Valhalla DLC December 12th? <sighs> I guess I want to. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't want to sound so defeated, but like, it's just, it's just, it's cool. Like, it's cool. Like, it's good that like the game's getting free content. It reminds me a little bit of what Sucker Punch did with um, Ghost of Tsushima with the, with the free um, multiplayer kind of side stuff with that. There's arguably a little bit more to that than this, but I mean, you know, roguelikes are big. I, uh, I, I guess it, I, I'm kind of with Dustin where like, I don't really, I'm not really that interested in going back to it, but I am somewhat curious because I just don't understand how God of War really fits into this mold because it's not really a, it's not really a, a game where you equip different things or use it, it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious about that, I guess. So I, I might dive in just to see, just to see what it's about, but uh, I'm not excited about it. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just curious, you know. All right, third up, we hear from <laughs> developer House House that did obviously the old game Push Me Pull You, but of course, more famously entitled Goose Game, are mm-hmm. uh, reuniting with the publisher Panic to create and release the game Big Walk. It's unclear if this is even coming to PlayStation because it's only coming to PC in 2025, but it does look interesting. I don't know if you guys have anything you want to say about it. Um, my suspicion is that it'll be announced for console before it comes out, which is why I included it. Any, anything you want to say here? It doesn't sound particularly exciting to me because I'm yeah. reading the press release and it says about Big Walk, quote, Big Walk is a cooperative multiplayer adventure about teamwork and talking, end quote. It's like, oh my goodness. Yeah, Work? I don't know. <laughs> you know, it, I, I it's fun. It's funny that a game like this was showcased and shown today because it's it's really hitting me at a point where you know I'm I'm coming fresh off of Lethal Company, which is a co op horror experience. We just we just talked about it on the show, but I don't know if if there's proximity voice and there's sandbox stuff going on, like maybe I could see it being interesting. But I just don't I don't really know what the hell is going on in this in this game. It looks kind of unique and interesting. There is like. I got bug snacks vibes from it in some way. Uh, not exactly, but in the in the off kilter kind of like the, the weird first person view model and and mm-hmm. and the uh, the the weird looking characters. The characters look like patapons um, to me. Yeah, a little bit. dude. When it's silhouetted, that one shot. Yeah, I thought it the looks, same thing. Yeah. So I I don't know. I it, neat. You know, I have to know more about it. Set out with your friends through a wide open world full of challenges, puzzles, and discoveries. You'll need to work together to find your way around, stay in contact using an assortment of tools and toys, and figure out new ways to communicate when you suddenly find yourself speechless. I mean, you got to believe in them. They know what they're doing. This is one of those games, though. I appreciate it. There almost seems to be, there are so many indie games, like bigger indie games, more expensive indie games, where it almost seems like, obviously, there's something special and good about them, but. It's almost about who you know and and your and your history and how you can kind of get pushed by powers that be to be in prolific places like this. Because yeah. this is a peculiar game, in my opinion, a peculiar game to, to show during it. All right, so there's that. Let's see what's next. Oh, all right. So at this point, not uh, PlayStation related, but they showed Senua's Sacrifice, the second. What is it? Uh, why do I want to call it Hell Divers? That's not what it's called. Hellblade. 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 And this is obviously an Xbox exclusive. This game looks beautiful. I have to say. Yeah. The musical performance was super cool. I like performance art like that a lot and stagecraft like that. I think it's pretty cool. There is something, though, about this game. I want to know if you guys tuned into this. They will not show combat for more than a half a second without interrupting it. They just won't show it like they they showed a bunch of shots, but you can tell there's something. Maybe clunky or something weird about it. Did you guys notice that they just wouldn't stop moving, moving to the next shot? It's like just show combat for I dare you to show it for one point five seconds before you yeah. before you cut so i thought that was pretty interesting because i know a lot of people have wanted to see it but man is it beautiful i mean it looks look totally awesome i'm just curious to see what is the game why are you so hesitant to show the combat in yeah. a meaningful way did you guys get that vibe or am i crazy yeah oh absolutely i was thinking that i'm just at the point where this they just keep showing this game over and over and over and i guess you have a clear picture of what it's probably going to be like from the first game which is cool and i thought the first game was awesome so i'll definitely i'm going to play this but you're right in that i feel like this game needs a style of trailer that's kind of like when god of war was re-revealed where they just showed someone playing the game for a few minutes like an action-packed sequence and yeah it's just 
yeah, the way they keep showing it is always like bits and pieces instead of I don't know. They're not the only game guilty of this. I'm just like, man, we've seen this game so many times. Yeah, Enough. I I'm I'm just glad there was combat in it at all <laughs> because <laughs> the last time we saw it, it was just walking around and, and staring into a puddle. So, yeah, I mean, it was edited in in, in a way that was kind of annoying because it would, I would have liked to see more of an uninter- uninterrupted break. But at the same time, knowing what I know about the previous Hellblade and how that combat was, you know, it, it was entirely serviceable. It, it, I feel like it can really only be improved. And so I'm not really that worried about it now that I've seen it. it the thing about it, though, is like it. I couldn't tell what was, and this might be a complete compliment to the game. I really have no idea, but I, every time it showed combat, I was like, is that a cutscene? Mm-hmm. Like, is there something that, on the screen? You know I mean? like yeah. You, there's like a button prompt. Do you guys see like that appears when there's like a sword fight going on? Right. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. It's, I mean, that's a compliment to the game, really, if I can't really tell. Because it, oh, it, it, the gorgeous. animations it's totally gorgeous. The animations look fluid, and, and the, the facial animations look amazing. It's a beautiful game, like, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, and I'm glad that it finally actually got a, a year, although I was expecting a date by now. Like, the first, thing I, the first thing I thought when Hellblade came up, I was like, this, you better not be showing this game again without a date. Like, you better not be doing this. <laughs> and, they, and they did it, but it, at yeah. least it's narrowed down to a year. Um, I imagine fall. Um, but, yeah, I mean... It's gorgeous, no doubt. So I'm curious about it. All right. Fourth up as far as new games for our platforms here on the show, Kamuri from Unseen, which is the studio from Akumi Nakamura, who was previously at Tango Gameworks and was the first of two creative directors for Ghostwire Tokyo. Mm -hmm. This game looks really cute. And I have to say... It looks like Hi-Fi Rush, kind of. I mean, there's like a, definitely like this vibe to it where I'm like, okay, well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's not quite the same, but there's some sort of lineage there, maybe. And uh, Platforms Unknown, I went to the trailer and I couldn't figure out if they had announced anything. Oh, there's actually a press release up. So let me see here. I didn't see this. This just went up. There, let's see. Kamuri summons you into a realm where the unpredictable meets the extraordinary in an urban jungle where mysterious creatures, yokai, hide amongst the population. Become a yokai hunter and use your fox window to unravel the mysteries of the city and bring balance to the world. Dive into a thrilling adventure alone or with friends. Hunt yokai in style, collect their powers, and face even greater challenges. So. That's kind of a combo of Hi Fi Rush and Ghostwire. <laughs> and Ghostwire. In I was thinking the same thing. Is that interesting? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of new. Funny, That's kind of cool. That's actually a really. I mean. That's a great idea, I think. I think the 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 CG trailer that they showed, it's a CG trailer, so you know, no game, no hype. Those is the rules, as my friend Lyle says. Mm-hmm. But um but it I mean the vision of it is cool at, at the very least. And I like I like that that what's her name? Is he uh, uh it is sorry, hold on a I second. Forgot, I forgot her name. I I love that list. It is uh, Ikumi, Ikumi Nakamura. Ikumi, Ikumi Nakamura. Yeah. I, I I like her energy a lot. And I like I like it was nice to see her on stage again. Yeah, I feel like it, it is cute. I didn't really know what she was saying, unfortunately. Like, I, I, not to be rude, it's. There, I think there needs to be a delineation of like who needs a translator and who doesn't, and and maybe working that out because I like couldn't really understand. And I appreciated people were just cheering her on, basically. But I'm like, I don't think any of you really understood what she just said, did you? Because I didn't. No, yeah, I didn't. Anything. I didn't really. <laughs> I don't remember, honestly. Yeah, you're just totally out of it. Look at you. All right, so you can go to KamuriWorld.com. That's K-E-M-U-R-I World.com. There's a trailer there. There's information there. They already have a storefront as well. No platforms yet, but presumably will be on PlayStation. Yeah. All right. I would imagine. Fifth up is the return of Moon Studios. Mm. They obviously are responsible for the Ori games on Xbox. One of them or both of them came to Switch. They're also available, obviously, on PC. So... The original Ori, it's funny, came back back. I remember out around the time I started it kind of funny. And it says here, March 11th, 311 day, 2015. The new game is called No Rest for the Wicked. And yeah. actually, the write-up is on Xbox Wire, but it is a multi-platform game that will also be on PlayStation 5. It's described as an ARPG, and it looks pretty cool. They say, quote unquote, it's highly ambitious. And I don't know, There's a there's a thing about kind of the sameness of everything after a while in terms of its aesthetic i don't know if this is falling into that trap or not but i'll play it probably when it comes out no more information on release window i don't think and there's going to be a so-called wicked inside digital showcase they weren't really very clear about that i don't know if you guys noticed that in the in the end slate 
they were like more information wicked inside. It's like, what are you talking about? And then Jeff said at the end, it was like, oh, there'll be more information at a showcase called Wicked Inside March 1st, 2024. It's like, OK, so I guess we'll learn more into a, a, about a deep dive at that point into the game. Any interest in in this? Any Ori fans? A lot of Ori fans out in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this was one of the ones that I was actually kind of uh, more I like, oh, OK, because uh Obviously, Ori is such a different game than than what they're trying to do here. I actually, I actually kind of like the style of it. Although, like the gameplay, it's the gameplay itself looks like a lot of things that I've seen before. But the the visual style kind of reminded me of um, Overlord. If you remember that game from back in like like two, that was like two thousand eight or something. Yeah, I do. Um, I think I remember like that. Like this weird like. kind of somewhat cartoony style, but it wasn't wasn't Fortnite exactly. It was I don't yeah. know. I, it, it looked I remember this. it looked cool to me. Uh, I I like Moon Studios a lot. I think they make really beautiful games and. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's on my radar. I'm glad they showed gameplay. That was nice. <laughs> Overlord nice to came to Xbox 360 2007, came to the PS3 in 2008 as mm. Overlord Raising Hell. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that's that. What, that's what it was called. Yeah, looks good. Any any thoughts here, Dustin, about, about uh, Moon Studios? No rest for the wicked. It's interesting that they are breaking away from Microsoft um, just because those other two games, while they did get Switch releases, um, you know, they had a thing going. But, uh, you know, this looks awesome. It kind of reminded me a little bit in the direction. I don't want to say it looked like Trine, but that's what I thought of initially when I saw it. I was like, oh, it's kind of like a fantasy kind of uh, colorful hmm. yeah. aesthetic kind of How cartoony. have there been so many Trine games? Has anyone stopped and asked that? I don't know. I guess people are buying them. Man. I mean, there's, really, a lot of, there's a lot of trine heads out there, man. Yeah. <laughs> Triners. <laughs> it almost sounds like a, a racial slur. Like you really shouldn't say that. It does. Oh. Yeah. I, I feel bad about saying it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number six. This is uh, something that I think the, the Lord Cognito is especially going to be excited about the announcement of five new Sega games. This was pretty cool. I was watching this trailer and I was confused. I'm like, wait a minute, is that Jet Set Radio? And then I saw it as like, wait, Crazy Taxi? And Shinobi? Yeah. You started to be able to identify them. So the press release released by publisher slash developer Sega says, quote, tonight at the Game Awards 2023, one of the largest annual video game industry events in the world, Sega of America unveiled an initiative to produce brand new titles from the publisher's treasure trove of beloved IP. New games are currently in development for five of the company's legacy franchises, Crazy Taxi, Golden Axe, Jet Set Radio, Shinobi, and Streets of Rage all reimagined for modern audiences. And then there's a quote from uh, COO of Sega Corporation and CEO of Sega of America, Shuji Utsumi. He says, quote, in recent years, Sonic the Hedgehog has forged new paths for Sega, bringing the franchise to life and reaching new audiences in ways we had only dreamed of in the past. Building off that success, we are digging into our legacy and reimagining several franchises to bring these games to more audiences around the globe. Today's announcement is just the start of our initiative. First and foremost, our ambition will be to create great games with memorable characters and worlds. We hope fans of all ages will look forward to our future with anticipation as we release these projects in coming years. So here's how they describe it. Crazy Taxi Franchise, a wacky high octane driving adventure series where players must weave through traffic in an open play environment to deliver passengers to their destination before time runs out. Chris, say it. Say it. Take me to Raytheon. Thank you. I appreciate it. Golden, Golden Axe Franchise. A hack and slash style series with closed melee combat set in a fantasy world of beasts, swords, and magic. Jet Set Radio franchise. This franchise combines action packed traversal around vibrant Tokyo Toe with skating, self expression through graffiti, street culture, and rebellious themes. <laughs> rebellious themes. <laughs> Shinobi franchise, a series that utilizes ninja shur shuriken. I can never say that word. How do you say it? Shur shuriken? Sh shuriken? Shuriken? Ninja ninjutsu. And it's again with ninj ninjutsu because I always say ninjutsu, but it's ninjutsu. Special attacks and more to defeat enemies in a mix of side-scrolling action and challenging environments. And finally, Streets of Rage, a beat-em-up style series that pairs fast-paced fist fighting with fresh music set in a lawless urban environment. Nextlevel.sega.com. You can check all of the stuff out there. You guys know what I want. Keep going. Make that new fantasy star. Let's get it going. But dude, Crazy Taxi? Yeah, this this was the moment where I was like, oh, this, this was the first like yell a little bit moment mm. of the of the show for me where i was like oh my god shit Not too I, mean, much. I knew i knew i knew jet set radio was coming uh like i think that was kind of that's like a, that was like a bit of an open open secret but it was nice to see the second i saw the taxi i was like what <laughs> really <laughs> that's so sick take me uh, to pizza Hut. <laughs> oh man take me to epstein's island Take I think <laughs> I think uh i'm just really curious about like what the vibe of it's going to be because it, like crazy taxi is so specific in its I don't know. Like uh, when I think of Crazy Taxi, I specifically think of like 
punk rock, you know, like I, w- I wonder what the aesthetic from a sound design perspective is going to be for like a modern crazy taxi or if they're going to go retro with it, if they're going to go modern with it, like curious. I don't know. You got to have all I want. Definitely. Right. Ah, yeah, 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 you got to yeah. have it. You like you got to yeah. go and buy like whatever it costs. You got to go license that. But yeah. yeah, they have an opportunity to do something really cool here. And I happen to like Jet Set Radio is probably the weakest of the bunch, although you know, Dreamcast, especially with Crazy Taxi 2, there's something very special about those games and there's a special feel about them. But this is a pretty powerful group. Golden Axe is dope. Streets of Rage is dope. Just uh, oh, what, what is missing here? No altered beast. Thank God. They knew, they were like, <laughs> we're going to leave that one in the trash. Yeah. But next, I want to see fa- I want to see Fantasy Star 5. Can we see Fantasy? Dustin, can we see Fantasy Star 5? Are we going to see it? Well, yeah, they Dustin. did Fantasy Star Online 2. So it's still kind of alive in some way, but not in the way you want. But yeah, it's I'd been be a long time. That. It's been 30 years at this point, yeah. I think. Almost. All right. Look forward to that. It sounds like it's going to be the next couple of years or a few years these will roll out. All right. Yeah. The next game up, I don't know if you care. Dragon Ball Sparking Zero. According to the press release, it's the new Earth-shaking sequel bringing the Budokai Tenkaichi, Tenkaichi series to a new generation. Mm. Shake the Earth, Break the Heavens, and the latest Dragon Ball game bringing back the beloved Arena Brawler series after more than 15 years. Chris, I was thinking of you here. I know that you were into some of the DBZ games. Were you a you were a Budokai right person, right? Yeah, so man. Are you interested in this? Did this strike anything for you? Did did seeing Frieza's weird looking face <laughs> do it for you? Yeah, man. I, I don't know. I'm excited. I, I love I loved the Budokai games. I loved Tenkaichi. Uh, I gotta say though, this is super fucking. This is super petty of me, and I understand how dumb what I'm about to say is. But I was really excited at the beginning when the, 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 the first things you see in that trailer are something like Budokai Tenkaichi, the next Budokai Tenkaichi. And then it shows the trailer and it's like, oh, and I was like, oh, yes, I'm so excited. It looks great. And then it's called Dragon Ball Z Sparking Zero. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I hate that name so much. Like, I don't like I know that Budokai was called Sparking in Japan, but it's. I, if we're going to unify the names, we should have picked we should have picked a better name. Yeah. Like. Go back to Budokai. I think that would have just been a lot more interesting, but that's just the name. Uh, if, you know, if Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards was called LOL Nazis, it would still be a great movie. Right, but fair enough. Uh, there's something in the name, but I'm excited about it for sure. Dustin, anything for you here? Dragon Ball Sparking Zero. It's amazing. They keep making more Dragon Ball games, but there's not a lot of new Dragon Ball content that I'm aware of unless they're adding uh dragon ball super stuff which oh yeah be- they're definitely they're definitely yeah. because there's super saiyan god in there and there's beerus and all sorts of shit yeah i this looks like it i'm looking at the trailer now and it looks like it's more of the 3d fighter space um and yeah so, yeah like, like budokai one and two were much more i mean they weren't <laughs> Budokai Budokai 1 through 3 were uh there were 3D fighters but they were 3D in the same way that Tekken was where right. it was on a 2D plane always you could kind of shift forward and back but it was ultimately like the same Budokai Tenkaichi 1 through 3 and I think there's a fourth one maybe not maybe I I could maybe that's like a brain maybe that was like one of those those old photoshops that I was convinced was real for some reason but mm. Budokai Tenkaichi 1 through 3 were more like the Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm games where it was like more yeah. 3D and kind of um open combat you could like run around and walk so it's that style which i'm I, i'm partial to budokai personally but i like tenkaichi yeah, as well same. and just having a new tenkaichi if it's if it plays even identically to the way it used to and just slightly more refined i think i'd be very happy it's been it's been a it's been a long enough time where like it's it, it'd be cool to have another dragon ball game like this because we really haven't had one in a long time all right Let's see here. What else is there? Uh, Number eight would be the casting of Frank Stone. This was the super massive game in the Dead by Daylight series, single player kind of addition to it. This was leaked a little bit before the show. So we knew this was coming, although we didn't talk about it during the other part of the recording because I knew it was going to be announced here. So what the the hell was the point? So super massive games, the guys that did Until Dawn and... They ported Killzone 1 to PS3 back in the day, if you remember. But of course, more recently, they did The Quarry, which was okay. And they do the, the Bandai Namco, which is a Dark Pictures anthology game. So they're just really kind of pigeonholed into this horror place at this point, which is totally fine. 
They've announced this casting of Frank Stone, quote, a heart-pounding narrative game set in the world of hit horror multiplayer Dead by Daylight. Developed by Supermassive Games, the casting of Frank Stone showcases the acclaimed studio's passion and expertise in crafting unforgettable cinematic adventures. Players will delve into a, gr- delve into a gruesome mystery where every decision matters, shaping the story and its outcome. Offering an unprecedented look at the wider world of Dead by Daylight, prepare to experience an original story that will appeal to both fans of the acclaimed horror franchises, franchise and newcomers alike. 2024 on PlayStation 5. Of course, Dead by Daylight came to PS4 in 2017 and to PS5 at launch in 2020 from Behavior Interactive, the developers behind my beloved Naughty Bear, of course. Any interest here? It seems like Supermassive is just making the same game, and I'm not saying the same, literally same game, but the same type of game for just now. It seems like four benefactors at least because they made Until Dawn for Sony, and then they did The Quarry for Take-Two, which was originally for Google, as we reported here on the show first, until that story was stolen by Axios. And then, of course, they did the Dark Pictures Anthology with Bandai Namco. Now they're doing this with Behavior. So it's all this choice-based horror. I don't particularly think that The Quarry was very good, personally. But I also didn't play the Dark Pictures Anthology. I know it's been unbalanced. I really do want to play that one eventually in the Iraq War, because I think that sounds really creepy. But any interest here, Dustin, in Behavior Interactive's the casting of Frank, uh, the casting of Frank Stone from Super. Non, but non particular, mainly in that I feel burned by the quarry and how lackluster it was for a seventy dollar game. Like it's not often that I feel like I truly wasted money on a game, and that was one where I just felt so unsatisfied, and even some of the technical qualities too. So right now, Supermassive isn't exactly in a favorable spot for me. I'm sure, this is. Probably really exciting for Dead by Daylight fans, but that doesn't do anything for me. And you're right. They kind of are just making the same type of game over and over. But it seems like they kind of peaked with the first one. Uh, I played one of the Dark Picture Anthology games and it was fine. But yeah, Until Dawn was the peak for me. Chris, any interest in this game? This seems like I'll be very curious to see. This reminds me a little bit of um, Callisto Protocol. In, yeah. in trying to create something single player from a fundamentally multiplayer game to try to get people interested. And they're doing that at League of Legends as well to great effect, actually. So I'm not saying it doesn't work. But what do you think? Yeah, this I mean, it didn't speak to me. I think I was I was I was watching. This was one of those trailers where I was watching it and then the title came up and I forgot what I had even just seen. Like my eyes were just glazed over the whole time. It just did not. I don't know. Nothing. Nothing caught my eye at all about it. Um I'm kind of with you guys where like I kind of I'm somebody who actually like kind of liked the quarry probably because it's I like I was familiar with a lot of the actors in it in a way that like kind of made me appreciate a little more. I was like, oh, cool. I like like the fact that Ted Raimi is in there is so weird and I appreciated it a lot. And but it was still ultimately just fine. Uh, I was never that big of a fan of Until Dawn either. And so the Dark Pictures anthology never really spoke to me. So there's really nothing for me here. I'm sure this is probably a big deal for people who played it by daylight, but not speaking to me. All right. Next up here, Visions of Mana, a new game in the so-called Mana or Second Densetsu series, depending on where you are in the world. Of course, beginning with Final Fantasy Adventure or Final Fantasy Gaiden. If you're in Japan in 1991, Game Boy game. But of course, maybe most famously Secret of Mana in 93 slash 94 in the West. Famous Super Nintendo role playing game. We got Trials of Mana in 95, Legend of Mana late in the PS1 era, Sword of Mana bunch of mana games most recently a bunch of remakes adventure of mana remake trials of mana remake secret of mana remake so visions of mana is here there was echoes of mana too i don't know what the fuck that even was what was that echoes of mana released on android and ios developed by okay free to play game no so visions of mana quote today at the game Awards, square enix revealed a brand new entry in the beloved mana series this is from the press release visions of mana the first mainline installment in more than 15 years. Visions of Mana will return to the series' action RPG roots and take players on a new adventure with protagonist Val, a soul guard assigned to protect his childhood friend who has been chosen by the fairy as the Alm of Fire to travel to the Tree of Mana and rejuvenate the Mana Flow. Comes to PlayStation 5 and PlayStation 4, etc. in 2024. There's a trailer up now. Chris, I'm sure you're not interested in this. Dustin, any interest in Visions of Mana? I've not played any of the Mana games, really. I think this, though, it looks appealing to some degree, but at the same time, I think of how Square has treated some of these other IPs that are in their wheelhouse. For example, whether it's um, the Valkyrie Elysium game that looked really cool and was okay, but 
clearly needed more budget behind it. And then also more recently, the uh, Adventures of Die Infinity Strash. Infinity also, Strash. Yeah, just a budget <laughs> title that clearly didn't. I don't really know what its purpose is other than just trying to sucker in like uh, Dragon Quest fans. And, you know, it didn't review very well. And so I wonder, is this game kind of be in that same boat where they have their highest echelon with Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy and stuff like that? And then these smaller IP that kind of like, what are you what are you doing here? Do you care about this or do you not? Uh, this looks good, but we'll have to see how Square actually treats it. There's a PS1 action RPG that came out in the West very late in the PS1's era, in the PS1 era, right before PS2 in the summer of 2000 called Threads of Fate that was published by Squaresoft. I don't know if Oh, people... that game rules. Yeah, yeah. so I, when I, when this was happening and I saw the Square Enix logo, for some reason, I was like, is this Threads of Fate? For like a, 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 a little while. And I wonder if anyone else got that vibe just from the, there's a lot of oranges and reds on the cover of Threads of Fate the hair of the character and all the rest and i was like holy shit are they remaking threads of and i was like totally wrong by the time you saw the stupid mana tree and all the rest you're like all right i guess i was i was off there but i wonder if anyone else got that vibe out there so yeah that will come out 2024 ps4 slash ps5 number 10 would be rise of the ronin this of course was announced in the late fall or late summer rather early fall of 2022 and we've seen a little bit of it since it's a second party playstation exclusive I think it's also actually coming to no, it's only it's not coming to PC. It only be coming to PlayStation Five. Koei Tecmo's fully owned developer Team Ninja is making this game, and it comes out March twenty second, two thousand twenty four. Pre orders begin December fourteenth. Just I look at this game and I don't know what Team Ninja we're getting here because is it is it or isn't it a Soulsborne game? Is it an action RPG like Ninja Gaiden, or is it like Neo? I, it's it's unclear to me. I couldn't actually really tell. And also, and maybe this is the jadedness. How many of these same kinds of games are we going to get? It just <laughs> seems like the. It seems like it's just the same fucking thing, over and yeah. over and over and over and over again in the genre. I don't get. I I personally don't get it. It's it, how <laughs> there's like yeah. five or six studios making the same game. Yeah, it is. It's it's weird. I I was actually looking forward to Rise of the Ronin, but this trailer kind of moved the needle back for me in some way. Like it looks a lot clunkier than i think it did the first time we saw it. it 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 doesn't i don't really get it i'm not really sure what the fuck's going on um i i mean we'll see you know i, I don't know i, I don't i don't want to assume it's going to be bad or anything this didn't look outrageously horrible or, or even it didn't even really look bad necessarily i just kind of don't know what it looked a lot more striking the first time i saw it with like the gun going off in the in the in the middle of that animation and, and like the flying thing the flying thing was in this trailer too and it looked i don't know like not as interesting i don't know i i i feel whiplashed on this in some way but i i get that koei tecmo is a big thing with koei tecmo with omega force and some team ninja stuff and whatever a lot of it is historical fiction especially based in eastern yeah. asian cultures but it just seems like there's so many Soulsborne games from these specific developers that all just you can kind of just, oh, here's Wukong, here's Neo, here's f fucking Sekiro, here's Demon Souls. here, And I'm like, they're all kind of just Demon Souls. Uh, yeah, maybe De Dark Souls, Demon Souls will be a little different because that's more fantasy. But there's mm -hmm. more. They, it just seems like there's a lot of this rote. Can we can we get a different? And maybe I'm asking the wrong publisher and wrong developer. Again, a very deeply Japanese developer, but having something set in the Toka, Tokugawa Shogun or whatever, I'm like, wasn't that Neo? I, yeah. I just, I'm pretty sure it was, Neo was set in some. I don't know, man. It just seems like they're asking, being asked to make, make the same game over and over again, and people are, are lapping it up. I'm sure it's going to be great. It's, it's not a game I'm going to play. I don't think. But uh, Dustin, are you interested yeah. in it? Well, I think the thing that makes this at least stand out somewhat from Neo and Neo 2 is just that uh, they had that other game that came out um, this past year too that was also on Xbox uh, but I can't remember what it's called but the it, it shows off really highly in this trailer or really obviously that it's open world like there's the part where he's gliding around and you can kind of see the town there's a part where the main character is riding on a horse so that's what I assume is going to probably be the big evolution but it's a good question is this going to be more of a souls like game in the vein of neo uh that takes a more open world approach 
or is it you know more of an, an action focused kind of like ninja guidance something like that it's it's becoming the the term souls born to me is a major turnoff and i'm wondering if people are using it way too flippantly at this point for instance that there was that really cool 2d or 2.5d game it was like a Castlevania like game that just came out. I can't remember at the last something or whatever that people were recommending to me, but it's being described as a Soulsborne. I'm like, that's I don't want to play it. If it's being described that way, I don't want these brutally hard, obnoxious games. It's just not fun to me. I think this is a, a this needs to this genre needs to be tightened up in terms of what it means. Cause it's like Metroidvania, but calling I don't know, Super Mario World a Metroidvania because you can go back and get things in different stages like that's not really the essence of metroidvania there's there's more to it than that i don't know so it's yeah. precluding me from playing games i guess is one of the the, lot, the last faith i think is the game i'm talking about mm. by the way mm. all right sorry i was typing i was uh looking something up the outlast trials we've shown anyone any interest in this red barrels any no who's scary yeah. xbox's <laughs> Kojima game that's been long rumored that's some sort of movie game hybrid OD was shown Jordan Peele was there but he was I don't think it was intentional but it, it was a little disrespectful because he was like it's not only Jordan Peele it's like we're working with so many others too and it's like well he's standing on stage next to you so maybe show a little bit more respect but um, yeah I don't know anything to say here it's it's cool that that he's working with Xbox I don't know I'm not totally convinced that this is a game game though and I think it's going to be some sort of experience. Yeah. And this has been rumored for several years. So, yeah, I, I, so I don't cool know. Yeah, I don't know what it, what this entails, but Kojima and Jordan Peele working together is pretty fucking cool. Like that, that conceptually is really interesting. Um, I, we know so little about it, but I'm I mean, I'm I'm in I'm curious about whatever the hell it is. I just it's so early now and. Uh, it's really more of a promising concept than it is a exciting trailer, you know, or or an exciting showcase. Uh, but yeah, it should be interesting. Okay, I have a conspiracy yeah. about this. Oh yeah. Um, so Xbox is always putting Game Pass at the end of anything that they publish, and also the platform if they put Xbox Series X and S. This didn't have that. Uh, I'm not saying that it's going to be a multi-platform. I just noticed that Xbox always puts that at the end of their stuff that is Game Pass. They're it's always interesting you to... noticed that there. Did you notice that somewhere else as well in here? In a much more conspicuous place, in my opinion. Well, we'll oh. get there, I guess. Okay. Number 11 on my list would be Jurassic Park. This is uh, Jurassic Park Survival for PlayStation 5 from Saber Interactive. It says, quote, tonight at Game Awards, Saber Interactive in partnership with Universal Games and Digital Platforms announced a new video game, 65 million years in the making, Jurassic Park Survival, in development and to be published by Saber. Uh, single player action adventure game in the immersive experience Jurassic Park fan is the immersive experience Jurassic Park fans have been waiting for and have always dreamed of. Players will return to a fully realized, uh, what is it, Isla Nublar? Is that how you say it? Filled with living dinosaurs and be part of an all new story set the day after the events of the beloved 1993 Jurassic Park film. From Universal Pictures and Amblin Entertainment. I don't know. I, I, I was saying to Micah, we were watching this together. I, I was like, I love the Jurassic Park IP. I think Jurassic Park is a brilliant idea to have this idea of this kind of rogue science entrepreneur who recreates dinosaurs on this island park and it gets out of control. It's super cool. I just don't think we need to go back to it 5,000 times. It, it, it's, yeah. it's ruining it. It's like, it's a great idea. How many times are we going to do this? Same story. It's just I don't know. I feel so. I feel so bitter right now about everything. Yeah. Any thoughts? I kind of felt. That, I, I felt the same in some way where I was just like, "What? This is just the movie again." But you play through like key po points in the movie because that's kind of what it felt like. Where you're like, "Oh, you're outside of the thing, and the T Rex is in the same place that you run into in the movie, and like, oh, she's hiding in the in that storage room, and the, the raptor comes through, and it's like, what? I, I get that's probably just the vibe of just trying to tell them like, hey, you know, welcome back to Jurassic Park, but." Um, and it's not even to say that Jurassic Park is a bad idea for like a survival game. I think that's probably true. I just think Jurassic Park has been the unfortunate, has been on the uh, other side of a big milking campaign. Not necessarily to the degree that Star Wars has or anything like that, but 
we got we got two sequels to Jurassic Park that were just not very good at all. We got that entire sequel trilogy of world movies that weren't very good. And uh, I don't know if this was the first we if this was the first we'd seen of the Jurassic IP in a, in a long time. I feel like I would be a lot more into it, but I'm just kind of soured on it a little bit. Jurassic Park. <laughs> I'm so tired right now. It's like I don't even know if that was that was just funny in my mind. All right. By the way, <laughs> uh, I'm looking at Games Press in a press release for Exodus. That first game we mentioned went up here, and I was just reading it really quick just to see if there was anything in, in there. It is described specifically as an epic sci-fi action adventure RPG. So, nice. okay. Mass Effect. not a huge surprise. Yeah, Mass Effect. Interesting. Right? Yeah. And let's see. Da, 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 nothing else in there. That's that interesting. Okay, so. Next up would be Black Myth Wukong, the game from the Chinese developer Game Science being built in Unreal 5. We knew it was coming to PlayStation 5. We didn't have a date yet. We have a date now, August 20th, 2024. Any interest in this game? This seems like it'll be up both of your alley, I think. But again, this is another example. This one's inspired by the Chinese novel Journey to the West from yeah. 500 years ago or whatever, but. Again, this just seems like another, and I, again, I'm not trying to just be write these things off, but there just seems to be a lane of this stuff. It's almost like Asian inspired souls born. This seems like another one of them. Dustin, are you in yeah. for Black Myth Wukong? This game is in the same boat as Hellblade for me, where I am tired of seeing it for so long. I'm just kind of ready to check it out. It looks fun though it it has kind of a whimsical quality to it that i'm i'm into in that it's still very kind of creepy and scary looking but there's also silly little creatures and i like that too silly kind of mm. like that duality so mm. i'm uh I, this is a, a an unknown team and we have a you know we just had uh liza p which was an unknown team doing a Soulsborne game and it was the first one that wasn't from soft that i actually really liked so maybe it could happen again Mm. all right oh chris anything to add about this i'm like already ready to move on i'm like fuck it no oh, no i mean it looks it looks the production value looks great uh I'll, yeah. but i'm i'm again with with dustin kind of where it's uh, i've seen this so many times i just want to see how it plays they showed kill the justice league any anything to say no. here i i think i don't there was something about how there is going to be single player functionality added to the game after it comes out so it's oh not even going to be fundamentally single player when it launches, it seems like, or at least you won't be able to play it wow. offline. That's what it sounds like. So I am out on that game until that would ever be fixed before I'd ever even consider it. But are you guys interested in Kill the Justice League? It's coming out soon. Isn't it like February 2nd or something like that? Something like uh, that. Yeah. People are they're playing it in beta right now, I think. Yeah. They're I've running heard. out of time. They, they got to they gotta put the, the rest of those episodes of that weird series that they were doing. The, the damage control series. <laughs> the damage. Oh, yeah. The damage control series. So, yeah, I looked it up February 2nd, PlayStation 5. I'll be interested to see how it does. I, I have the feeling that it's going to do fine. I, I don't know that it's going to do Arkham Knight numbers, but I think they'll yeah. be happy with it. And I really don't know what they could have done to it in taking it out, like offline for a, a year to kind of tweak it. Unless they're just trying to you can't re replace systems and stuff at this point. So maybe you can make it seem like it's less of a looter shooter, but I think it's still fundamentally what it's going to be. And I, I don't I get what people are saying. It's like so everyone just has a gun and. Well, yeah, I don't know. It looks a little weak, I guess, but that's just the tiredness talking. There's an interesting one here. This was mentioned in passing, number 13, but I thought this was very, very interesting. I don't know if you guys caught on to this. Um, As Dusk Falls. Oh, yeah. Is coming to PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 March 7th. Now, this is interesting because Xbox published this game. And it was exclusive. It came to Xbox Series X and S and Xbox One and PC back in 2022. Now, Interior Night is the developer and they're self-publishing on PS4 and PS5. But that is strange. And there's a tweet or not a tweet, but I think a, a, an image of a Shinobi, you know, the the insider guy speaking on a forum saying like this will continue. Th this is not the first of these kinds of games that will happen. So. We were talking either either after this or before this. I have no idea. Somewhere in the show, we were talking about how maybe there'll be an a la carte approach it to kind of poke and prod to see if you can get some X smaller Xbox games onto other devices. And this starts here. I don't I don't know. Or maybe this was already baked in at the very beginning, but it's it is unusual. It's not unheard of. Xbox Game Studios published the original Mass Effect, for instance, but it's weird for this to come to PlayStation. And I don't know. Did you guys notice that or think of that when you saw it? 
Yeah. I was thinking, does Cuphead also fit into this mold where it was originally published by Xbox and they kind of let it go? Yeah, that's probably a good example. I'd have to, I'd have to look. Cuphead but. and I think Ori, while it didn't come to PlayStation, it came to, came to Switch. 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 Yeah. 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 Um let me see here. What was the what was the uh, first thing? Oh, Cuphead. Cuphead. Let me see what it says. But I was yeah, trying to remember what their Wikipedia. relationship was. No, it's pu- the publisher has always been Studio MDHR, according to Wikipedia. So hmm. Xbox okay. didn't publish it. They certainly funded it, but that the funding behind the scenes might have been more akin to what Sony people might remember. Sony used to do something. It comes up sometimes. They call it the pub fund where they would basically trade exclusivity for money. And once the money was paid back and a certain term was was set for time, then they can bring it to other other platforms. So this was how Guacamole came to market and other games like that. Mm. So um, what was that? Oh, Mercenary Kings. That was another great example. That game was fucking oh, yeah. dope. I loved that game. OK. Let's see. So we have that and we'll keep an eye on that. So that's March 7th. It's an adventure game, by the way. Multi. Oh, let me see here. It's described in case people are curious. An uncompromising crime drama of betrayal, sacrifice, and resilience, set in 1998. Okay. What do you guys think of this game? I felt kind of bad for it for a specific reason, and I'll get into why. But I was glad to see it nonetheless. Tales of Kenzera Zhao. This is a so-called indie game, but it's being published and funded by EA Originals from a developer called Surgent. <clears throat> and uh, I felt bad for it just because I was like, this game's going to bomb. And the reason I know that is because it seems like the EA originals is not is not really a brand that's doing very well since except outside of like the a way out. It takes two situation. You think about um, what was the Omega Force random game that they did that was uh, earlier this year that they already took that they basically already stopped supporting. Then, you know, what I'm talking about the. Uh, was it the Monster Hunter? Yeah, one? the Monster Hunter type game. Then they had obviously Immortals of Avium. Now they're yeah. going to have this. It just seems like I appreciate that they're going out and finding this stuff. I think this game looks kind of cool. It's a little surprising. You know, 2.5D side scroller from EA. Not unheard of. Again, early EA originals like Unravel and shit were the same. Were the, basically the same. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I, I see this and I'm like, it's cool. You're taking these kinds of risks. I can't imagine this is going to be worth your while. But it comes out. April 12th, any interest in that? The dude, I was happy to see the dude on the stage because he seemed to be like really amped to be there, yeah. which is cool. And I appreciate that. But it seems like uh, an interesting bet for them to make. Yeah. Yeah. And they in this trailer, it has uh, with support from Ridley Scott's production company and Critical Role, which uh, I mean, if Critical Role is is pushing, I'm sure that, that that's a huge audience uh, that they'll be able to get for this game kind of like how we do with lily mo uh but i mean critical role man they they're very big but yeah this when i saw the trailer for this it reminded me of uh that prince of persia 2d game like it looks it kind of has a similar 2d uh but with 3d models and stuff like that uh metroidvania type but yeah i i I honestly guys i just with rare exception i just don't get very excited about 2.5d generally speaking Mm -hmm. it was like they showed that prince of persia game which is pretty from UB at the beginning of the of the pre, like before the presentations even began in that kind of half an hour interstitial period. And I'm like, I don't know. I just I, I I'll I'll go through it and play those games like Shadow Complex. I, I really loved or more recently Bloodstained. But it's like I'm kind of playing it in spite of it being 2.5D. It always comes off as very cheap looking to me. And in my opinion, it's much more sophisticated and difficult to make beautiful flat 2D pixel art. I don't understand the whole fake depth thing. Yeah, it's just not my aesthetic in 2D, but I just think it can be much better than that. That's my opinion anyway. All right. Next up would be number 15. And sorry, I know I'm looking all over the place because I have like eight fucking million windows open all over my screen here. This comes from well, I don't know why I was so angry when I said that this comes from Xbox Wire. It says uh, this is all right. So this is for Don't Nod. So this is the, the guys that did remember me back in the day. And of course, so life is strange and so on and so forth. They announced a new game. Lost Records, Bloom, and Rage. And it's coming out in late 2024 on PlayStation 5. It seems to take place both in the mid-90s and in modernity, which is kind of cool, maybe about something that happened back then. I actually think this kind of looks pretty interesting. There's an article on Xbox Wire all about it, if you want to learn more about it. It's about a little bit about the process of making the game and kind of the inspiration for it following Life is Strange 2 and how they made it during the pandemic and all this that stuff. Maybe not super interesting to hear at this point, but... 
Um, Don't Nod Montreal is working on this game. I don't know if there's any interest in in this at all. I, I've actually always meant to and kind of don't really know why I haven't yet played Life is Strange. Like I've wanted to play those games. I just never got around to them because I like the idea of kind of immersive adventure. But mm-hmm. I don't know. This Don't Nod seems to have an interesting thing going and some different partners to, to dance with. So any interest here or, or should we move on? No. Not for uh, me, at least. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I liked Life is Strange too. Actually, I, I remember playing it and enjoying it. That's the and one it, with the uh, power of empathy, right? That's like no, like, no, that's oh, a woman uh, with the power of em- oh, that's True Colors. That's True Colors. Yeah, yeah. Two <laughs> was two was the one about the the. It was like a two. It was like a brother one. It was like a a, a kid and his brother, oh. and they they killed. Yeah, that. He, he's like psychic or something. It was it was cool. Um, I mean, for, you know, for Life is Strange, it's a very specific type of writing style that like i'm not super hit super big on but i I do like the idea of of kind of like an it style kind of thing going on where it's them as kids and them as adults i think that could be interesting but i I would have to see more i I have to know more about what the game even is but i assume it's just going to be more of life is strange number 16 so i don't know much about this this is a so nexon the japanese publisher has a bunch of mostly popular mobile games and PC centric games like Maple Story and stuff like that. And they have this thing which is Dungeon Fighter Online. Do you guys know anything about this at all? It's mm. like an old it's been around for a, a long time going back to the mid the mid 2000s in in Asian markets. This game, the first Berserker Kazin, I think takes place in that world and this game was revealed from a developer called Neeple and being published by Japanese publisher Nexon. It's described on Steam as a hardcore action role-playing game. The player will become Kazan, the great general of the Pelos Empire, whom overcame death and sets out to reveal the incidents that led to his downfall and seek vengeance on his enemies, end quote. Sounds a little bit like God of War, actually. And then further in the description on Steam, it says, uh, let's see, anything here? Yeah, not really. I mean, this is all marketing stuff, I guess. It's not really that interesting to talk about. Any interest here in this game? I, I, I'd like to know more about this because I see this dungeon fighters thing every once in a while and it's big it's like really big i don't know i just can't know i can't know everything and this is one of those major blind spots where i'm like you could tell me anything about this and i would believe it but any interest in this game or no i'm curious about this world as well i thought that the i mean the aesthetic was cool and it did you're right in it was kind of like god of war it had some iframe dodging which gave me some souls feels yeah I, I think it has castlevania vibes too like the, the character the blonde character reminded me a little bit of like what simon belmont would look like in 3d in some oh, sense yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. all right there was a bunch of interstitials here that are worth noting so there was the final fantasy 7 rebirth musical interlude i actually muted and looked away from this tv at this point because we've come so far i don't want to see any more or hear any more about mm-hmm. that so there's that then there's the apex legends final fantasy crossover that i don't think anyone cares about they showed Honkai Star Rail for a little while. I'll quote Micah, who says, uh, quote, I'm not going to play a game called Honky Star Rail. So she she, <laughs> she was a uh, little bit of a slur. There. I'm sorry about that. And then they uh, this, no this. This is what I was bringing up before, Dustin Blade from Arcane, which I told you at the beginning of the show before the show was going to be announced because I was told by someone that yeah. that was going to be announced. So their their column was right moment. Um, No Xbox branding anywhere on this. And I thought that that was weird. It was there was there was nothing else. I didn't notice anything about the Kojima thing. If you go and look, there is nothing at all about Xbox anywhere on the materials for it. And I'm wondering a few things about that, because you, to your point, Xbox branding was everywhere. They they are not shy. And I would be like, of course, it's Xbox exclusive. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Hmm. I'm curious about this. This is interesting. It could be that this was under development before the purchase happened, but it's more likely that maybe they want to make a multi-platform game and it's important to remember that though microsoft owns bethesda arcane is in bethesda's umbrella and not in the xbox game studios umbrella so maybe you get away with it from that point of view but maybe it's just something where they just didn't include it but that is weird it's not there and i think that that means that must mean something because why wouldn't you put that there why wouldn't you say xbox game studios xbox exclusive blah 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 yeah doesn't make any sense conspicuous you're you're 100 right i did not I'm looking at it right now, too, just even in that end slate where it would be so obvious to put Microsoft, but they don't. So pretty interesting. I got to say, man, I when I was thinking like, man, Dishonored 3 is never going to happen, is it? 
It's never yeah. going to happen because after this, they'll do Deathloop 2, probably. You think yeah. so? <laughs> yeah, Deathloop was way... Dude, it was, wasn't, it was nominated for Game of the Year that year. Yeah. So I think they'll do it. I, but, I got a feeling this game... I mean, it. I don't know how you can interpret this as this being an Xbox exclusive. I'm looking all over the place. I think some people yeah, would I'm say it's, impl- it's implied, right? Now, right. I guess so. But I'm um, even on Bethesda's. So there's a a uh, press release for it on Bethesda's website, and there's nothing about platforms on on it. Does just doesn't yeah. say. And I just think that that is uh, conspicuously missing, and something to keep an eye out for. I don't know what will come of it, and if it is coming to PlayStation, there's a number of reasons why that might be, including having to fulfill contractual obligation to bring the game over. Was there a date given for this or no? No, I don't think so. It's not on the website either. And on well, the, so it, it, yeah, go ahead. It, I mean, it could be if it's not on the website, if there's no date given for it. And it's not in the trailer, if I remember correctly, because I think I would have remembered if there was a, a date or even even a release year. There doesn't seem to be a release year on it either. It could be that they're still kind of like. It could be that, you know, Starfield was a Bethesda, you know, it was a Bethesda game that was exclusive to Series X. Obviously, that didn't result in the things that they wanted to. And it could be that they're still trying to figure out what they're going to do yeah. with future titles. And maybe they don't necessarily want to commit or not commit quite yet so instead they're just like hey we're making this game Bethesda's is making this game and uh, we'll see we'll see where it ends up I, I, the more interesting aspect to me about this was like <laughs> arcane is really really into vampires yeah totally it's like they yeah. made they made redfall i granted they're different teams i know it's like our, uh what leon and austin but mm-hmm. it's still it's very bizarre to me that they would have two teams working on vampire games it's just interesting yeah. Now, I'm curious what you guys thought of this announcement, which I thought was kind of interesting, just in the middle of the confirmation of from Anthony Mackie himself, Twisted Metal Season 2 is going to happen on Peacock. Not a huge surprise, I because we had noted at the time that I think Peacock revealed it was one of the top five shows that they ever had. So I was like, well, of course, yeah. you're going to have to renew that. So that's good news. I think there's something to explore there. And you know what I was most excited about, Dustin? Guess what I was most excited about when I heard that news? David Jaffe is going to get his cameo because he said it he, because he was offered a cameo in the first season and he turned it down because he didn't want to travel during COVID. And he said if there was a second season that they would allow him to come on. And I remember what was the guy's name? The guy with the huge dick. I was like, that would have been David Jaffe. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, From, yeah, yeah. The guy in the bar. He's yeah, like, like, he that would have been totally something? David Jaffe's yeah. character, which I was like, damn, dude, because that or, or the, I, I said maybe the map guy in the first episode or the second episode would have been kind of cool, too. Yeah. For him. But I'll be very interested to see where David Jaffe pops up in there. So congratulations to them. We'll check that out. Probably 2025. It was also confirmed unrelated to the Game Awards show that the in an HBO junket trailer, The Last of Us, which won best rendition, television rendition or movie rendition or whatever. Adaptation. Yeah. Adaptation. Um, that will be coming in 2025 as well. So that's con- confirmed, too. Next game was shown from a studio called Lightspeed L.A., the game is called Last Sentinel. There's a website for it right now. If you want to check it out, Last Sentinel. Oh, I'm sorry, Last Sentinel Game. dot com. And it says second set decades from now in a reconstructed Tokyo, you play as Hiromi Shoda in Last Sentinel, a narrative focused open world action game. I would argue out. I mean, we don't really know what the gameplay and the beat the beat the beat gameplay will look like, but I would say outside of Exodus, this is probably the coolest game that I saw. And I loved like the the mixture of east and western flavors in in the action the robotic woman and all of the rest uh, we don't very, know very much about it but i'm pretty hot on this i think this game looks pretty cool there's not too much that we know about it right now you can go to the website see the trailer you can follow them on their various socials but that's pretty much all we know about it right now uh dustin any thoughts here on the last sentinel dude i love the ending shot where you see uh you know the the toy gate and then japan or tokyo i'm assuming Oh, yeah. Reconstructed Tokyo and just very much Akira Ghost in the Shell uh, feeling there that I absolutely love. I mean, Akira is one of my favorite movies of all time. So if this is even just inspired by that in some degree, which I imagine it, it is, uh, it's very cool. Any interest here, Chris? No, not even slightly. <laughs> Fair enough. Let me see here. I'm trying to keep all my windows in order. All right, so the next up, we have number 18, this game, The First Descendant. Do you guys have any interest in this? It's a third-person looter shooter being internally developed at Nexon. Nexon has been all over the show. 
Yeah. It's described on Steam as, quote, the first Descendant is a third-person looter shooter powered by Unreal 5, become a Descendant, fight for survival of humanity. Descendants have unique abilities to tackle both solo and co-op missions. Up to four players use varied mechanics to defeat giant bosses. Be the first Descendant. It says that all in capital letters, by the way, in case you're really excited about it. Dustin, you're nodding and knowingly. Yeah. I Dude, I like the idea of co-op and taking down big bosses. It kind of reminds me... Not that this fight is really like that, but I always enjoyed that in raids and Destiny 2, where it's a bunch of you fighting this giant being, whether it's Crota or someone else. So this cool it looks cool. There's like a cool grappling hook part where they're like, you know, swinging off the monster and stuff like that. No gameplay, really. So, again, no gameplay, yeah. no hype. But it's a it's an interesting concept to run with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything you want to say, Chris? Conceptually, I, I dig it, but I need to see I need to see it in action. You know? All right. A couple of things here, kind of more interstitials. Zenless Zone Zero was shown again. I don't know if you guys are interested in this. This is from MiHoYo, the Chinese studio that does um, Honkai Star Rail and Genshin Impact. It's an action RPG. It's uh, only announced for PC right now, but it's clearly going to come to home consoles. They they did note that it will come to home consoles. They just haven't identified which ones will come yet. So there's an official website up for it. It's, uh, I don't know looks like a stylish action rpg a lot of these games are kind of melding together in some sense again for me these kind of more anime style games as well but they showed that i don't know if there's any interest in that they did have a uh something for let me see here i didn't even open anything for this mecha break which is let's see described as a multiplayer mech game that allows players to choose from diverse mechs customize appearances and battle colossal war machines on treacherous terrain get ready for the ultimate showdown blitz brawl and blaze this is from a studio called Amazing Season. So that's going to be on PlayStation 5 at some point. There was a commercial for Helldivers 2. We know that's coming early next year. There was the performance of Old Gods of Asgard, which I thought was cool. Yeah. It was not live, obviously, which was a little annoying to me, but it was cool nonetheless and an interesting marketing technique for them. I like the crossover with all the different characters and the live action shit they do is weird. I think Sam Lake is starting to feel himself a little bit. I don't know how I feel about that. Like a little, he's just, he's, kind of around now and inserting himself into things i think that's kind of interesting the he's got a lot of auteur spirit which yeah. i appreciate the yeah. uh let's see number 19 would be den of wolves described on games press as the next co-op heist shooter from the creators of payday the heist and payday 2 this is 10 chambers they did the game gtfo and it says, quote, rise from the underground of Midway City as professional criminals in the conflicts between rival corporations operating within the city's cutthroat black market and offering your services to the highest bidder. Consider yourself a vital part of the ecosystem of industrial espionage, sabotage, assassinations or unauthorized errands, as the suits say. It's up to you and your assembled crew to successfully execute futuristic mind bending heists that blur the line of reality. Any interest in this? Den of Wolves doesn't. Uh, I honestly didn't really know what to make of it. I haven't checked out GTFO. I know they're doing a free multiplayer weekend, but I like the imagery where it kind of shows like the people all hooked up uh, mm. with all the wires and stuff. It was definitely has that more creepy, not horror, but like, you know, cyberpunk, uh, scary future feel to it. But uh, I don't know. We'll have to see. All right. And uh, anything you want to say about this, Chris? Yeah, I mean, it... it... <laughs> Visually, it looks interesting. I just, I, I honestly don't know much about GTFO at all. Like, I, I, I feel like this trailer was the first time I've ever cognizantly taken notice of that name as, as a game. But, uh, I mean, it looks interesting. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not compelled necessarily by it, but at least it looks visually kind of like something. There's some art design stuff going on that I like, which is more than I can say for a lot of stuff that was shown. All right, let's power through. <laughs> Exoborn was announced, a new tactical open world extraction shooter from the developer Shark Mob, who's probably best known actually for their Vampire the Masquerade multiplayer game. It says, quote, publisher level infinite, which is 10 cent, by the way, in case you need to be reminded. And developer Shark Mob revealed the studio's new and upcoming original game Exoborn during the Game Awards. In development for PC and consoles, the tactical open world extraction shooter puts you in the middle of a world ripped apart by apocalyptic, apocalyptic forces of nature. Any interest here, Chris? I, d- I appreciate the grappling hook, as yeah, I, I noticed as well. That. I noticed that. But, uh, yeah. you know, games are starting to understand. But the, you know, again, this is another, this is another one. It was CG. So, I don't know. I mean, it, uh, conceptually, yes. Yeah, cool. Give me grappling hook. Give me this weird world. Okay. Attraction shooter with grappling hook. Sick. 
but I, I don't know how this is going to play or how it actually is going to materially feel as a as a video game. So, <laughs> you know, I gotta wait. Yeah, I'm trying. Tr- it says gear up, get in, and get out of in Exoborn, a tactical open world extraction shooter set in an apocalyptic U.S. transformed by extreme forces of nature. Public events, ever changing threats by the world itself, and risky missions let players write their own stories each time they enter the world of Exoborn, like having an epic gunfight in a tornado. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. That reminded that reminded me of a of a of the drop. Oh yeah, I, we haven't the way that, the way that was right. scratched something inside you. Good, I'm something yeah. primordial. I like that. Ooh. All right, we had No Man. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Hello Games show up. No Man's Sky developer. I was a little concerned about Sean Murray seeming yeah. to fall into the same trap that he did. It's like, what are you doing? The Primrose Path, dude. Light No Fire is the new game. I can't find a press release for it, but there is a new trailer up for it. It basically seems like an exploration game a la No Man's Sky. But instead of having a very expansive series of epic planets, you have like the, a, a planet that is richly populated. That's what it seems like to me. He said that it's being made by himself, Sean Murray, plus about a team of a dozen people. They've been working on it for about a half a decade. I'm I don't know. I, it, it looks totally fine. I'm sure it's going to be big because No Man's Sky has a huge audience. Uh, any interest here? Anyone yeah, want to say I have a, a little description I'm assuming from it's in the GameSpot thing uh, just says Light No Fire is a game about adventure, building survival and exploration together set on a fantasy planet the size of Earth. It brings the depth of a role playing game to the freedom of a survival sandbox. OK, so, dude, you're right about Sean Murray, <laughs> like just getting excited. I felt concerned for him. I remember very specifically when No Man's Sky came out. He said, oh, well, if you found another player, you would see them. But there's no chance of that happening. And then literally the fucking day it came out, it was discovered that there you definitely can't see another player because they did go to the same spot. Yeah. So when he said, oh, well, you're going to be able to you're all going to be on the same planet. I was like, Sean, are we? Yeah. Are we all going to be on this planet? It sounds crowded. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Yeah. All right. A couple more things. Final Fantasy 16 DLC announced and this was pretty cool because the first one is actually available today. So over on the PlayStation blog, it says, uh, quote, Final Fantasy 16 players will soon be able to enjoy two new DLC chapters for the critically acclaimed action RPG one very soon. Indeed, Echoes of the Fallen launches on PlayStation Store today. The second DLC entitled The Rising Tide releases spring 2024. Both are paid for DLC, but players can purchase the Final Fantasy 16 expansion pass to enjoy both chapters at a discounted price. Echoes of the Fallen unlocks a whole new story battles, weapons, accessories, level cap, and more. For players who have completed the required quests, this new adventure begins before the base game's final battle, as strange dark crystals begin to circulate on the black market. Players will follow Clive and his friends during the investigations as they encounter a group of suspicious traders, leading them to a long-abandoned fallen tower known as the Sage Spire. There they will unravel the terrible secrets that await within. And then in spring 2024, the rising tide will bring new challenges and more, including the confrontation between Clive and the legendary icon Leviathan. So we'll learn more about that at the time. I thought this was a pretty cool shadow drop. I don't, I'm kind of done with Final Fantasy. I, I think Final Fantasy 16, I think one day I'll go back and play it again and then I'll enjoy all the DLC at that time. I don't think I'm going to go back at this point and play, that, play any of it though. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking is that I wouldn't want post game DLC from this, but if it make if they're going to do DLC, it has to be during the story. And I just would rather play it on a replay like you, Colin, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Any anything to say about this, Chris? That's just how I feel about DLC in general. So, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. Kind of I'm kind of over the whole deal. I mean, I've been been over it. All right. Another shadow drop that was interesting. The finals again, another Nexon game. Shadow dropped on the PlayStation 5. It's available now. And it's free to play team based shooter set in the ultimate combat and uh, uh, combat entertainment game show. According to the press release developed by Nexon's Embark Studios in Stockholm, Sweden, the finals is available now on Steam, Xbox Series X and S and PlayStation 5. Season one of the finals celebrates the glitz and glamour of Las Vegas with all the neon lights, slot machines, boxers, UFOs, plus all you can eat buffet of destruction and mayhem and the first hints of the mystery behind the world's most explosive game show. Additional arenas include Monaco on the banks of the French Riviera and the skyscrapers above Seoul, South Korea. Any interest in this? I this this game seemed to have did did pretty well in its beta. I don't know if, how much room there is for all these games. It just seems like there's so much coming to market that is seemingly competing with each other. You can imagine a world of almost endless single player experiences because you can imagine a, a a time in which you can pick and choose, like you can with any game, I guess, and then have the time to play them. But with these games that require you to play them like jobs, I just 
don't know how you peel people off. I don't, I, I don't understand that. It just doesn't seem rational to me, but maybe this has a chance. Any interest? I'll definitely check it out for free. I know that both Ben and my friend Brandon liked what they played to the beta. And those are the, if I'm hopping into a multiplayer game, it's with them. So if they're into it, then I'm going to check it out. Uh, but I like the, the whole, it, it reminds me of a smash TV, almost this like, mm. TV show this uh you know that's extremely violent they're doing this for entertainment kind of cool yeah I, I agree I, I love smash tv and then finally the last game shown was monster hunter wilds announced from capcom comes in 2025 from playstation 5 uh, for playstation 5 it says quote today at the game awards 2023 capcom a leading worldwide developer and publisher of video games announced monster hunter monster hunter wilds and the quote from the producer of the game, we're thrilled to announce Monster Hunter Wilds today and reveal the newest entry in the Monster Hunter series to fans around the world. Our team is working passionately to create the greatest Monster Hunter experience yet. And we're eager to play the game with everyone when it launches in 2025. They'll have more to say in 2024. 2024 is the 20th anniversary of Monster Hunter, it is noted. And they note that up to date, 95 million copies of Monster Hunter have been sold. Probably the most important thing, if you're interested in getting into this game, by the way, and they note this at the end of the press release, Monster Hunter World, is $9.99 right now down digital storefronts and Iceborne and the Master Edition are available for $14.99 or $19.99. So you can get all of it basically for 20 bucks if you want to check it out. So when I first saw this announced, I was like, oh, this is the Capcom game that was unannounced that's coming out ASAP. But I think I'm starting to realize that they just meant Dragon's Dogma 2 in their press release. Because remember, they said like we have an unannounced game, but that's not what they meant. I think what they meant was we have an undated game that's mm-hmm. going into that slot. Yeah. And I was like, so maybe it's Monster Hunter Wilds, but it's not. So there's that. I'm not a Monster Hunter fan. I don't give a shit. Maybe I'm just tired because it's late. Yeah, it's a it's a big deal though. Like it is like that's gonna sell a, a shit ton. You know, Monster Hunter is huge. Um, and so that's no doubt. That's a big announcement to end the show on. It's just it just so happens that it doesn't speak to me at all. So it speaks to me. I'm pumped. It looks awesome. I'm so excited that uh, specifically one of the big things they added in Monster Hunter Rise was the mounts. Uh, that those weren't in Monster Hunter World. So this is very clearly, they're not only adding mounts to this more mainline entry of the franchise, but they also seem to have a lot more ability. They're more agile. They're, this one has wings, so there's gliding going on, which is cool. But yeah, I'm really excited about this. I'm sad that it's so far away, but you know it's okay. We can uh, let them cook. There'll be plenty of other games in between. Yeah, indeed. And uh, let's go around and get some thoughts here. We obviously already have a rotund episode for people. They've already heard some of it. They'll hear the rest of it. This will probably be the longest episode in Sacred Symbols history, I would imagine. I don't know for sure. But what are our thoughts here overall? I guess I'll I'll start with mine just in the sense, and we had our our high-level thoughts at the beginning of our little conversation here about the Game Awards, but I think it's a good attempt. I like Jeff Keighley. I appreciate what he's trying to do. I think there needs to be more organization. There needs to be more harmony between the need to make money and pay for things with commercials pay homage to the game developers and all the rest and not rush through that and then have people tune in because the reality, and I think Jeff understands this, is that no one's tuning in unless there's announcements. And if you tone down the announcements by 50% so people can talk more, it's going to hurt the his ability to sell the show and it's a cyclical sort of thing. So I think he's doing the best he can, but I think we can do as an industry better than this. And so this is a good start. And I, as far as the games are concerned, I think there's a lot of promising games already announced, nonetheless, some of the promising games here, but I'll say from Sony's perspective, say anything at this point i don't understand what's going on over there from first par- from a first party perspective say something it's not it seems like a trap to say anything about this because people are going to go be like dude final fantasy 7 rebirth hell divers 2 rise of the ronin god of war dlc final fantasy 16 dlc and so and i'm like yeah that's all true but again i said it earlier you know what i mean there's something missing right now Mm -hmm. and we need to, I feel like with some level of urgency need to know more because are they really going to announce these things that close to the vest? We're getting to the point now where I'm like, are they really going to announce a mass, a massive triple a PlayStation first party exclusive for say the fall that we don't know about yet. That's very unusual for them, but if they're going to do that, that's cool, but say something. So that's from as a PlayStation podcaster, that's my my walkaways. It's hard to be too upset when you have so many games from all these sources to play. But that's and that's a lot of why we're on PlayStation, but it's not all of it. 
And a big part of why we're here and what speaks to our PlayStation experience the most are the high quality first party games. And there seems to be a dearth of them right now. And you can't help but notice that. And it does matter. And it is, I've been long, and not a long defender, but long been being like, just wait and wait, wait. But now we're kind of past the point of that, I think. Now, now I'm kind of on board with being like, let's fucking go, man. What's going on here? And mm. it doesn't, I'm not concerned about it. I'm just curious. What, what's the plan here? What are you guys doing? And we're not going to find out this year. So maybe we'll find out in January or February. Maybe there'll be a showcase at that time. I don't know. So Dustin, let's go to you. Uh, uh, closing thoughts here as we kick everyone back to the show we've already recorded. Yeah, closing thoughts. I sound like a fucking idiot later because I was so sure that Death Stranding 2 uh, was going to be there and it wasn't. So look forward to that. Mm. But uh, yeah, just overall, you're right. The balance, I think, is still off. And it's weird because if if I recall correctly in Sacred Symbols history, two years ago, we were really down on the show, like really down. And last year, I recall being really positive again. In fact, like we had felt like it was a huge improvement. And now I think we're kind of back where we were two years ago. So these things kind of, you know, flip flop back and forth. But overall, I think you're right. It's a it's a good attempt. I'm glad something like this exists. It just uh, it's tough with, you know, so much money being necessary to be involved. But uh, yeah, shout out our boy, Jeff. Chris, closing thoughts. It was a grueling show. It was yeah. a grueling show for me. Not gonna lie, and 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 actually, like going through the through everything again was like it was like a Vietnam flashback a little <laughs> bit, just talking about some of this stuff again. But I, I don't know. I uh, it's it's weird because I I don't. While I think obviously this this year was rough, and I I think we've been actually pretty kind to the to the to the show generally, um, in our tenure. But like I think. It's unfortunate that this is the best that we have and probably the best that could be like, I, I don't really know anybody but Jeff Keighley who would even remotely want to do this in the first place. So that's kind of part of it, too, where it's like we Jeff Keighley is probably the person who's going to do the best job at this. And it's still the way it is. So, like, I don't know how to feel about that, really. But some cool stuff. The Sega stuff is cool. Budokai is cool. Monster Hunter is a big deal, but. Uh, for me, what not about Timote? Tim Ote, oh, Tim, Tim o- <laughs> yeah, whatever his name is. It was Being nice. To see, exp- yeah, what, it was what's nice his name again? Xbox when when they introduced Timothy Chalamet as Xbox con- modded controller. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, as famous YouTuber Xbox modded controller. I thought that was funny, but that was funny. that was very good. But that was the, the fact that that the fact that that was a highlight of the show for me is not. <laughs> it's not it doesn't bode really super well. But I'm just going yeah. through these websites just to make sure there's nothing we missed. I don't think there's anything that like has come out that would be of interest. I think the thing to pay attention to again is just what's going on. Again, that is weird. What's going on with that blade game? You all know it. Yeah. So don't mm-hmm. act like you don't fucking know it. I'm not saying what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just saying that. It's weird. Yeah. You damn well know if Sony was Sony had the Spider-Man. It wasn't. It would be like PlayStation exclusive PlayStation PlayStation published by PlayStation. So. Anyway, think something to keep an eye on. But let's get back to the rest of the show. We recorded so much for you already. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you for your time, boys. Thank you for staying up late with me. It's time to go now. It's late. It's almost one in the morning here on the East Coast. So it is time to go. All right. We'll see you next time. All right. Let's get into the news. Two news items this week of major import. And by the way, I guess we would have put the Game Awards stuff before this, right? So yeah, I where the Game yeah. Awards will go. It's, in, it's I couldn't believe it. Infamous four. Yeah. Wow. Starring and- Donald Trump. Wild. <laughs> and Days Gone 3, they just went right to the third one. Yeah. Damn. Damn. Hell yeah, dude. Didn't expect it. No. All right. But here's the news as it exists before the Game Awards happened. We, of course, recorded everything separately and put it all together for you guys here. And I think this is going to be a pretty big episode. Hopefully. <laughs> or it's yeah. going to be an episode of Despair as they announced nothing but God of War DLC. And I want to be like, what are we going to play next year? <laughs> Number one. For the first time in 12 years, a new Grand Theft Auto game has been announced. And when it comes out in 2025, it would have been 12 years since the release of its predecessor, 2013's Grand Theft Auto 5. Grand Theft Auto 6 is real. It's coming to PlayStation 5 and it launches in 2025. And the game's announcement comes alongside a reveal trailer that has fans hyped. The trailer's 90 second runtime set against Tom Petty's Love is a Long Road shows shows off GTA 6's Florida inspired setting. In the GTA universe, Florida is known as Leonida and its premier metropolis is none other than Vice City which became world famous during the 2002 release of GTA Vice City on PlayStation 2. 
Similar to GTA 5, it appears GTA 6 will contain multiple playable characters centered around a female protagonist named Lucia, just like the rumors long noted. Fascinatingly, accurate rumors regarding Grand Theft Auto 6 go back more than five years when rumors began circulating that Vice City would be the main locale of the next game and that it would indeed have a female main playable character, which is the first for a long run for the long running GTA franchise, which just celebrated its 25th anniversary. By 2022, the rumors became more and more on point. A romantically intertwined criminal couple would be the games at the game center. You'll also recall that nearly an hour of actual in-game footage of GTA 6 also leaked in 2022, some of it years old. Needless to say, we all knew this was coming and developer Rockstar said as much when it said the trailer would be coming this month. However, the release date has some people bummed. We have to wait till 2025, as noted. It's important to note that once a big game is revealed, Rockstar has typically receded, sometimes for more than a year, before saying anything else. It remains to be seen if we'll get more GTA 6 in 2024 at all, but it won't matter as the game is going to sell an insane amount of copies. In the press release publisher Take-Two launched to announce the game, it was noted that 2018's Rockstar San Diego developed Red Dead Redemption 2 had surpassed 81 million units sold, while 2013's GTA 5 first launched on PS3 that year but later ported to PS4 and PS5 has surpassed a completely insane 190 million copies sold. In other words, GTA 5 and Red Dead 2 combined have sold more copies than every PlayStation exclusive in history combined. Grand Theft Auto, which started in 1997 as a top-down crime game, came to worldwide renown upon the release of Grand Theft Auto 3 on PlayStation 2 in 2001. Through GTA 3, though GTA 3 was quickly followed in order by two more releases on PS2, Vice City in 2002 and San Andreas in 2004, Rockstar has since considerably slowed its role. Apart from spinoffs like Chinatown Wars and the Stories games, there have been only two GTA games since San Andreas. All right. What are our thoughts? Chris, let's start with you. GTA 6, real 2025, further away than we thought. PlayStation 5, obviously. Mm. This will be a great game on PS5 Pro, I bet. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, talk to me about what you think, about what we've seen so far. Oh, dude, I, it's it's so weird. I wasn't really that excited about it, but they kind of got me. I don't know what it is necessarily. I think it looks really beautiful, It especially at the scale that they're doing. Like, I mean, Rockstar has always made like a, a specifically modern Rockstar. I just think, you know, Red Dead Redemption 2 just looks so gorgeous. And um, imagining that in, in GTA and actually kind of seeing it. Uh, firsthand with even just like with stuff like hair physics and stuff and 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 just the the tone of the trailer and and the premise of the kind of uh bonnie and clyde-esque uh criminal criminally intertwined couple i think it's super interesting i'm not i'm kind of surprised that people are bummed that it's a year and a half away when I, that seems like a completely reasonable amount of time to to announce and and wait for a game to come out i do i do prefer when it's a little bit sooner when it's like a fallout four type situation where they announce it and then it comes out super soon. But I don't know. It's when, when we're living in the same industry where, you know, <laughs> when was elder scrolls six announced, you know, like when was, when did they announce fable? You know, like I can handle a year and a half. Like yeah. it's not, it's not really that big of a deal. I, and quite frankly, I could, I could use a, a break. <laughs> I could, I can handle whatever 2024 is without GTA four or GTA six. And I'm, I bet a lot of other developers are probably happy about that, too. Yeah, I wonder. It, there's like a whole new series of people and companies that are worried and not worried now because there were companies that are probably releasing in 25 that thought they were clear. And then there were companies that were releasing in 24 that are probably relieved. Mm -hmm. And so the, and, and the, the nebulousness of what it means to release in 2025, because that could be any time in that, that calendar year. It could be the holiday season. Yeah, that you really don't don't know when it's coming. Um, Dustin, what are your first instincts here as you watch the GTA 5 trailer and and the, the press release was a little disappointing. They don't say very much at all about it. Yeah, uh, I'm with Chris. This trailer is so good that it is shocking because I also wasn't that hyped for it. But realistically, I think I probably should have been. I mean, the three of us awarded Red Dead Redemption 2 the best PS4 game overall. And so, yeah, it would make sense that this next game from them would also be awesome. There's so many things about this trailer that I just absolutely love. Just starting even I'm I've just been watching it on repeat since we started this topic and the opening shot, the the color palette with the pinks and the orange and the skyline. Mm -hmm. And then immediately, even this first shot where you see her looking outside in the jail. The lighting over and over in this trailer, the lighting is so incredibly good. And the way that even uh, I, I was watching Digital Foundry talk about some of the tech stuff. So uh, some of this had, to, I guess, I don't know, some of it had to be pointed out to me, which 
maybe saying something uh, that I'm not that observant, but the way when she turns around, you can see like the sun on her orange shirt and it reflects onto her face and changes the total, uh, you know, appearance of the lighting as a whole is just awesome. And then the other thing too, that when I showed this trailer, I had Holly watch it. Cause I'm just curious. She's never played a GTA game. She doesn't really care about this, but I was like, what do you think about this? And the one thing that she said was like, wow, trailer had a lot of different body types in it. Uh, and I think that's really cool in that all of, there's so many different types of people in the way they look from, you know, your, your big booty Latina as the main character that we've talked about before, mm. all the way to the weird skinny naked guy who's, watering his lawn there's just a huge diverse amount of people and the fact that these models on these characters look so good they somehow look so insanely realistic without without looking gross as many games tend to do i am just so incredibly impressed with the trailer i love also dude the romance crime thriller maybe that we're getting amazing yeah i cannot wait to see more it it's a very, 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 very high quality trailer. And it's already gotten 121. See. Yeah. Yeah. Mill. Crazy. I'm on the GameSpot version. Ah. So I because I just Googled <laughs> whatever. But there's a lot to say about the trailer. I was most interested in actually looking at kind of the way that they lampoon things around them. And there's some funny stuff in it. There's a there's a plane with a banner behind it that says Y69 when you can 99 or whatever. And I don't know what that means in the, in the, because it's like a brand name or whatever, but I yeah. thought that that was so, and there's another one where the billboard and it says it, it's an antidepressant billboard and it says it cures emotions, which I thought was <laughs> really, really funny. So there's definitely going to be like a lot of that. And the, the whole, I, I loved this and I noticed if I re- recognized a few of them as a public freak out person, but they are they are lampooning a bunch of things in the trailer, which is really, really cool, like things that really happened in Florida, which I think is hysterical. And I, I'm especially interested in a British team primarily making a game like this about a place like that that is so legendary in the world, like Florida Man and like all the things that go on down there centered around Vice City. I think it's I think it looks great. And I, I guess I couldn't help in looking at it knowing that it's like that's all there and i know that this is an old thing in video games remember the skyrim or it's even like oblivion it's like you can go there yeah you see that mountain you can go there i I get that it's it's not a thing anymore but it's so much deeper in this world like you just look at it and you're like holy shit there's so much going on there's so much density there are so many people there's that shot of the beach i'm looking at early on where it's like damn dude there's there's hundreds and hundreds of npcs down there the the uh, I was especially smitten with the shot and there's that shot of the flamingos shout out. But oh, yeah. I, I loved the shout out or I love the shot of the, um, the all the nightlife on the strip or whatever in Miami or in Vice City where everyone's partying and all the beautiful cars are lined up and stuff. I'm like, you're just gonna be able to, there's like a guy panhandling and it's it's dope. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see what it's what it's all about. I will admit this, though, that when GTA five came, I was really, really excited about it to play it. I previewed it pretty hard. Actually, I saw it a few times and I was kind of a little confused why people were like, this is the most beautiful game ever. And I'm like, it's really not. But and and I'm talking about on the PS3 at the time, Mm -hmm. but I came home from Japan to play it. As I told you, I bought this game. I had it waiting for me and I wasn't really that into it. And I wonder if the same thing's going to happen here where I'm just like, yeah, conceptually, this is dope. But I don't know that I'm really going to going to want to do this, but GTA Vice City is my favorite GTA game. So to be able to go back to this, even though it's modern, is cool. And I, I just think it doesn't matter necessarily how much money or time is spent on a game. But when you have an organization that can spend, and I'm being literal, billion plus, right, on, on the development of the game, easy. Probably more like two billion at this point on the game. And the marketing that's going to go behind it, hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not more than a billion dollars in marketing probably behind it. It's going to sell, and I'm not even being facetious, day one, something like 20 million or something. It's going to do something like yeah, it's you absurd. can't even believe, you know, and yeah. it's going to be one of those moment games that I think everyone's going to want to experience. And I think that it's cool that though I don't think that games need to be made like this, and in fact, most games cannot in any way, shape or form be made like this. It's cool to see the result of a game that has just been quietly made for many years. 
And by the yeah. we're seeing stuff, you know, we're seeing a game that's been in development for active development for six or seven years at this point. And by the time it comes out, it'll be like eight, nine years. It's pretty crazy. And this is what you get is this this level of incredible detail. Yeah. And it, it, now, how will it play? How will it run? I'm sure it's going to be great, but I have no idea. We don't know anything yet. All yeah. right, let's see. Let's get some of these inquiries in here. Michael Centeno wrote in and said, hey, Sacred Crew, the GTA 6 trailer is finally out and blew my expectations out of the water. After viewing the trailer, can we put the rest of the narrative that GTA 6 has gone woke? Oh my God. Lucia is the first playable female since the PS1 days, and based on the trailer, the plot has a lot of potential to be a compelling story and isn't just a character for the sake of having a female lead. Thanks, and I will hang up and listen. This I'm interested in this this conversation about people being are there really people upset about it or is it the interpretation that people expect that people are going to be upset about it because I didn't see anything in this trailer to indicate that this isn't a Grand Theft Auto game that they aren't going to go right. fucking hard and well yeah so I don't I don't get it I don't well, personally get it's, it it's it's difficult to parse out these days when so much so much outrage is performative and mm. and specifically especially with the introduction of you know uh Twitter blue and, and and the money that you get from it. Granted, though, it's not a lot. It's still something. It's 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 hard to tell whether or not people are even taking this. It's hard to tell whether or not the people who are complaining about it are even serious about it or whether or not they're just, you know, pandering or just trying to, you know, profit from the big moment like GTA GTA 6 is a big deal. And so to talk to not talk about it would be dumb. So there are a lot of people who don't know anything about video games who are <laughs> kind of talking about it in a way that's really kind of typical for GTA to be in the in the limelight. I just don't know if it's authentic anymore. You know, it, it feels so forced. Like I saw a clip of um Tim Cast talking about how like, oh man, or, or it was some some woman on Tim Cast who was like, oh man, they, I guess the 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 protagonist is a female, it's a single mom. I guess we got to get those representation points in. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like that, that, that almost is so incoherent that it can't be. I refuse to believe that that's a real opinion even. But that's what I'm seeing a lot of. It's a, a lot of outrage about it. But it's what does that even mean when you're financially incentivized to be outraged by it? You know, yeah, is it even fair. like what does that even who cares at that point? There was also the the Elon tweet that he was said about not playing it because you killed cops in it. That was and fucking then, uh, embarrassing. Dude, and then Ian Miles Chong said, oh, I didn't I didn't finish it. And he got community noted to fucking hell. Dude, oh, really? Um, what, did, he have yeah. the, did he have the achievements or something for it? No, because he, he wrote like 255 Game Ranks articles specifically about evading police and like and doing all the shit in GTA 5. So it's like, oh, like his strategy guide stuff. Yeah, yeah that, that was that was one of the more embarrassing <laughs> things I think I've ever seen where Elon That's was funny, like, I, I didn't I tried it, but I didn't I don't like doing crime. And it's like you bought Grand Theft you played Grand Theft Auto and right. didn't like doing crime. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't get the outrage. I, I, I didn't even get the outrage then because I was like, this is just fundamentally. It's not real. It's just not real. It's not real. Yeah, it right. does. It does. Vice City doesn't exist. Yeah, it's United doesn't exist. I, I, it's it's great. It is spiritually healing for me, though, to see. Uh, you know, just people that I would expect, like people who would have been offended by like the the previous Grand Theft Autos be offended by it still to this day, even though it's, you know, again, whether or not it's authentic is is up in the air. There's something about it that was like, oh, OK, maybe maybe we're more grounded than I thought we were, because it is it is kind of making the rounds in, in um, you know, establishment like Republican circles and, and, and those kinds of um TV programs about how like, oh, is this, is this marketing, uh, d uh, marketing demonic murder simulators to kids? And it's like, ah, oh, I'm home. I feel home. Well, it, it's also just about how people just just based on the time and the place and the side. We brought up Six Days in Fallujah as the example where Six Days in Fallujah was once controversial on the right and is now controversial on the left. Right. And at one time, the left couldn't care less and the right did. And so on. it's very. Yeah, I like I like the GTA has remained consistently offensive uh in some way even though there's nothing about like that's what's crazy about it right is that <laughs> there's nothing in the trailer at all is that that even reads as remotely offensive but you know uh some of the reactions i've seen to it have been pretty fucking i don't know i've seen some pretty out of pocket reactions to it about yeah. like uh, people complaining about the amount of black people on the beach in miami and somebody's like oh well at least you could kill all of them it's like all right relax 
It's well, yeah, it's, and also, up. have you been to Miami? That's fucking... Also, yeah, that's... I don't know. Like, it's what not What are you Maine. talking about? Miami not, is like a heavily black and, spa- and Hispanic or Spanish, you know, whatever, it's, Latino. It's very Cuban and, and very Latino. Cuban, yeah. and, so, I, I don't know. It's... We, weirdos are going to be weirdos, and now there's financial incentive to be a weirdo, so it's... I don't know. It's, it's difficult to even parse how people really feel about it. But what is true, objectively true, is that this 90 million views in one day is crazy. Uh, especially for the games industry, which I think even I, I think I saw even a tweet that said something about like how that dwarfs so many uh, big like major reveal trailers even just combined. So this game's going to be huge. It's going to sell a ton. It's going to make a shit ton of money and everybody's going to play it. <laughs> and uh, not really. There's really no outrage in the world that could stop that from happening. So Miami racial composition 2020. Hispanic or Latino, 70%. White, 14%. <laughs> black, 12%. Yeah. It's like, what, what do you understand? I don't know. I, I, yeah. I just, these are, this is just outrage for outrage sake. I, the one thing that will bother me, because I know that they said, I think at some point, like they don't want to punch down. And I get that. But part of GTA's humor is actually kind of being mean a little bit to some things, like to everyone, yeah. you know? And, like South I don't Park. want them to I definitely don't want them to shy away from that. That's why I was heartened yeah. to see that billboard where I was like that billboard is going against like one of the most third rail things that people like are so afraid of ever making fun of now, which is mental health. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm yeah. like, I think we're good. I think we're OK. I think that with the Chris, you were saying about the people that were saying about it being woke because as a, a woman lead character. Right. Yeah. I, it, this feels like a problem that Disney made conservative or whatever, you know, The other side's so fucking sensitive because I get it. Disney shoehorned women and diversity into every possible thing they could for the last five to ten years. But now they're like so fucking sensitive that they're like, oh, it's a woman. It's woke. It's like, yeah, shut the fuck up. Yeah, differentiate, differentiate. I I, I think that that's really important is this. There have been things where it's like this doesn't make sense that wedging this in this racial component, this sexual component, you know, gender component, whatever. But that doesn't that doesn't mean that women don't exist and can't be protagonists of a, of a video. Like, I don't even understand how you get from one to the other. It's like, what are you talking about? Because it's, then that just means yeah. that like Metroid is woke. Or, right. Or, yeah. Or playing as yeah. Chun-Li is woke or woke. It's like it doesn't make any what you're saying doesn't make sense. Like, just just think for a minute. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not. Yeah, it, it's a lot of terminal terminally online people, really. Like, I, I, I don't I can't think. Of a single, even with some of the stuff that was happening in 2016 or like 2017, with like a, a lot of the, um, you know, the what 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 people would consider woke today or, or whatever. Like, I, it's a very re- like, dude. I, I brought up recently. Shane Gillis is probably like one of the most modern uh, comedians that are. It's actually like skirting that line of like being offensive, and he's like saying shit that's really off color. But he's a really popular comedian here. Like people like that. I think people just want shit that's good, you know, and, yeah, and totally. mo- most pe- most people in the real world just want good shit. And I think uh, the Internet, unfortunately, puts a magnifying glass to those of us who are least sane and who spend too much time proportionally engaging on the Internet with very, very little human uh, context or contact and so i just that, i don't know man that i can't i can't engage with it anymore realistically because especially now that there's such a clear profit motive it just feels pointless to even draw attention to in the first place you know i believe it was fred durst that said no human contact and if you interact your life is on contract your best mm-hmm. bet is to stay away motherfucker it's just one of those days yeah, is, uh, I think the line from the great philosopher Fred Durst, the great the one of the great American mm. philosophers from Florida, Fred yeah, Durst. Right. Maybe he'll maybe he'll be in it. That would be cool, actually, if they, they were. Uh, <laughs> it was really interesting speaking to actually it hasn't gone up yet, but the Finn McKenty episode of Constellation that we did. Right. Mm. My, my topic is rap rock and we talk and he was talking about how. It's like Limp Bizkit's actually cool, cool now, like not not cool with new metal people or not fringe cool or whatever but actually like kind of mainstream cool and yeah like, oh, they've, they've, they've circled back into right. like they've, they've they've run the gamut all and now they're back to to cool again yeah one thing, exactly one thing i want to yeah. say before we move on i do love what this trailer does with with kind of streaming and and, and tiktok and that type of thing because it it has this and even just like the body cam footage and the security cam footage because it, it is this kind of it is sort of a cheat in some way but it it makes the f- the game look more real 
because there's that added layer of specifically that shot of the the crocodile or the alligator in the yeah, in, the, in the convenience store in the, oh, convenience, in the convenience store, store. that's what it was yeah, yeah. that yeah. looks fucking real as hell to me and it's because it's it's you know security cam footage that's like lower res but it's like super convincing and it's that's that's a cool trick that i i just wanted to shout out because i, I appreciate it it's cool it's in universe it grounds it and it also makes things just look better and that's that's a really smart way to use that i think chris i was thinking when you see all these fake tiktoks i wonder is there gonna be a tiktok app in game that you can just sit and watch maybe they make that would be hilarious. 10 hours worth of in-game TikToks in the world of Vice City. Yeah, I mean, you can just waste the whole day. You can wait, waste your whole and miss like key missions because you, you're fucking too lazy. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's cool. I, I don't know. I, I, I think so. I mean, Grand Theft Auto. F- I didn't play much of five, so I, it's not really in my memory. But Grand Theft Auto four had the, you know, really obviously this is before smartphones, but like they had the cell phone that was like a really key aspect of it. And mm-hmm. and so like I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that. They've oh, always yeah, had, totally. Like, totally. Yeah. Because it was even going back to GTA three, it was like the beeper. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you yeah, get and like you get contracts and stuff through it. And yeah, all that. and and in GTA four, you had like the internet cafes, and there was all these like websites and like mm-hmm. these these ads that would like <laughs> these spam bots that would pop up. Someone and, like, someone posted. I forgot about this. That if you go to like a certain website that cop like a like a like a um, porn website for underage children or whatever on the in the uh, game, you like the cops come. If you like, oh, I've this, heard of that. This URL, which is like yeah. that le- that level of um, design. This is, this is what I'm most interested in, and that's what I was going to say with GTA Six was that's beautiful. It looks like it's going to be fun to play. You can fucking do whatever you want, mow fucking people down and stuff. And this is doesn't mean anything about you if you want to do that kind of stuff. I cannot wait to go on a fucking murderous rampage in that world. It's going to be great. Right. But, but beyond that, I'm interested in the design. In what will they really have you do? And one thing I would be really interested in is like, and I wonder if they're going in this direction. Maybe the TikTok kind of fake stuff is is a is a hint of this of like living in this world, existing in this world, second lifestyle, being here, doing things. Like, what is that level of deep meta design going to look like to keep you yeah. there beyond almost, just doing your missions and playing GTA Online? Is there going to be a deeper thing? Because you were saying in GTA Four, like you could go bowling, you can go out on dates and go to the go to. It's like th- there's a beginning of something like that, and in San Andreas, you go to the gym and you go eat and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't know that that's necessarily fun, but I wonder if that's going to get much, much deeper in this game. And so I want to see that level of design. It's got to be we all know what GTA is. And so it's got to be I want to know what makes it. This is going to make this different than GTA. Yeah. You know what? I'm immediately kind of assuming. And it's only because granted this is. Look, I, I don't know if this is going to be in there. I, I'm just it's not even necessarily a prediction, but I think it would be interesting and it would kind of feed into the idea of like this would be a lived in world. It's like this trailer focuses kind of heavily on on, you know, in universe video content of stuff that looks like it kind of happens dynamically in the world. Some of it looks like a little bit more story oriented too, but I almost wonder if there will be like in GTA four, a phone that you can use and almost like a camera function where you could record shit happening in the world and upload it to whatever that TikTok would be. Yeah, that's dope. And there would be like an in-game kind of algorithm to decide like what actually gets shown to the point. Like, that's a pie in the sky idea, but that would be like a really fucking interesting and cool. And it would be the exact kind of idea that only a studio like Rockstar with the amount of freedom of capital that they have just from just from their success would be able to really iron out and do like that's a big idea. And that's probably like a lot to figure out. But and I'm not going to like, you know, if it's not in there, it's not a big deal. But like that would be fucking I could see that working in some way. Um, I'm, I'm I don't know, man, I'm stoked. I'm stoked. I, I just love the way this looks. I love the vibe that they're going with here. Hair physics are really impressive. I don't know why. I don't know why the hair physics are really. Everyone looks good. The models look amazing. And it really is a wide, as you said, Dustin, Holly's comment of it being a a.k.a. Haley as being a, a wa- like a wide gamut of body types, not because I care about representation, but because that's the what it looks like. It, it, I think that that's. That's it sells, so the, important about, it sells the world, I think. Right, exactly. It's not even about anything more than that. That's why I think people are just so lame with like the world so woke and what are all black people doing here and like, what are fat people and all. It's like, dude, do you live in the world? I don't understand why you want this to not be a a comical representation of reality, which is what Grand Theft Auto has always been since it went to 3D, especially. And I, I just, I don't know. It's it's frustrating to me because 
there are a lot of things to talk about in that realm that are interesting. I hate using – that's why I hate when people are like, Colin always says things are woke. I'm like, I, I don't even use that word. I hate that word. But yeah. I think that there's times where where you can have a, a reasonable conversation about like why are you wedging things in? Why does it have to be like this? Like what? why is this person this? Why are you doing right. this? And I think those are reasonable questions to ask. Like the whole – and South Park really did a great – apparently – I didn't. I only saw clips of it, but appa- apparently an awesome job of just destroying Disney over this in a recent episode. I don't know if you guys saw oh, that. Oh, the Panderverse. The Panderverse. Yeah, yeah, I, haven't, I haven't seen where it. Where it's like yeah. put a put a girl in it, make her layman gay or whatever. Um, <laughs> and it's but it's true. It's like what what is the intent? You got to tell a story. Yeah. And and uh so I get people's concern generally speaking, but I just don't think there's any evidence here other than that they're going to do exactly what they usually did and make fun of everything. And I think that that's that's I, yeah. what I want to make sure is that they make fun of everything it's, and don't leave it, anything out. It's kind of the did. it's kind of the mirror version of that that letter about how there's a lot of games that you know dehumanize the Middle East or whatever. Oh yeah, like the game from the Game Awards. It's people. it's, it's yeah. like the reverse of that, where it's like, where are these? Yeah, what are you talking about? Right. I don't know. I'm excited. Um, I'm officially on the hype train. <laughs> all right, in some way what? for GTA Six. Well, let's get into that. That's perfect that you said that. What a nice segue. Jefferson Wentworth wrote in. Said, good evening, gentlemen. A simple one for you all. Is there any way GTA 6 will meet the levels of hype that will be drummed up over the next 18 months? That'll be all. I think a lot of this determine, is determined by how much they say. As I noted in the write-up, and I went back and looked at this, they usually go about a year, maybe even a little longer, between when they actually introduce a game and say anything else. And yeah. this has happened the last two games that they've done. They didn't really have that kind of time with GTA 4 and certainly not with the PS2 games. But with, uh, with 5... They announced it in 2011, and I don't think said another word until 2013. And with Red Dead, I think they announced it in 2016, and then didn't say anything until 2018, something like that. Maybe maybe 15 and 17, something. So there's a good... Well, if you're an observer of any sort of logical fucking pattern in front of you, then you'll realize that maybe that's going to be what they do here. Although I wonder, because this game is going to be even so much bigger by their metrics than a Red Dead 2 which is 80 million sold, like I said. Maybe they are going to want to hit more, hit more rhythms or hit more beats, but I think that the, the rhythm of getting these things out is actually, it behooves them to say as little as possible. Here's the thing about this, in my opinion. There's not one fucking thing they can say or show about this game now that's going to make or break a sale. Like, who's, on, like who's going to... Who's hanging on and be like, I really need to see more? It's like, no, dude, you have like people's intrigue. It would almost be interesting to show nothing and just release the game. Yeah. And be like, that's what you get to see. And this is what I'd love that kind of restraint. But I know that that goes against a lot of principles of marketing. And I also know that players are going to demand more. But I'm so fascinated by big companies swinging their dicks around and saying, we don't need to do anything. It's the Half-Life 3 argument. You'll yeah. just it's just here it is. And that yeah. and doing that will mean not one more sale or one less sale. One fewer. Yeah. So. We're doing we're doing Half-Life Alex even on, on VR just because they had the the capital to do it. You know, to make a, a really truly triple A VR game with no real they didn't have to at all. And they just did it because they could, because they had that freedom. And Rockstar kind of strikes me as that that type of company now, just because they're making so much money. But will it live up to the hype, Chris? I mean, I don't know. It's it's really easy to be a little bit pessimistic about certain things, but I don't know. We just had a really good year and and uh Rockstar, you know, obviously those those remasters weren't great. <laughs> those were what was a Grove Street games that did them, uh, but they still ultimately signed off on it. There is also there. Look, there's also a chance that this is like a weirdly heavily like it's a game that's really heavily focused on the live service aspect. So maybe, you know, if you're not interested in that, like, I mean, surely there's going to be a live service element to this. Surely this is going to it's going to be like a big deal. Surely it's going to be a, a core. Uh, I would say like that that's going to be the part main part of it. I already accept that as long as they right. have a big campaign. That's all I care about. They right, can do that's... whatever they want. I know right. where they make their money. I get it. Yeah, 100%. So as long as, you know, I, I was kind of honestly like before, obviously before the leaks came in and before we knew a little bit about like, oh, there would be a story and it would be this. I, I would I honestly wouldn't have been surprised. And I think we even talked about it on the show a couple times to see them just make Grand Theft Auto 6 into this either big expansion of GTA 5 or just be have it be completely live service because that's just what I mean, they're making so much money doing that. I wouldn't even be surprised to see that. So I'm just happy that there is 
uh, a really strong story focus here, or at least like a very strong single player focus here that focuses on world building and like kind of building out this or, or showcasing this world that looks really lived in and looks really alive. I think like anything, uh, it has the potential to not be as exciting um, as it looks, but I don't know, man. For for me, I'm just excited, and I, I I'm choosing to remain excited. I, I my there's a part of me that's really pessimistic and really like kind of feels like oh, I should know better, but I don't know. We had a good year. I miss being excited for things. This is a big deal. It's going to sell a mil- like a stupid amount of units, and uh, I'm just gonna hope for the best and expect something that's really engaging. And that's kind of where I'm at. And it's the safest place to be, I think. Yeah, it's well said. I, I think that there are rumors, as we throw it over to you, Dustin, that kind of tell me that they know what time it is at Rockstar North with really honing in on something good as opposed to being too broad, which is that there was this rumor that they were going to do this much larger, like even multi-country kind of game originally, where you went to like South American countries and you like went back and forth between these places. And they apparently early on in development said like, we're just going to do this very limited space, kind of San Andreas type space, bigger though. And where I think there's like five cities or something like, you know, Vice City is the big place, but there's like these big outcroppings. And it's just going to be so fun to explore that. But it tells me that they, yeah, they understand we have to kind of cut something off and keep it limited. And so I think that it, the hype Will it meet the hype? I mean, how do you even explain if it meets the hype when it's going to sell as many copies as it's sold? It's it's met the hype. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's going to yeah. meet the hype. I think. I think so. I I think that in terms of your mentioning the the map size is that often we think that bigger is better and bigger is more immersive. Look at all the places you can go, and I swear we've had a conversation about this, but it definitely applies here that they can make the game more impressive and more immersive by focusing in on quote a smaller place quote unquote, which obviously i think the map for this is still going to be insanely impressive but i i mean i don't trust any rumor out about this game because anyone can say whatever shit they want and someone's going to pick it up in hopes just because there's there's such a thirst for information but let's say most of the buildings in this game you can go into Imagine that. Imagine how cool that would be. I would way rather there be fully enterable buildings on a large scale than have a map that is so big that I am constantly looking for a sense of familiarity because it's so big that I don't yeah. know where I am half the time. That would be amazing to me. And as far as fulfilling the hype, I mean, I don't know. Rockstar fulfilled the hype so well for me with Red Dead Redemption 2 that they've earned they've earned it from me and this trailer as I I mentioned earlier was so much more exciting than I expected that I don't it could be a situation where it doesn't work but again they haven't earned that reputation that it's it's going to be buggy or not going to work or not be what we expected dude all these releases have been amazing so why wouldn't this one be and I don't, and I don't think it's it because it, I I know some people I've seen some people talk about well it's like oh it's a CD Projekt Red situation again just because they made Witcher three and you know Cyberpunk came out and it, it was all a mess and I, I would argue like I get that perspective for sure like no company is necessarily owed your loyalty in that way like and I, I would sure. even say that's not necessarily what we're saying about Rockstar right now I just um I don't know they they just with all due respect to CD Projekt you know Rockstar has a far longer history of delivering than they do missing and and you know Witcher 3 was great but i mean cd project wasn't really put on the map until that game really in any real no i agree I, see, Witcher 3 made them no one no one cared about cd project before yeah so i i just think the fact that you know gta 3 and vice city and san andreas and 4 and 5 were all good i think it's reasonable to expect that gta 6 will be at the bare minimum very good you know i think that's a fair expectation to have um we'll see though yeah. And one thing I wanted to uh, well, you know what? I'll get into a point I wanted to make after I get this inquiry out here. Jason Van overrode in and said the trailer for GTA looked absolutely stellar. Hat tip to Rockstar employees who pegged Tom Petty's love is a long road for the soundtrack. And while I'm sure you guys are going to dissect it through the many sacred voices at your disposal, I had a different angle I'd hope you ruminate on. While the trailer assuredly got fans, media and the like extremely excited, can you pinpoint a particular reason behind releasing this thing at the absolute very least 12 to 14 months in advance? 
We already knew it was coming via years of hints and teases, unfortunate leaks, and Rockstar's own Twitter admission some months back. If anything, GTA, like Fallout 4 accomplished years prior, is one of the few franchises with the most built-in cachet to not only release a trailer in close proximity to the game's release, but perhaps even benefit from the inevitable excitement that would balloon with such a short turnaround time. That said, I'm hard-pressed to see a point in releasing a trailer this far out, especially with the vast majority of online discourse seems to be disappointed by the now-confirmed lengthy wait. Although, admittedly, the trailer currently sits at 80 million views, much more than that now, after 24 hours. There's obviously some method behind the madness, but I'm not seeing it. Curious to get your guys' thoughts. I want to underline, Jason, something for you that you actually brought up that I think is an important component of why they announced the game now, not only to get stockholders excited and maybe do something to their share price, and but I think this removes a lot of the steam, like the pressure behind the valve of leaks. And I think... At some point, you have to just say that the game's in development. And I think that they realize we are really pretty lucky, all things considered, how little has leaked. I mean, an hour's worth of footage is a lot from an early build of the game. Knowing the name of the character years ago is a a big leak, but we really don't know anything about it, really. We have a map and a location and a character, but that's not what it really is all about. And I think that by just acknowledging the game exists and showing it, it relieves a lot of the pressure internally at the studio to say, like, we've kind of gotten this far. Let's at least like relieve the steam. And they actually didn't even were you know, a lot of people are disappointed that work there that were they were not even able to get there. It leaked the day before the trailer even came out. So I did. I, Jason, you touched on it. I think there's a marketing angle to it. There's a stock angle to it and a value angle to it and all of the rest and excitement marketing beats and all of the rest. And I'm sure they have very specific plans. But I also think a lot of it is just to say, like, this is going to leak. and it's going to leak in a much more substantial way the longer we go and we have the initiative so we should take it and i, I think that that's what it comes down to personally and it's so. still leaked technically right <laughs> this trailer so you're you're yeah. right about that and then finally well actually no so now i'll get into what i was gonna say earlier which is um i wonder two things first of all how is the game gonna run a lot of people mm. have been talking about the, a game this beautiful is a th- is going to be a 30 frames per second or a, uh, a 30 frames game 1080 or you know 1080 or 4k or whatever i don't know but on ps5 do you believe that dustin do you think that and do you think ps5 pro will presumably run it at 60 frames but i've seen a lot of conjecture that there's just no way that this game the ps5 and the xbox series x certainly the series s is going to not be able to run this thing very well but that they're not going to be able it's not going to be a dynamo and we're going to need those kind of interstitial machines to make this thing run Yeah, that makes sense to me that it would be 30 FPS on current consoles and not even 4K. I mentioned earlier, there's a Digital Foundry video where they break down and they were doing some pixel counting where some of it is upscaled 1440p from the looks of it. Uh, But again, we live in an era now where I don't need native 4K. I need with what I see on the screen to look amazing and not distracting. and. There was nothing in the trailer that looked distracting to me. You can definitely tell that it's running in real time to some degree, particularly uh, when the there's the one Instagram model girl that some people are arguing is the main character or not. Yeah, oh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The bikini I don't think girl. It's her. No, no, it's not. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I haven't really looked into that, but you can cl- clearly see when her hair moves. You can see the artifacting from some kind of upscaling technique. So it's running in real time. And the the biggest question really is PlayStation 5 Pro for me and right. whether or not that's going to be powerful enough to bring it up to a 60 FPS level to some degree. I would hope so. But again, right now, we don't even know for sure. I guess we don't technically know for sure about PS5 Pro, but I would bet on it personally. Yeah, I mean, people that we trust and have been talking about it for a long time. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that that's. That seems to be part of the plan in some way, like pushing the games away from PS4 and even towards a more powerful PS5 is, I think, ideal. What do you think about this, Chris? Do you think we're going to, I mean, I was surprised. I guess I just hadn't thought about it because we see games like Horizon running at 60, but then it's like this. It's just it's just it's not just the aesthetic. It's everything underneath. It's very hard to have that kind of computational power going. Yeah. And and all that. So I, I, I would accept 30 frames on PS5, I guess. I just hope the PS5 Pro will be able to help us out and maybe even a bundle of those two games would be pretty interesting yeah I, I, well i would just say right off the bat i don't think there's any shot in hell this thing's running at 60 frames on a base ps5 or xbox series x no way um i just don't i don't i, don't, I don't see that happening i'm curious what it's gonna but, do on series s 
Oh like, yeah, that that thing. Well, I'll tell you right now that, that that's not coming to Series S. I, I would bet. I would you bet think that's that, probably you think they're gonna bail out of that. That would be interesting. I, I think yeah. for sure. Now that now that the Baldur's Gate kind of situation, well, or, or the I don't know. There, I think by the time GTA Five or GTA, I keep wanting to say Five, GTA Six is on the cusp of release. I think we will have seen many games by that point forego the Series S. Uh, just based on how things are going, like I, 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 I can't imagine they already had to cut split screen. I think from, uh, what is it from Baldur's Gate? So they're cutting features from certain. And there games was an Alan, it. wasn't there something with Alan Wake as well, where they oh, there I, was I like don't a know, second probably. concession made for that game or something. Mm-hmm. Like that was the second of the concessions that were made. So regardless of if that happened or not, Baldur's Gate is definitely the if 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 they could wield that much power, Rockstar can say like we're not bringing the game to. Right, yeah, so easily. or we just won't so, bring the game to Xbox. I guess would be the leverage that they could use, and so they would be allowed to do that. You know, yeah. So I, I if yeah, I, I just I foresee that being a, a pretty big problem. Although, admittedly, probably maybe a problem by that point that they probably would have figured out. They probably would have. There's probably going to be a history of games that have skipped Series S by then. I, I would imagine, but yeah, I mean, PS5. Whether or not PS5 Pro will be able to do it is the, is really the big question. I would I would hope so. I would uh, I would hope so, but I'm not super sure. It, it really depends on. I don't know. This game looks really dense, and that's kind mm. of the thing where we talk a lot about production per square inch, and this looks like it's got that going on a lot. And oh my god! Yeah. At, a, at a scale, I mean, even Red Dead Redemption Two, um, there's a lot of hiding going on just from the fact that you know it's kind of landscape, and and there's there's a lot of tricks that you can do making that look really good, but. You know, distinct cities, that many NPCs and, you know, the the sheer variety of what's going on, the draw distances alone and, and the freedom of movement that you have. Like you can't fly a plane in Red Dead Redemption 2. And that probably helps a lot. <laughs> the fact that you don't have to render that world at the, at the resolution that you normally would. So I, I would imagine that the best I'll put it the best way to play this game would absolutely be the PS5 Pro when that's out. <laughs> like unquestionably, I hope that they can hit 60. I think they might be able to. But, you know, we're we're speaking pretty ahead of time here so oh yeah yeah and no pc release at launch which is not at all surprising for rockstar oh but, yeah no uh i know people... that i saw people upset but dude what a why boon. would they do what that i'll sell it to you twice dude but beyond that, that yeah it's, it's great for them and they can focus on the pc release and make it a thing you know right. but also what a boon for the console manufacturers yeah dude i'm not mm-hmm. i'm telling you guys this game is going to sell so many units it's going to break your brain when it comes out and yeah whoever gets the bundle and see if i were rockstar i'd be like you both get the bundle i wouldn't even yeah even, why even play games be like do whatever you want <laughs> you know uh like sell our game as, as much as you want and market our game as much as you want but i am sure that one of them i would imagine sony has the leverage of saying like we have a much bigger player base and we have a lot of money and we'll pay your marketing fees or whatever you know or something like that and in return let us bundle the game because there was that big there was a ps3 bundle wasn't there and a ps4 bundle yeah i think and, so. i think so yeah. and that, I think was that was a big a- deal as i recall because remember the dlc for gta 4 came to xbox exclusively it wasn't even on playstation for like a year yeah and uh back again when it was okay for xbox or for playstation to not have exclusives and for xbox to have them i'm only kidding all right finally i wanted to touch on this as we go because it's, it's not much more to, i mean we spent a lot of time talking about this but there's not much more to say we don't have Many details. I guess we'll have to wait for the next marketing beat, which, like I said, could literally be in 2025. Because when they say it's coming out in 2025, I read that and I say fall 2025. That's a fall game. You don't release that in the spring. You don't release that in the summer. That would be a little weird to me and surprising. I, I think that that's like the pocket well, you have. I don't know. Why not? Didn't GTA 5 release in like March? Uh, no, September, September 17th. Oh, really? What? Did, what yeah. Did, was it? Oh, it might Four have been like came out a, in the spring. Yeah, I remember. St- I remember. Yeah, it might be. I want to say four came out out March two thousand eight or from April two thousand eight, something like that. What about Red Dead? Red Dead two. Well, that was Red Dead two was the fall, and Red Red Dead Dead one was October twenty sixth, twenty eighteen. Yeah, I think Red Dead one was April. Yeah, yeah. Red Dead Little four was April. Right, I remember that because that was like my first spring at IGN. Like I had gotten hired the summer before, so I was like basically getting into my first year. And like I said, Rockstar hand delivered us the game, like sent an intern on a plane with it. And they went to like games, game spot and one up in all the places and hand delivered it because they were afraid it was going to get lost or stolen. Um, and we had a bunch of copies and I immediately got going on the guide for it. And uh, I that's why I wanted to bring up Cody Rayburn's comment here. He says, hey, CDC, this one's for Colin. Do you think you'll give GTA five another shot in anticipation for six? If I remember correctly, you've never finished it. 
Your replay and discussion of GTA 3 was great, and I feel something similar would be wonderful. I myself will be doing a playthrough of the series starting at 3 throughout the next year to keep myself satiated. Highly recommended that you do do that. I'm going to do the same thing. And actually, I'm kind of relieved at the 2025 release date. Very similar to what Chris said earlier is not only that it gives us space and time because there's going to be a lot of games coming out next year, of course, but it gives me time to really sit and very comprehensively continue to go through the GTA games, especially because my assumption now that we know the game is so far away, you have to assume GTA 4 is going to come out in between now and then. You have to assume it. I mean, I, I don't I don't know why how that would not be the case that they haven't figured that out and realized yeah. like we can sell GTA 4 and probably sell like 20 million copies of that. Yeah, and, I would in really hope so. And that that in and of itself in and of itself could be a marketing beat. You know? Yeah. Imagine if you discover that someone that even from GTA 4 is in 6 or something and then they're like that's there's a trailer and then it's like so go experience the original story of whatever the cousins. That could, yeah, that could be cool. You know, or yeah, or gay Tony or whoever the lost in the damned, like some connection that would allow them to market GTA four. I just feel like that's inevitable. Like that's going I, to happen. I think I, I, I want to believe that. <laughs> I want to believe that very, very desperately. I, I just, I don't know. I, I want well, that to happen. So well, I'll, you know what? I'll will it into existence. Oh yeah. I mean, you have that power, yeah. that yeah. auspicious power now to that end. And because we have time and what I would predict is probably something like, almost two years between now and then is vice city i want so i did three i want to play vice city and san andreas i haven't played those in a long time and get through those at some point in the next you know it's time but then i was hoping again four would be out and then i can play five and then lead right into six because yeah i'd very much like to do that and i think that that would very much be in the cards for me but we'll have to see how it all plays out and yeah. uh, we'll leave the gta 6 stuff for now it's so crazy that they announced it the week of the game awards too because i mean it didn't matter everyone loves it but for our show, that would be like a huge story. And I'm not even sure if that's going to be like the top story for our show, depending on what happens later on. But yeah. this next one we have to read through as well. Number two. New reporting from website IGN paints a troubling picture for Bungie, the world renowned studio behind the likes of the original Halo games and the Destiny franchise, which Sony purchased outright in 2022. The story here revolves around Bungie's power structure, a five person board that's split three to two between Bungie aligned people and Sony aligned people. The structure gives Bungie's OGs a three to two voting edge on major decisions, but the structure is apparently only allowed to remain in place if Bungie reaches certain financial and other performance goals, which is apparently far short of. As the IGN story reads in part, quote, if Bungie falls short of certain financial thresholds by too great an amount, Sony is allowed to dissolve the existing board and take full control of the company, end quote. And frankly, this may be a formality at this point anyway, as Sony owns the team but hasn't folded it into PlayStation Studios itself, a first for external acquisitions. But on the back of deep layoffs that saw as many as 10% of Bungie's employees released, it's clear that Sony may have purchased a bit of a lemon, at least in its current construction. According to IGN sources, Bungie has cut down on spending across the board, from the highest levels where there's a complete hiring freeze and where no employees will receive holiday bonuses, to mid-level things like no automatic cost of living raises and lighter travel budgets, to smaller things like in-office per um, like in office perks or traditionally receive birthday gifts in the form of cards being cut from the company. And this new culture of cost cutting has apparently significantly impacted morale within the team, which is not surprising. IGN's story says in part, quote, according to those still with the company, employee frustration and sadness in the days and weeks following the layoffs was met with a surprising amount of indifference or even outright flippancy or hostility from management. Several people we spoke to that spoke to us told us leaders had reiterated across multiple meetings that they couldn't guarantee there wouldn't be more layoffs with two specifically confirming previous reports that Chief People Officer Holly Barbo Barbacobi outright stating that layoffs were a lever the company would pull again, end quote. Bungie, founded in 1991 and currently employing around 1,000 people, was once an Xbox first-party studio during an era when it delivered a series of exceptional Halo games, beginning with the 2001 original. However, as part of its deal with Microsoft to make more Halo games beyond 3, Xbox agreed to ultimately release the team without its IP, allowing it to team up with publisher Activision to release 2014 smash hit game Destiny, which followed up with a sequel in 2017 that's still supported today. Sony's purchase of the team in 2022 was in an open attempt to get much needed games as a service support for an upcoming slate of PlayStation games that are unlike any Sony has ever released, for better or for worse. And Bungie is now very much Sony's financial albatross, release, raising questions on if they should have ever purchased the team at all and how the tea leaves were so severely misread, both financially and logistically. Ryan Del Vecchio wrote in on Patreon and said, Sup, boys, Chris, Bungie shit, go off, son. Thanks. <laughs> Chris, I leave it to you. Yeah, man. Lots to say. Uh, this is uh, th so the thing that I want to really kind of focus on is the idea of dissolving the board 
and specifically replacing whatever Bungie's current C-suite is or whatever their current board of executives is fully under Sony control. I think, I don't know, something something has to give. And I do think the the people who are currently under or the people who are currently in a management position at Bungie clearly don't know what they're doing. Uh, they've not known what they're doing for a very, very long time, quite frankly. And like there I've spoken to people on, on the team that I won't name but like it's been a consistent issue for a long time and even publicly we with a lot of the people who have been laid off and you know some of the sentiment was that there were there are people on the team who are absolutely capable of leading the studio who do not have that opportunity because the people who are currently in the c-suite or who have been in the c-suite for a long time have been holding on to that power for a very very long time and so the situation here is is dire because i personally wouldn't want I wouldn't want the C-suite at Bungie or the executive suite at Bungie or, or, or whatever this makeup is to be replaced by current Sony execs because I don't think Sony execs really understand how to run this game in the way that Bungie does. But at the same time, I don't think the current executives there should be there either. I think what should happen uh, in a fair in a fair uh, situation would be people from the team who have shown obvious leadership capabilities and who are actually genuinely, uh, you know, really loved and supported by the team would ascend to those positions and make those decisions and, and rise to that occasion where the previous management have, has failed. Because you don't want to throw away that experience. Like the, the current executives there know what they're doing in some way, but they're clearly misled. There's a lot of people under the uh, under them that know what they're doing that could do a way, 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 way better job than them. And they won't now get that opportunity because they will then be folded under a Sony umbrella that doesn't that specifically bought this team for their expertise in live service. It just seems it just seems like a not that they sh- not that they shouldn't or not that they don't have the right to do it after spending that much money. But I mean, a lot of that money is talent retention and Bungie's firing a lot of that talent. And I, I don't know, like th- there's something about that that seems really mishandled and I, I i don't know if that i don't know if the solution would be to just get rid of bungie's execs and replace them with sony execs i don't i don't think that necessarily leads to a a better outcome for either party i think that just leads to a kind of confusing outcome for a lot of people there both at bungie who feel who probably feel like they've been working there for a fucking long time and that they're not given the chance to actually you know step up to the role and it might you know i i, I it's a very complicated situation but you know, Bungie as is as it is today is not how they have been. And I would argue the the executive suite of Bungie has probably been a a problematic consortium since since they agreed to sign with Activision. There's a famous story that Marty O'Donnell told about how they were meeting with a an Activision executive uh, a long time ago before they signed. And I think it was like during the signing or or, at, or just before or just after he was talking to an Activision executive and and they were talking, he was talking about how like, you have to be kind to the golden goose. That was like a philosophy that he had for a really long, really long time. You have to be good to the team so they can continue to make good shit. Like, cause the golden egg is useless. It's the goose that's important. And the, the Activision executive said like, yeah, but sometimes there's nothing like a nice foie gras, which is fucking crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. And to, yeah. to go along with that, even at the time is just a crazy, it's just a crazy decision. It just shows like a very, uh, it just shows a very careless form of leadership that uh, definitely needs to be replaced and is long overdue for correction. But I don't know if I don't know if I don't know if Sony executives are the right people for that necessarily. But that's that's my those are my main thoughts about it. It's it's a it's a crazy situation going on over there. What do you think, Dustin? Sounds like Bungie put themselves in a very difficult situation particularly where their income primarily and i i guess not even primarily exclusively comes from destiny 2 and so when destiny 2 was doing really well particularly with uh uh the most the the witch queen release and the Mm. one before that Things were great. Not only were people buying the expansion, but they were also buying the seasons within the expansion and also in-game currency for, you know, so you can do a dance or whatever in the game. So times were good. But when times aren't so good now where Lightfall, Lightfall was a disappointment. 
and people are somewhat mixed on the current seasons. And on top of that, you have an a a successful but an old live service game at this point in the terms of live services that people have been playing it for a long time. And while they're always going to be hardcore people, the people have been playing it forever. They see a game like Baldur's Gate. They see a game like Spider-Man 2, whatever. The the long list of must play games of 2023 in combination with a lackluster expansion and hit or miss seasons within the game, then that income suddenly drops drastically. And when the only thing you have is that, then yeah, I would imagine there's going to be major issues right now. And it's not to say that, well, I guess, you know, you read about there being clearly some major financial problems and they're working on other stuff too. We talk about, um, uh, what is it called, Chris? Marathon. 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 You know, Marathon coming in, in down the line, and I'm sure that could help to some degree, but it sounds like it's not anytime soon. So it's uh, it's tough. I'm sure they were probably were bloated to some degree as developers get big and shrink and stuff like that. But now they're at the face of, you know, losing control to some degree. And I, I'm not sure if that's the right thing or not. You know, Chris is much more in tune with that than me, but. I guess in some sense, I would say that it would suck for them to lose the the little independence they have at this point from being an independent studio for so long. But I guess Sony isn't has a track record of, of making really successful games. So from one sense, it doesn't seem like it would be the end of the world to me, especially if they're stuck under bad leadership. But ultimately, it sounds like what Chris says, there are people there that would be capable, but and that would be the ideal option, but it doesn't seem like that's on the table. Yeah, there there are a lot of people on on that team that uh, a lot of a lot of the you know the the devs have spoken like, dude, this this guy is management has been silent with us, and this guy actually just led us through a lot of this stuff on his own with barely any communication from up from the from the higher people. So it's like that's a good person. That's a that's a somebody who knows at least what they're doing and able to, is able to steer a ship in in a way that management can't. Why not give that guy who has like the most support of the team that clearly would be a boost in morale for a lot of people? Why not have that guy step up as opposed to, you know, keeping these people who have just not really historically made great decisions and not really done a great job? I, I don't know. It's it's a it's worth it's worth the experiment, I think, purely because that, like I said, like that board has been largely the same people for a very, very long time. And like anything, you need fresh blood, you know, you need new people to come up. Otherwise, you're just going to you're going to overstay your welcome and you're going to grow out of touch. And that just happens. This is a natural part of things. Sometimes you need to step down. Uh, that's OK. Turns out you're going to make a lot of money anyway. Yeah. And Surprise. you also lose, you lose access to talent, too, because talent doesn't stick around forever. They want so a lot of these right. guys are going from not going to excel here. I got to go somewhere else and certainly can use. Bungie on their CV or whatever, but I'm surprised you guys didn't touch on a major thing, which I've been thinking about here that I think is an, another portion of this. And I'm, I'm going to let Norman E talk a little bit about it. He said, sub CDC, the IGN article regarding the Bungie layoffs paints us as paints us a more complete picture, which frankly feels like an apt leadership holding on to whatever lifeboat they have for their overpaid positions. This is what Chris has been saying. It's reported that a financial threshold must be reached for Sony to operationally take Bungie. And I expect this is likely to occur following the final shape. At this point, I bet Bungie devs would be happy to be under Sony if it meant being led by creatives and not the pure profit driven suits they're dealing with now. It is astounding how all this has gone wrong and how you have to wonder how bad Sony may have gotten fucked on this deal, given Bungie is now not performing like a three point six billion dollar company. No, nowhere close to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A major component of this, I think, is what Sony can now do for Bungie. And this is ironic. And. I think my my <laughs> it's funny that I think this it's like I, I do wonder if like can you get out of this and I'm not saying like you can't get your money back it's like can you sell this thing off like just just sell it to someone else and just be done with this even if you sell it they know because they know they got you it's like getting rid of an injured player in a sport it's like okay well we'll give you 60% of his value and you might be able to so I'm, I'm wondering if it's that urgent where it's like you don't maybe you want to be involved in this like you mm -hmm. think you did because and here's why I think that is because you and by you, I mean, Sony misread this completely. You got in a bed with this company that is not what you thought it was clearly not capable of doing what you thought it was going to do and is fallen far behind. And by the way, you were, as you said, Chris, all about talent retention. 
knowing that the secret sauce was the people at the studio. And yet, and this is what I was surprised you guys didn't bring up yet. These are the guys telling Naughty Dog that their game's not ready. Is that a fucking joke? Well, that makes you me, con- that, that th- confuses me too, because that, that kind of paints it in a different, because they knew at the time, you don't just be, you're not just surprised by like bad financials. You have to have some idea, right? Before, like, be- like while all that is happening, that Destiny 2 is not really performing all that well, right? And the reasons for that, while they're asking Naughty Dog what, or while they're asking Bungie what they think of Naughty Dog's game. So my question kind of intrinsically kind of becomes are like, why are you asking them and then acting on it? Like, is, is it, is it really Bungie that made that call then? Because like, why would you, why would you put that onus on Bungie? If, if, if they're clearly not performing up to standard, like it, it, it kind of puts that entire conversation into perspective where it's like, okay, they're, they're floundering financially. And then they're also the people that are they're the they're the sole reason why that game got canned in some way. Like I don't I don't know if that logic tracks really. Yeah, I it, well it, you, know? you know it sucks. I mean, if you dude, if you're, I think Jaffe basically tweeted this out starkly. But it's like if you're at Naughty Dog, and you're looking at this, it's like, whew. and he said he tweeted something along the lines of, maybe we can teach, maybe Naughty Dog can teach Bungie how to make money or something. Or be profitable or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. If you're in, if you're inside Sony, you're like, these guys got bought, kept outside the silo, given all these options to stay multi-platform and all of the rest. And they can't and they fucking are bombing. And now you have to kind of wonder, it's like we we if you're at Sony, it's like we wanted them to kind of help our culture. And now we have to save them. With our mm-hmm. culture, it's what I said the other the, a few weeks ago when it was came out that they might they might be short on revenue, something like 50 percent. And I said at the time, I'm like, that would kill a company. That's not like a bad year. That would kill a company to lose 50% or 40% of your revenue. It's um, really serious. And so this is Sony's problem and they bought into it. It's a completely yeah. unforced error to do this stuff that they don't even think they want to do anymore as much as they wanted to, that they're rethinking in every different way. It's like, holy shit, this is, this is a quagmire. I don't know. I don't know that. You can really spin this any other way for Sony. It's like, I don't know what you did here. You better hope that the final shape and marathon and all these things pan out. And I've been seeing a lot of people say that, oh, I wonder if this means that they'll now take Sony exclusive. I'm like, no, dude, it's more urgent than ever that these guys make money. That if anything, yeah, they were if they were not explicitly multi-platform, they'd probably be made explicitly multi-platform at this point. I think it's the exact opposite problem now. It's, like, it's very similar to what I was saying about um, Activision being ingested by Microsoft, but only running annual you know annual um budget surpluses of a couple billion dollars i'm like for a 70 billion dollar purchase that means it's going to take 35 years to make the money back now that's not literally how it works especially at a mega corporation yeah like microsoft but the point is is that you make li- big investments to make little bits back and they're already way off track and it's a yeah. it's a big problem and what's even stranger is that apparently a lot of the layoffs and restructuring and stuff had nothing to do with sony it was them having to basically survive as an independent unit and right. reach the thresholds that Sony had outlined. But Sony didn't go to them and say, like, lay people off and do all these kinds of things. A lot of them can, a lot of people that have been there for a long time and they laid some of those people off, but a lot of these guys could just swallow the poison pill and be gone, you know, and say, like, we'll let the next group kind of step right. up. Yeah. Um, and so I just think there's something, there's some, that, that that's the biggest component of this to me. It's, it's not even Destiny. It's how this company has interacted with Sony and how Sony dropped the ball because mm. it just they just did because this certainly wasn't in the cards. I couldn't imagine when they bought Bungie in 2022, they'd be like um, about a year and change later, there's going to be a massive disruption. We're going to lose half of our revenue and have to lay 10 percent of the staff off like that is a misreading. Right. Of the situation, if you allowed that to happen and Sony, that, that's the ironic thing is that they felt like they needed Bungie's culture. And this is exactly what Nintendo was saying and why I always say this. You can't buy Nintendo, right? You can't go and buy things and fit them together and make them work just because that's what you want to happen. Right. And if I were at one of these studios, and I know many people at these teams, so I'm not saying that I'm speaking for them because I haven't, I haven't asked them any, any of this stuff. But if I were one of them, I'd be like, 
what a fucking clown show this is. We are, you were talking about the golden goose. And then you let these guys come in, disrupt the entire flow of a game we had going. And then they lay 10% of their staff off. They have this problem where they're going to have this takeover of their board by Sony. And now Sony's culture is going to run Bungie. You should just sell it. So I'll just, Mm. I'll just return to that. I really think that. Yeah. Maybe in a year or two, I'll look like a fucking asshole for saying that. But I think right now it looks like you sell. And I think Bungie has always been mercenary and strange in that way anyway i said when remember when i said when i bought when and i've repeated it since when they bought them i'm like they will not end here like sony will at some point let them go and yeah. i wonder if that date will come a lot and i'm not because i didn't think it would go bad what i think is is that they run their course and then they're like we want to go now and so everyone's like okay but i think this has happened already and so i don't know maybe i'm way off base but i think this is a fairly major misreading and this is why you don't buy studios that don't make sense you know, this reminds me of it, it, I, I saw it, it reminds me of that meme with the two like the two big muscly arms like clasping hands mm-hmm. where it's like one's one Microsoft and one Sony and it's uh, buying really renowned first person shooter developers that just <laughs> completely failed. <laughs> and it's like because Modern Warfare 3 was a fucking travesty, apparently, like in, in every sense of the word, like it's like uh, it's really, really, really fucking bad. And, uh, you know, Bungie's overall status is pretty rough, too. So. I don't know. Uh, we'll 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 see what happens. We'll see how it materializes. But uh, it's not it's not good. Nothing. You know? It ain't good. Chris, nothing reinforces my instinct that that Sony should not buy studios that they are not familiar with on an intimate second party slash X dev basis more than what has happened here. Yeah. The first time. Basically, that they do it. Right, like the first time they just make a huge leap and say, like, we're buying a random team. For, and, and there's a rhyme or reason to it, but it's not a team we work with like exclusively. It's not Quantic Dream or something like Housemark when they purchase them or Insomniac. It's like some random studio. and We need something from them. We need something from them. They didn't give us anything first. And then we wanted to like kind of mature it and take it. We need something from them. And look what happened. It's really. Yeah, it's it's really. Confused. I remember feeling really confused when they bought them in the first place. Like I understood the logic, but it's also like. Like Why wouldn't you just fit. go try to poach people from them? If, if you if you thought the, the personnel like there were certain people there, why wouldn't you just go? Now, I know that that would look really bad with your relationship with Bungie, but try to at least uh, uh, procure people. Like, right. Why do you have to go? It I don't know, man. I, I just and again, maybe this will look stupid in hindsight, but I just. <laughs> it's you you. You don't go through decades of just buying teams that you work with and then just go and break that mold and then expect it to go well. I guess I, I would hope I would really, truly hope internally that they realize that. And I, I would really hope as a fan of theirs that we all share the same sentiment. And I know we do, but people listening that we don't want Sony to buy any more stupid studios. There's no yeah. there's almost none that makes sense, maybe Arrowhead or something like that. But. The deliberateness of PlayStation's development approach is what makes them special. It's what makes the games burn brighter. And trying this transformer like amalgamation of buying pieces, I just don't think it works for the brand. And again, maybe people are going to look, you know, rewind in three years. Uh, fucking Marathon comes out. It's the biggest game in the world. Everyone's like, well, you're a dumb asshole. Maybe. But it's just ironic to me. That's so, so that's, again, the big thing. It's ironic to me that Sony bought a company for culture and now its culture has to save it. Right. That's not weird to anyone out there. That's like shoe on the other foot. Classic shit. Classic. All right. <sighs> Let's see. Did, did we t- cover what was in this question already? Um, yeah, kind of. Yeah, I guess so. Josh M. You know, would Sony, because he asked, would Sony be a better steward of Bungie? Yeah, we kind of talked about this. Um, I don't think I personally don't think so. That's the the thing. It's like, what does Sony know about Bungie? Clearly not right. much because they bought them and then it all. <laughs> right. This, that's Clearly what I was whatever saying. they knew about Bungie wasn't sufficient. Yeah, that's what I was saying, too, yeah. where it's like it's like it's not a it doesn't fit. It doesn't like they, they, they wouldn't. They don't know you're buying a studio to make a specific thing they, that they don't know how to make. They can't come in and fix it. They can't do that. Yeah, no, it, it, it makes yeah, it makes no sense. It's like, OK, we buy it, the team. We need you to make a specific game for us or, spe- you know, a certain thing. You fail at that. We send our people in to run the company that's supposed to help us with that. It's like, OK, it I, I don't it, know. It, so it you just, bought like a fucking skeleton, basically. 
It's a logical yeah. dead end. What you need is if if you were even to really write the ship is what you need is you need to let those people step up. If you're going to save this at all, if you're if you're going to attempt to, obviously like the option there is to sell. I'm sure it's probably a reasonable thing. I'm sure plenty of people would buy Bungie even in the state that they're in. Um, I wonder how, I wonder how that would look if Microsoft came in. That would be fucking hilarious. But you know, you just you can't you can't fix an external problem like that with your internal people. You need the people there to fix it. And that's probably that's probably like a really unfair way to look at it. We're just like, hey, fig- figure it out yourselves. But realistically, they're the only people who can figure it out themselves. They're really the only people who can figure that out is the people who are there, who have a lot of experience, who have been working there for a long time, who clearly have the chops and 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 su- support of the of the people working there and on a interpersonal basis to step up and, and run. And uh, if they're not given that chance, then, yeah, you're fucked. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. The future of Bungie is like really, really, really uncertain. So we'll see. I just don't know. I don't know, man. This is. It's especially we, frustrating to me, by the way. I bet. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. It's frustrating to us for different reasons, right? Because for me, it's like, yeah. OK, you just spent. Like 15 The Last of Us Part Two budgets on this studio. And you right. could have there were probably more a lot if you want to just go buy random teams. I'm, there's more logical teams that fit within your family. And I understand the intent. And I want to reiterate this other thing that I think is important. I don't think Sony saying we need to be in this space is stupid. I've said that before. Like, I think actually people that think that are stupid. <laughs> that Sony sees this fucking Genshin impact money and this Fortnite money and all these rips they got on everything. And they're like, holy fuck. So, I mean, that's just logical. But why couldn't you approach it like you, like like your company would approach it? Yeah. Pro- approach the so- the problem with a unique solution. I don't know. Uh, this is what I was saying about Jim Ryan's exodus, too, is that we're not going to know more until the mid and long term about what was really going on here. And if the bets he made, because the bets aren't limited to Bungie. I mean, I would consider the bets to go to Firewalk to Haven, to the games Concord and Fair Games at the very least, and yeah. others. So, I mean, we're just not going to know how it all plays out, but, and to this Last of Us game, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's that, gotta, so I, you're frustrated from a, as a Bungie fan, I'm frustrated as a PlayStation fan because I feel like these two things don't go together, clearly. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, people love Destiny on PlayStation. It's probably the most place, played place where people play Destiny, but it's it's easy to just see the conflict at hand. And I think Sony, the buck stops with Sony and they didn't see it. They didn't see it. Yeah. There's just no way that this was in the cards. There's just no way that, that they knew that this was going to, that, that all this tumultuousness was going to happen. So it's really shame on them for not doing due diligence. I don't know. Was there another buyer at the table? Was this like a fire sale or I, I don't I, like, what was the urgency yeah. if you didn't have all the information, you know, you also have to wonder, it's like, d- dude, how quick, cause you have to wonder how, how quickly will this bite, Bungie themselves in the ass in the sense that like dude you you're the team morale is is mega low you know uh they said like oh yeah we'll we'll fucking lay people off again how many people at Bungie are right now looking for the door or like putting you know putting their chips in or or, or trying to find other places to go yeah they'd be smart to do <laughs> that point, like they would be you'd be really kind of dumb not to and i'm sure that's affecting like output in some way and and that uh, that goes against part of the reason you even bought them in the first place, which is talent retention. So like the, the urgency on this is really high for them. Like they got to figure this out <laughs> before the end of the year, quite, quite frankly, like they, they, they really got to iron this shit out before they lose, they hemorrhage more people. And the entire purpose of their existence within Sony's ecosystem is completely rendered pointless. Yep. You mean just no spinning out of this one, you know, for anyone, no. even if you were interested, I have no interest in spinning anything anyway. <laughs> But yeah, I was thinking about it a lot. I was I was pondering this issue a lot over the last few days, and I just I don't know. They got ahead of themselves on this, and mm-hmm. you have to wonder if they can get out in some way to just unload this on someone that would be able to handle this better, and maybe even keep a stake in it. I mean, I don't I don't mind Sony owning a piece of Bungie, like they own a piece of Epic, but you should just be silent and just make some money and just be on the side somewhere, and right, not worry about this. And clearly, their expertise isn't as good as you thought clearly clearly 
I mean, that's the manifestly thing is like, clearly they're not what you thought. So maybe keep them away from the fucking naughty dogs and the sucker punches of the world before you get splash damage on them. I want to say thank you for writing in, but that was just a new story. <laughs> All right. Let's get into the final inquiries. We only have five because we used one of them, the Fortnite one earlier. Right. We end each show with six typically questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas. Five today from Patreon, patreon.com slash last day media. I publish a thread in the news feed each week. Sacred symbols. Uh, you go in, answer it. I go through, scroll through, find what I like and what I don't. And here's some of what I liked. Ben Matthews wrote in and said, hey, SS boys, you cannot say that. No, no, no. Relax. (laughs) Died like a dog. Last week. He died like a dog. (laughs) (laughs) Frankly. Last week, you presented a thoughtful segment about the potential of Game Pass arriving on Sony and Nintendo platforms. I've been considering a concern regarding Sony's potential apprehension about this move. It might devalue new releases on their platform. Sony has previously likened their release strategy to that of movies. The initial $70 launch mirrors a theater release, while the later PS Plus drop resembles a Blu-ray or streaming release. I perceive Microsoft as akin to Disney, who's encouraged audiences to bypass the theater experience and wait for content drops on Disney+. Plus. Consequently, Disney's theater earnings have fallen off a cliff. I believe Microsoft face a similar situation with their $60 and $70 games as they've oriented consumers towards Game Pass. Considering this, why would Sony risk undercutting the impact of their major first-party releases? Once you change a spending habit, you change people's expectations, and it may be impossible to go back. Sony heavily relies on week one sales, and it seems unlikely they'd gamble on introducing a competitor that could undermine the value of their new games. So a lot of people wanted to talk more about this this week, and I'm happy to do it from this from this angle, because I think it's an interesting one. And we talked about it a little bit last week, but I I got a message a week or two ago from a, a, um, a, a random executive that listens to the show. And they made an interesting reference to Game Pass and to what it was doing and to what it was trying to do, where he was talking about, I think, like buffets, like food buffets and how with rare exception, I guess if you go to like the nicest, most ornate buffets in Vegas or something, buffets don't have $70 steaks at them. It's like buffets are little are pieces of food that all culminate to a price where everyone's kind of happy, but you can't have it all. It, you don't go into the buffet and say, like, I'm going to get M&M's and I'm going to have a fucking foie gras and filet mignon and all. It's like, no, that's not typically how it works. And if you go to one of those really ornate ones like I've been to in Vegas, you're paying a lot of money. for yeah. it. It's not like a, it's like kind of more of like the experience. It's really not worth it, actually. Right. And so <laughs> I, I thought that that was an interesting thing that you can't really have it both ways. And at Games Biz wrote about this, actually. And I, I, I thought it was interesting that he was saying. They were making the argument that though Sony and Nintendo are the ones no doubt keeping Game Pass off their platforms, it's hard to make an argument of why they would ever allow it to happen. And I thought that was interesting because I I looked at it more of like a coup de grace at some point where it's like we, as I said before, the Walter Wright's like we we, we want like this is a huge win for us, especially if it's just this version of it. But the idea of introducing spendlessness into your ecosystem has ramifications and will Mm. perhaps force people into considering more subscriptions where you make less money. And so I think it's a pretty interesting thing. Dustin, let's go to you first. Do you think that Sony would ever allow it? It seems like it would impact them too much, maybe ever for them ever to allow. And we didn't maybe consider how it would benefit, how it would affect Sony in the long term. Well, I think that if it's, Microsoft's games exclusively going to be on their unique version of Game Pass on PlayStation. I still think that I guess is the argument that if that's available to people, then it's going to train them to not want to buy PS5 first party. Is that the argument? Yeah, I think it's it's a training argument, I think, which is part of part of I think what would be the latent like long term concern of having something like that is just people yeah. people's expectations change and that's something you can't really calculate well I think Microsoft then has a lot of work to do <laughs> because I while I think there's been a lot of great games to come out on Game Pass I still and this is going to be a preference thing but you see it in the sales numbers is that just PlayStation is putting out by and large, I know people are going to be mad, but by and large are putting out better first quality shit. And that's why people are willing to go spend $70 a piece on it. So 
I guess, yeah, you could argue that maybe it will train people to not want to buy games. But as long as Sony is putting out games like Spider-Man 2 and games like The Last of Us and, you know, they're for not that every single thing they've done in first party is amazing, but you get my drift. You understand what I'm saying that they've made it. They've positioned themselves as a cut above and the market is showing that. So I don't know. I don't think it really necessarily would affect them. I guess it puts them at a higher risk that if their first party falls off, then maybe, but in the specifics, the, the, the circumstance that we've set up this dream scenario of, the very unique version of Xbox Game Pass being on PlayStation. I, I don't think it really makes a difference. I just see it. It means that Microsoft's or that PlayStation's making a cut on their competitors games that haven't been able to put a dent in their sales. And now mm-hmm. they're just making money off that instead. Yeah, the the article I was looking for because yeah. I, I wanted to support my claim and I think that this will be interesting for you is is uh what's his name? Rob Fay, he wrote it, uh, didn't write in. He wrote this in his article in part, quote, it's still not entirely clear how much Game Pass cannibalizes sales and other launch channel and other channels, not at least because the answers seem to vary dramatically from game to game. But in general, developers seem to have found that putting a title on Game Pass still allows them to enjoy solid sales on Steam. Allowing Game Pass onto the Steam Deck wouldn't end that, of course, but it would erode it. It would push more and more consumers towards a game subscription model that creators are perfectly comfortable with as long as it provides additional re- additive revenue, but which becomes an existential threat if it's instead cannibalizing that much, much higher revenue they receive from sales on Steam and other platforms. And so he's he's basically segueing the argument that Steam would probably be the most likely place that this would happen first, but that even there, you can imagine that Valve would be like, we don't see how this really works for us. And they go on, and this is what I was saying um, with Matt Stoller months ago, because he wrote that really prescient piece, the piece continues, quote, we are currently watching the movie and TV industries desperately try to pick up the pieces after years of hugely damaging missteps with streaming services. These industries have locked themselves into business models that are inherently less profitable for almost everyone involved. A result of disruptive moves by companies that only exist because of multi-billion dollar land grabs with major investment backing. With the land grab phase ending and investment drying up, these models are turning out to be pretty much unsustainable. And companies find themselves desperately trying to cut costs in order to square this impossible circle. The music industry has done something very similar. In other words, we have lots of examples of how not to do this transition or or, and perhaps why this transition should not happen at all to look to. Quote, and then he goes on, quote, Tim Stewart has reiterated an ambition that makes perfect sense for Microsoft, especially in the wake of the supply chain nightmares that show just how risky and difficult the hardware business is. Why wouldn't it aspire to being the company that makes money from software and leaves the hardware work to others? While it's his prerogative to hold this ambition for his company's game business, though, it would be madness to expect the rest of the industry to fall in line with a plan that's not in their interest today and may end up being hugely destructive down the line. So in quote, so that's that's kind of the argument I'm making is Sony's afraid of even get letting its audience get a sniff of this. Now, it doesn't quite compute with having models like EA and Ubisoft, but my, my with their passes or whatever. But my assumption is, is that those are just not very big and they don't care and they understand that this is bigger. And what I was saying the other day on the previous show was why would Microsoft from their perspective allow a bespoke Game Pass when they really need to keep it unified? And then on the other end, PlayStation would never allow a non bespoke Game Pass on PlayStation because that would be the end of third party game sales for whatever's on that pass. So mm. it might just be that it's like the what do they call it? The immovable object and the unstoppable well, force an unstoppable or... force, right? Like there's just no there's just yeah. it just can't happen. And I think that's interesting. Yeah, you know. I I don't know. I I think there's a lot of angles here. I I, I think the I think the film industry is a rough c- point of comparison because it's just a very very different method of consumption. I mean, I I don't think the reason I put it this way, like I don't think in theater attendance is low because of streaming services. I think it's low because it's really really expensive to go to the movies and if you and if you know the price kind of demands quality I, you kind of saw it with Barbie and Oppenheimer where they just made a shit ton of money I think Godzilla minus one is 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 another one I haven't seen it yet but I've heard it's amazing and it's it's doing super super well it's getting this word of mouth that a lot of people are going into the theaters where it's like okay you know it's expensive but you know what I'll, I'll go I'll go to an expensive theater for that experience I think the issue is ultimately like what we're getting, especially out of Disney, is just a low quality, you know, lower quality films 
for the same price as something that's amazing. So why would you not hold off to go see amazing shit in the theater and just wait for something to come up on streaming? Uh, if it's mediocre enough not to see in person, like why not just wait for it? Why not just subscribe to something for twelve dollars a month and just get in a, a fuck ton of shit for twelve dollars that month, including for some of these Disney movies that launch like really fucking quickly on those streaming services. Not because um it's a cannibalistic situation, but because I mean they just don't demand the same amount of attention or command the same amount of quality. So that's kind of that is an issue. Also, I do think like the the training spendlessness doesn't really hold up when there there is already PlayStation Plus and other like I I would it would make more sense to me if it was if this was like the the inaugural kind of streaming service or the inaugural kind of subscription service. But I mean, we're already kind of trained on spendlessness in some way in the PlayStation ecosystem. It's just not to the same degree. But you can imagine with a bespoke version of Game Pass that wouldn't even really matter because if they were getting a cut. And it was already branded very specifically. It would almost kind of in the minds of the player base feel like this separate thing anyway. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I think, I think there's a deeper issue here that might be really, I don't know, it's hard to pinpoint exactly. Well, Chris, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, just to, to comment on your point about money too. I don't know if I have a point here, but just food for thought about, I wonder if this could, is also could be happening in games we talk about games costing way more than than necessary and you brought up godzilla which is really interesting because i heard uh which i'm seeing now that this may be underreported but the budget for that movie 15 million right 15 mil and apparently let's say it's underreported let's say it's fucking 30 mil <laughs> compared to something like uh, i looked up guardians of galaxy volume 3 250 million now there's a lot of star power in that movie probably half of that budget <laughs> I don't know. Maybe yeah. I don't know how movies work, really. But a lot of that was for star power. But just uh, I'm. it's interesting to see this reeling back like, hey, what if we could do a lot more with a lot less? And we are seeing this in the games industry, too. Sure. This is what Sean like Layden was remedy. going all the way. And yeah. And, and Sean, Sean yeah. Layden said this when he left Sony. You know, this guy, I think he was like kind of the progenitor of that. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. he knew the budget. Like He knew the budget of The Last of Us Part Two. He knew that. That would mean the last the, the, again, the jump in budget for people that don't know between the last of us part one and part two was 70 million to 210 million. So what do you think that means about part three? Now, consider the fact that games are being sold at basically the same price, which is a $10 increase, which has already been subsumed by cost of living increases and inflation, you know, one or two times over at this point. Yeah. And then your game is not going to sell that many more copies. And then so eventually you get to this, this nexus on the graph where you're actually going to lose money. And you're really just making the same kind of game. Yeah. And it's not it's not sustainable. And that's why I was saying earlier about GTA 6 being so so cool because it's it's basically what a game would be if you just had unlimited money and time. And that's yeah. basically the, how it's been made is with unlimited money and unlimited time. And that's just not reality for almost anyone else. So, it'll be interesting. I, I appreciate the letter uh Ben because I think it is interesting to think about Sony's perspective about being hesitant about fucking with anything and just being like we better we're better off just not even going down this road at all suggesting that it's not even possible but i'm i'm convinced that this will happen in the years to come i just think that it will the rubber will hit the road at some point something will and, and again we, we brought it up last week like will it be will it occur with a la carte games first oh here's master chief collection remember when i was still at ign i reported and i'll remind everyone that sony and microsoft or microsoft was talking internally about bringing master chief collection to playstation 4 early yeah. in the very early in the um and we know that dude there's we had it at ign people didn't even people didn't believe it was real we had halo running on ds we had like a halo ds yeah that, yeah that, I remember. That, um and we actually made videos about it and people were like that's not real yeah it's like no it is it is real like so and it was it well, was, was really whoa, whoa, whoa. it was reskin like golden eye which is funny but that it was from it was from you know from microsoft and bungie bungie so yeah it's it's interesting to think that anything's really possible we just have to imagine yes, the realities of of how that would all come to be yeah what were you saying yeah. Chris? i'm sorry no, no, I was i was looking at the video again oh. it's so funny i remember seeing this and <laughs> yeah it's kind of i believe on boson right in, yeah, in yeah, the LA I, office, yeah, I believed it immediately though, because it's like how how do you how do you fake this really? <laughs> also, uh, it's also true that Matt Casamassina, for people that don't know, he Matt Casamassina is one of the founders of IGN. He 
went to Apple and helped run their game stuff for a long time, but I don't know where he is now, but he's maybe the most well-connected Nintendo pundit ever. And so mm. like he knows everything, or at least in my experience with him about Nintendo and had every connection and knew everyone's name and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, impeachable or unimpeachable rather not impeachable. Right. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Adams source sack wrote in. Mm. said hey gents another episode last week where, where the narrative you spin around psvr2 is there's nothing to play and you all freely admit you haven't touched the device since launch or just after what gives if you're not going to even try it how can you say there's nothing to play on it i challenge the three of you to, it, to try synapse red matter 2 or the walking dead games and not have a great time no flat screen can replicate even no man's sky is a totally different experience in vr and the psvr2 port is the best version available i'm not saying you have to play your psvr2 it's it, it's your gaming time you choose not to do with it what you please but it's completely unfair to say there's nothing to play on it if you're not even going to bother trying it beyond the launch window. I think that this is an increasingly fair criticism. And mm. I really do want to be as deliberate as humanly possible this holiday to play something on it. In fact, I was seeing the reviews on Push Square for Arizona Sunshine 2, which is supposed to be awesome. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it's supposed to be really, really good. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I'll go check out the original Arizona Sunshine, which I think I own already. And then if I like it, maybe I'll, or I think, I don't even know if it's available on psvr2 at this point but i i got it you're right you're right adam sorsak that i need to sit down and play psvr2 or just not talk about it at all because it's not really fair yeah. and now to be fair though the argument we were making last week especially was there's nothing drawing us to it but right. is that even fair i really do think my laziness with the machine is part of it it's just like i don't I just don't want to do this right now. You know, it's like always like I just want to sit on my couch and play a game, but there's got to be shit on there for me. So I really think you're right. And I do want to overcome that this holiday season. Is anyone with me? Dustin, are you with me? I'm a little uh, I'm offended by Adams, you know, that lumping me in with you two because I made the argument a few weeks ago that there is a lot to play on there, especially for VR enthusiasts. But the problem is they don't have the mainstream things or IPs that are going to hook people in to then go and discover this other stuff. Mm. So there is lots to play on there for absolutely. I've been that synapse game. I've been wanting to check out for a while. It's just, it is, there is so many games for us to cover that like you said, Colin, that are just drawing me in and demanding my attention a lot more than synapse red matter Two, or any of the walking dead games. That's just how it is. Like avatar so, frontiers of Pandora, for instance. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I understand the feedback. I I dude, I'm when uh Resident Evil 4 VR mode comes out, I'm absolutely gonna play that. That's, Maybe I think that it's will, out right now. I think it's today. Is it today? Like when we're recording. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, this is exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a fair criticism. I do think though, you know, I feel like it's I feel like there's a deliberate there is somewhat of a deliberate uncharitability there inherent to it, where it's like obviously you know there are things to play on psvr it's a platform it, it didn't release with nothing obviously when that's said it's it's more about like there's nothing that draws me there's nothing that i wish to play or nothing that i'm excited to play so it's a little uncharitable but i do think it's a fair criticism that we don't we don't really engage with it enough to really critique it on a fair level and i think that's fair um i do want to try synapse at some point uh because that's that's the one that speaks to me but um i, don't know, I have to get it back from my friend who's still <laughs> still has it i can just go across the street and get it anytime i just haven't made the time but but uh I'll, I'll probably i'll probably make the effort to do it i put out my psvr2 and it was so bad it was so gross <laughs> i said it was the worst thing i've ever seen <sighs> frankly <laughs> that's okay uh that, that uh <laughs> the resident evil 4 updates <laughs> tomorrow or today for listeners <laughs> excellent We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll hear back from you, hopefully, if not next week, you know, after the break. Absolutely. All right. Let's go to Operator408 wrote in and said, hey, guys, Hogwarts Legacy is a great game that has sold millions of copies. It got my daughter to pick up a controller for over 30 hours. She has no idea what JK has said about transgender people. She just loves the wizarding world. This week, the player's voice voted it out of contention to receive any game award. How has a small group of narrow minded trolls dictated the view of this game? We all saw the wire review. It 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 isn't a game of the year, but it is a great game that deserves the recognition. And wired, I think you meant to say. Happy holiday, boys! Ho happy holidays, boys! Thank you, operator, for writing in. 
I just think we have to accept that we're not going to get fair treatment of certain video games in the industry as it's currently constructed. And that we need better awards that are more objective in some sense. Now, criticism is total subjectivity, but similar to what I think happens with the Oscars, there's some sort of objective barrier that I think people are like, this is an Oscar worthy cinematography feat. This is an Oscar worthy acting feat, or this is a, and we don't really look at things that way. We need to, we need to approach it from a different angle so that we can kind of excise these people from decision-making because it's not only Hogwarts legacy, which I really don't give a shit about one way or the other. It's more about games. As I said, with my friend, Luke Bernard, the light in the darkness, the game about the Holocaust, he was personally, you know, I mean, he could be offended. Of course, he's offended because he didn't get nominated, but he's like, how had, how has this game not been nominated by the game awards for games for impact? Is it a joke? And then you see some of the games that are nominated and, and the, and the, what I said to him was these games are not, are nominated because they're about people in, in different, more exotic places or about, it's like, it's not, and that's the way they interpret games for impact. And so mm. we just need different definitions and new people to kind of come up with these. It's just this, it, it sucks, but it, it is what it is. And I don't, I don't think it really matters. Like if I were yeah. at Avalanche or WB, I'd be a little disappointed, but if I were them too, I'd be like, we made so much fucking money and we're going to make a sequel that's going to make right, more yeah. money. So whatever. And it didn't, the, the one thing you can garner from this, Chris, is that the, the the hullabaloo around it does not matter and the and the hullabaloo around jk especially is very online because remember Mm -hmm. we mentioned a few months ago she signed like a massive deal with hbo to do all the remake of harry potter she's doing she's that robert galbraith guy like the spin she does like the the pen name stuff she does like no one that works in real world gives a shit about anything anyone says about her except for the small money yeah money's money man you know, m- money's money. G- green is green. They're going to make another Hogwarts legacy game. They're going to continue to do this. It's 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 not a yeah, it, it, it doesn't fundamentally uh, it doesn't fundamentally matter. I, I still am really uneducated about the JK stuff. I really just have not looked into it really deeply at all to know if it's even fair criticism or not. But all I can say is that, I mean, even if it th- the way that I think about it is that even if JK Rowling was like literally, literally, actually like the worst person, like even if she was like a serial killer and she was like put in jail. Does that then all of a sudden make Hogwarts legacy, not a good game? And the answer to that is no. Um, Do I think it would have been nominated for a game of the year, even if it was treated fairly? I I don't think so. Honestly, I I think it's just been a steep year. I think the fact that it was, the fact that it was snubbed for specifically maybe sound, I think, or, or the soundtrack, I think is kind of crazy because that was one of the more enthralling parts of it for me, for, the 30 hours that I put into it was like, this is really like this music's really, really fucking good. Um, and so I think it deserved at least a nod, but I, I don't think it was necessarily robbed of anything from not being nominated. And also, like you said, they're making money hand over fist. I doubt they care that much. They might be a little bit, might be have a little bit of a bruised ego, but at the same time, I feel like they probably know why they didn't, you know, even dude, the people who, there are a lot of people on that team who made it, who don't, who don't subscribe to JK Rowling's opinions at all. So like, it, I, I just find it very, it's online is very accurate. You know, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, but I think you're right that uh, there needs to be, there needs to be, if not an objective um, way to look at this stuff, at the very least one that's honest about why it's not, you know, like if you're going to say that you're holding this entire studio hostage from the game awards over the opinions of the person who originated the ip who doesn't really have anything to do with the development process at all then say that say it if you're proud of that decision say it mm-hmm. yeah if well you're said. not proud of it then you know why it's stupid yeah well said very well said Dustin, you have anything you want to add i think that it's important now I, this comes up every year but while there is an importance to recognition of games for sales related numbers that doesn't matter to you unless you want a game to be successful to have a sequel the emphasis on caring about establishment recognition is weird but i guess that's the way it always has been it's like oh this movie needs to win best picture Mm. or be nominated or this game needs to be recognized for its greatness it's like dude 
ultimately in the end as a player does it really matter and yeah. colin you brought i mean you hit the nail on the head avalanche sure i'm sure they would like to get some nominations and sure they probably wish that their game was given a fair shake by you know the the sex toy reviewer from wired that gave it a one out of ten i'm sure they wish that that happened <laughs> but ultimately it's the best selling game this year it may not it may end up being uh two or three but still it was until Call of Duty came out. I don't know how it's going to shake out now. Yeah, yeah exactly. So ultimately, uh, I just think uh, and I mean, this is a lot of things that happened with Xbox with Starfield. It's all about like we got to get the recognition about being game of the year. And it's like it just doesn't. These things for again, for you, the player really don't matter. They matter for the you know marketing, uh, but don't worry yeah. about it. Just enjoy Hogwarts, it. Hogwarts Legacy. Uh, it fits very uncomfortably in my asshole. And uh, for that reason, I just can't subscribe. I, I can't abide by it. Hogwarts Legacy. Hogwarts Legacy fits so bad in my ass. I can't. It's a horrible sex toy. I don't know what people are thinking. That's okay. I just want to, I just want to hear him go on a tirade, but like a really... About like he plays video games and he understands when he's like, oh, what's yeah, legacy? I, I, I would like the, the, the gameplay is a little stiff, you know, like <laughs> the amazing Bell and Wonderland by Yuji Naka. <laughs> unfair, unfair the way that was treated. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want him to. I want him so desperately to say the name Hideo Kojima. Like just, just the the idea of that being real is so is I'm, I'm so obsessed. Hideo Kojima, the indomitable Hideo Kojima. First heard of him at, at Shadow Moses. <laughs> what a place! The, uh, what a place! <laughs> what a place! Shadow I, Moses. I looked I, around. I said, "What a place!" <laughs> Shadow I looked Moses. around. I said, "Wow, this is a shadowy Moses." <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't even pretend to be able to do an impression. I just know what I want him to say. Yeah, right. I, I can't I really do it either. No, you do a great one. But you <laughs> texted me the other day, and you're right. The Shane Gillis is it's crazy. Is like, it's, it's insane. Like, is, yeah, it's insane. Yeah. <laughs> BMJ six one four wrote in and said, "Hey CDC, this question is about video game prep. Do you all like me prepare yourselves before partaking in a thirty to one hundred hour video game? Like for instance, do you all check time to beat, check trophies or achievements, scour through reviews from IGN or GameSpot or any of your all favorite review sites, or do you all raw dog it? Oh, and just let the game surprise and wash over you. I love that we're getting that out there, especially because it's inevitable that someone is going to use it in a bad situation. What was the other yeah. word that we we someone had r r brought up? Oh, uh, why buy the buy cow when you get the milk for free? Milk someone for free. is going. So I am fucking telling you, someone is going to go into a meeting in a corporate or Fortune five hundred company and say, "Oh, well, we'll just we have the rest of the week. We'll just raw dog that." Right. You know, and I'm being yeah. like, yes. <laughs> um, okay. Do I, I mean everyone knows my I I actually prepare a great deal in going. I don't read reviews or anything like that. I just like to go look at the trophy situation, see if there's any missables. I like to just know if the game's linear. Once I know nothing's missable, I basically just check out at that point. But if I have to be a little more comprehensive, I like to do that. But I'm curious, do you guys look into reviews or like I pre-ordered Pandora, whatever the fuck it is, the the Avatar game. I pre-ordered that before the reviews even went live just to get it when it was starting to preload. So I don't even wait for any of that stuff. I guess it's interesting sometimes, but I don't really look in that. So I don't do any of the critical stuff. I don't do any of that sort of thing. Dustin, do you what kind of do you like light a candle and shit before you get going? Oh, or what do you do? A uh, little candle never hurt anybody, but. I only really check out reviews for their intended purpose, uh, at least in my opinion, that I'm trying to make it a purchasing decision. So, yeah, uh, a lot of like, for example, I'm not going to watch any reviews of GTA six. I'm going to just buy. It. I'm not going to watch any reviews of Persona three reload. I know I'm in. So I, I don't need anyone influencing my opinion at that point. But. There are other games that I don't know if I want to buy it and play it. For example, uh, I okay, a hypothetical example. I don't know if this will be the case, but Dragon's Dogma 2. I may end up playing the first game and being really into it, and then I'm just in for the second one, but I also don't know. It's been a while. The series is kind of coming back. It's not a reboot, but, you know, it's been a while. So I'm a little more apprehensive about just putting my money in immediately. It's been so, a while. It's been a while, yeah. So maybe I'll just watch some... Uh, Reviews, purchasing decisions. Since As I've gone once, and fucked things up. 
Just like I always do. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, Dustin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you, you hit me the way you said it. You know? No, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> once I make a decision off of a review, then I'm I'm out. I don't need to look at anything else because, yeah. again, it's about a lot of games for me is discovery. When before Lethal Company, I my friend told me about it. I looked at a, a few things online. I didn't even watch any videos. And I thought, I'm in. I'm just going to check it out. It's 10 bucks. Fuck it. And now that I've kind of discovered stuff, I'm willing to look in and be like more strategy and figure stuff out. But I love discovering stuff in games. So less is more. All right. Finally. <laughs> Speaking of less is more, it's the last question. Deuces Bro wrote in and said, hey, guys, I just went through the process of replacing the thermal paste on my PS3. It was basically inoperable before this extended procedure. This got me thinking, what is an acceptable lifetime of a gaming console? There's been a lot of consternation lately about digital versus physical games. We talked about that earlier, of course. But what good is a physical copy of a game if the machine you have for it literally cannot function anymore? By the time Dustin dies, he'll have had to replace the thermal paste on his PS3 multiple times for it to even function for his great grandchildren. Isn't the digital only true? Uh, only, isn't the digital only true way to experience games in perpetuity? Probably should have brought this up earlier. I didn't realize it was so connected to that because I really just thought it was more about console life cycles. So let's focus more on that because we talked about all that already. Unless you have something to say, Dustin. This question doesn't make any sense. Why? Because if it's a digital only game on PS3, you need a working PS3 to play it. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good so point. Well, I, want to, I don't even want the, the whole. You're right. That's that is stupid. That, that, that's not why I wanted to use this inquiry, though. I wanted sure, to sure, use sure. more about because I know you know something about this and I've, I've never asked you about it really yeah. per se, which is what is the. What is the. Intended life cycle of these consoles and what will have to happen to them to work like so let's assume that you have your collection of PS5 games in 2050, right? So. 27 years from now, what will the P, yeah. will the PS5 what will you need to do to it, if anything, to make it work other than updating its firmware and hoping that all that is, is in play? Is there anything else that's going to be fucked up? Because there is a mm. point that and this is something I do bring up sometimes, which is that the hardware is going to be a problem. That's why I think it's interesting. Maybe you'll have one of these universal consoles type bootleg things that are happening already for cartridge based stuff. You have one of them, don't you? Um, uh, my analog pocket. Yeah, or, like the things that accept. Yeah, like yeah. that. And there's like con there's there's home console ones of that, too, with like. Genesis ports and SNES ports and all that kind of shit. And they're yeah. not, I don't know if they're legal or not, but th that's the way people play a lot of these games. I do wonder if that will happen in the future for these other things. I think it'll be a little more difficult because there's all these, these overrides that you would have to do and, and the way these machines boot up and stuff like that. But what's the deal with that, Dustin? Do people consider this question in the retro scene? Cause it's gotta be pretty important unless you're just collecting them to put on a shelf. Yeah. I'm, it is tough in that, these devices or consoles just continually become more complex, which just by simple matter of there being more parts, there are more things to go wrong. And even in certain cases, I think we've talked about this a few months ago where the original Xbox has a battery in it that explodes. So you really should go in there and replace it on your own. And that's one of those unfortunate things that's just like, yeah, that, uh, I don't know if they knew that some of those things that that component would have a certain life cycle that, uh, you know, they knew at some point it would explode or go bad. Or maybe yeah. they thought, oh, well, we just kind of don't know the lifespan on something like that. So it is unfortunate. I'm sure that, though, as as these consoles continue to get older, more and more people get acquainted with working on them. And, and as this question brings up the replacing the thermal paste and, and stuff like that. Yeah. It will get way more difficult to maintain these consoles. Hopefully there are other solutions as you mentioned, Colin, but it, it also just becomes more niche to want to play on native hardware too. So yeah, a lot of them will go bad. Some of them will still be running, but it is a good point. Maintaining the hardware is going to get a lot more difficult as the older, the the newer machines become older that are more complex. So I'm really curious about that as well. I've never heard of anyone needing to replace a the thermal paste on a PS3. I'm, I'm not saying that that's not real, but 
none of my ps3 has had that problem but yeah ps3 i guess it sounds like it will if you have a launch ps3 it's 17 years old which is pretty crazy yeah (laughs) wow it makes me wonder with nes and super nintendo everything breaks down all matter breaks down nothing is immune Yeah. yeah nothing is immune to aging but Everything. Dies. How long can we expect uh, the Super Nintendo to work? Yeah, I don't know. My my Game Boy Advance SP has a battery that just does not hold a charge, which is like a shit. And that's easy enough to fix, though. That's like not like the craziest thing. Yeah. But I mean, even we talked about it before on the show. The PSPs had batteries that exploded after like ten plus years or something. And I, I don't know. I, I have to imagine though that as as these as these pieces of hardware go more and more out of date, like by the PS6, I feel like people will have a pretty good idea of how to work around a lot of the problems of the PS5 in the first place. I mean, we look at the PS1 today, right? You open that thing up and it's such a quaint machine by modern standards that it's so easy to mod it and fix it and soup it up in comparison to a PS5 is today. But I feel like that I feel like the PS5 is only that complicated to fuck with today because it's today's console. You know, like I think by the time this is a real problem with a PS5 or like a Series X or something, I feel like we'll have a pretty good handle on how to fix these things, you know, or, or have really, really, I mean, you might even be able to jailbreak these things really easily. Who the fuck what knows? If, what I, if Sony really, made a universal backwards compatible machine at some point that was just like, this is an old way to play old uh, games because I would love for them. You know, I was noticing not that I would buy anything for them anymore, but um, limited run games is having a sale for the holidays. And I noticed that they have a lot of, NES, SNES, and N64 cartridges. And I'm not entirely sure how those are manufactured or whatever, but it would be cool if Sony embraced the whole thing where they would allow for reprinting of old games and have these boutique publishers allowed to manufacture new products and all of that that's not bootleg. Just another way to make money and celebrate that that history, but that would be pretty cool. But I also wonder if game, like making new consoles kind of illegally or in, in this gray area probably only goes as far as the PSN because I think that once the PSN gets involved, it's not really going to be able to happen, right? Like as far as games being locked, you being locked out of your accounts and stuff like, will, ga- like, will a game even work if you're not logged into a PSN account even offline? You know what I mean? Like I don't know how you would even get around all that stuff. So it's interesting, but something worth considering, I guess. Deuces, bro. Thank you for writing in. All right, let's get the hell out of here. It's time to go. Chris, goodbye to you. Thank you for your time today. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Of course, I intend to. Um, we actually have to, we're, we're, we're now going to go off for a little while and then the Game Awards are on in a little while and then we'll be back. So I'll actually see you a little bit yeah. later. And Dustin, goodbye to you, my friend. Yeah, I'm, I'm just glowing from Death Stranding, uh, which I fully predict is going to be at the Game Awards. I hope but... that there's, I hope that, I don't know, man. I just, I don't want it to be just Death Stranding and just God of War. I hope they have something truly new, you know? Yeah. But dude, mm-hmm. Death Stranding. I mean, that's yeah, that's it's exciting, good. especially that's if they maybe exciting. maybe if they even put a date on it, which would be even more interesting, wouldn't it? <sighs> yeah. Uh, Game Awards starts in less, you know, about two hours from now. What I'm going to play Lego Fortnite. Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm going to play Lego Fortnite between now and then. Oh, good. And I'm very excited about it. Oh yeah. Well, I just yeah. want you to know. Well, thank you for letting me I know got, that. Enjoy. Yeah, I gotta I gotta get on. I gotta figure out what the fuck's going Check on. It out. I gotta, I gotta unlock that Peter Griffin skin, man. Dude, oh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, it's the I, end of the battle pass. I'll do it, man. The it's Whoa, so fu- it's so funny. The uh, that that picture that always goes around to him is sitting on the couch with the chick or whatever. You know, like oh the yeah, girls Ariana Grande. Or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, my favorite, my favorite one of those was that pe- someone wrote under it was like um, me after I convinced my girlfriend to get an abortion or something like that. And I was like, that is oh my god. <laughs> but I saw that someone replicated that in the game like replica right. scene with like an anime girl or something and it's so like yeah so fucking fun i just i just love this 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 is such an uncanny image to me i put it in the chat but it's just so let me see like this is, is the scariest thing i've ever seen oh yeah that's horrible life. yeah it's so scary and so i, I gotta see this i gotta see this through <laughs> just the whole like the shape of his head and everything it's so fucking weird it's just <laughs> Anyway, time to go. I hope we uh, rejoin ourselves or uh, reach. We join each other with uh, a lot of excitement later on and not. Yeah. You know, with disappointment. But we'll you'll yeah. you'll have already known that by the time you get to this point in the show. So let's go. Boys, see you later. We'll see you guys all next time. Until then. Goodbye. See ya. Take care, guys. 
Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.